I hope you enjoyed the video. Because of the length, I've included the timestamps for each episode in the description, along with links to the originals. Please feel free to use either or to navigate the video. After decades of war, the victory of those living above ground was finally achieved, putting an end to the long-standing conflict with the labyrinth. In the aftermath of the conflict, the labyrinth masters, numbering in the tens of thousands, were forced to release their prisoners of war. Amongst the prisoners were infants who were born and raised in the depths of the labyrinth. With their mothers long gone, they had survived on the unusual diet of monsters' milk. As these children emerged onto the surface, it became evident that they possessed extraordinary powers beyond that of a typical human. However, one particular infant seemed to stand out from the rest. He was the last to arrive and appeared to have come from the deeper levels of the labyrinth. His appearance was peculiar, as if he was born and bred in the depths below, taking him longer than the others to ascend to the surface. Humanity gave them the name. Dungeon Babies. You're safe now, child. Be careful, it doesn't look as if he has control of his powers. That last baby grew up to be a fine young man. A rare dungeon baby who spent no time in the dungeon. But being in need of money, he took a job guiding a film crew through the labyrinth. Focus the camera in on him. Why aren't we here to film the second floor of the labyrinth? Film the labyrinth, my ass. It's been years since it's been found. There is nothing to shoot anymore. He's a dungeon baby. Filming him will give us a chance to make millions. I did a bit of research. Most dungeon babies are obsessed with dungeons. And? This particular dungeon baby has no interest in the labyrinth. And he's the only dungeon baby whose level hasn't been revealed. That's probably because he's weak. I hired the guards just in case that's true. But the thing is, he could actually be very. Okay, let's move out, said the dungeon baby. What? It hasn't even been ten minutes. We're in a dangerous location. We need to make it to the second floor as soon as possible. So, we're moving out. And remind your guards to refrain from using their guns, even if we come across a beast. We need to avoid conflict at all costs. Man, he sure is a wary wart. He's more like a Buddha baby. You just worry about doing a good job guiding us. And we'll protect you no matter what kind of baby you are. The dungeon baby thought to himself that they were not understanding his intentions. While we waste time with this small talk, somewhere in the labyrinth, a person is being ripped apart as we speak. Geyser isn't some sketchy neighborhood. An injured under beast, commonly seen on the first floor of Geyser, made its way towards the group. The dungeon baby informed the group that this beast would die on its own. We need to leave before the scent of its blood gets into our clothing. All right, everyone, let's show them how we work for our money. No, don't shoot! Fire! The guards opened fire on the injured beast causing it to release a high-pitched wail. If the blood scent didn't lead predators to them, the monster's death cry surely would. After the dust settled, the guards were jubilant to see that the beast of Geyser were easily killed. I was a little nervous, the rumors say people die here. But these monsters die just like any other animal. The guard ordered everyone to pack up so that the expedition could continue. But the dungeon baby insisted that they should lighten their weight so they could return to the surface as fast as possible. What do you need to change your undies after seeing that display? A predator's roar could be heard throughout the dungeon. If we run now, we still have a chance to make it out safely. We took out the first one in a couple of shots. If we catch this one on a narrow path, we won't have any problems. These monsters are worth millions, if we get two each will all bring home at least ten million. The dungeon baby realized that this was their goal from the start. You guys can do what you like, but the rest of us will stay away since we're weaponless. Good Buddha baby is finally understanding. What we kill is our pay, so don't think you're getting any of it later. Everyone else, hurry and follow me. But I need to film. Follow me. See you later dungeon baby. Where should we wait? How about we just go hunt this monster down? The dungeon baby rushed through the labyrinth, trying to put as much space between him and the others as he could. But his charges needed to rest. They couldn't keep the pace he was pushing. 
The financer wanted to know where he was taking them. He had already screwed her film shoot. And she needed to decide what the next move was. He told her there would be no more filming, and they're headed for the exit. That's not what you told the guards. Wait, do you mean? The reason you stay away from the labyrinth even though you are a dungeon baby. It's because you're a coward? Everyone, we're heading back. What? Why? What do you mean why? We must film them fighting. We paid so much money to get in here. If we don't get that footage, we'll be broke. They heard the sounds of gunshots, screaming, and the roars of monsters from the direction they came. Everyone quiet down, said the dungeon baby. We're going to make a break for it. We can't let them notice that the group has been divided. What's going on? The original monster they killed was prey. The gunshots attracted the attention of the real predators. You knew this. It's your fault they're dead. Let's say I was able to convince them. Then we'd all be dead right now. Their bodies were covered with blood, making them easily trackable by the predators. But we could have saved their lives. The cameraman noticed a speck on his foot. Those people had no intention of listening to anything I had to say. He raised his camera from the drops of blood to a chiseled torso. He panned the camera up to the maw of the beast. And the cameraman was lost. His last thoughts being, save me, please save me. This was not the predator the dungeon baby was expecting. A wolf monkey shouldn't be on the first floor. There was a whole group of them. They must have known our location from the start. The dungeon baby dashed towards the financer. He pulled a machete from her backpack. Instinctually realizing its weak spot, he made a single attack slicing it open. The second wolf monkey went in for the killing blow on the financer. The dungeon baby tossed the machete into its face. They needed to retreat now. He snatched up the financer and informed her that he'd be running at the pace you would expect of a dungeon baby. A few of your ribs may crack, but just put up with it. He sprinted away at full speed, leaving the wolf monkeys behind. He didn't glance back. He just ran, putting as much distance between him and them as he could. The dungeon baby gave the financer a moment to rest. She had done well. She must be in excruciating pain. We'll need to hurry. They will continue to hunt us. You let all the others die. What? You utilize the dull knife so efficiently. So why? What are you misunderstanding? I was hired as a guide, not a guard. There was nothing in your contract about protecting you. But all those people died. That's the geyser for you. Am I the one who hired a bunch of idiots? That's never been down here before? They did everything I told them not to. What do you mean I didn't save them? If you all had just did what I said, everyone would be alive. Why did you save me then? You're the financer. How would I get my pay if you were to die? I'm still on the job. I expect you to pay. I'll do my utmost to keep you alive. The dungeon baby glanced upwards. A snake wrapped around a sword was staring at him with menacing eyes. It can't be, a labyrinth emblem. He had just ran in any direction. How did they end up in the labyrinth? They needed to get out of here right now. The floor crumbled beneath them, sending them plunging deeper into the labyrinth. The dungeon baby woke up in a world of pain. His left arm was shattered, but he guessed it could have been worse. There was no way the financer survived the fall from that height. He did all this for no pay. But worse than that, the dungeon baby was screwed. He was somewhere in the center of the labyrinth with no idea how to escape. And there was no sign of any activity around. This labyrinth was most definitely abandoned. As he stirred up at the labyrinth emblem, the snake shot out, encircling him. It dug into his broken arm. 18,230 snakes released. No way I'm going to die here. As he passed out, the words you who will inherit this ominous underground ran through his mind. The dungeon baby woke up on the floor of the labyrinth. Why was he alive? He had definitely thought venom spread through his body. His broken arm was completely healed. And not just his arm, his entire body. Something or someone had moved him to the entrance of the dungeon. As he stumbled out of the first floor he ran across the financer Yunju. 
She was still alive, but in bad shape. It was strange that he was healed but not her. But he had no time to think this over. He had to get her help immediately. Yunju hold on, help is near. As he walked through his front door, he could hear the news reporting on his particular incident. Today, at around nine o'clock this morning, an expedition team had an accident in the dungeon. Seven out of nine people died and it's presumed that the incident was caused by an underbeast ambush. A survivor, Miss Jang, was saved by dungeon baby Mr. Kim. Wow, news sure spreads fast. Well, he should be fine. No one watches this channel anyway. Lucky for him, majority of the incident was caught on film. Otherwise, he'd be in hot water right now. Kim had no real need for money, but he took this job for his sister's sake. He had already left the first part of the payment in her room. He'll add the rest of this to it right away. Kim's sister walked out holding the envelope of money. With the saddest expression, she held the envelope out to him. Being aloof to the situation, he gave her the second envelope and told her to use this also for her wedding. And don't ask where I got it from, but I didn't do anything bad to receive this. His father stepped into the room behind his little sister. What do you think you're doing? Ah, uh, father, today's not your day off. What kind of son are you? To risk your life trying to earn money. I abandoned work and came home right away. Did I not tell you to give him the money back, Hyunji? Go ahead, give it back to your brother. You have parents, so you don't have to risk your life to marry off your sister. What are you talking about? Working at the convenience store? It's not a battlefield. Enough. You're underestimating me? Even if we're not related by blood, did you think I wouldn't find out? I'm sorry, father. Kim's little sister gave him back the money and headed straight to her room. His father chastised her as she went. I didn't think I had raised such a selfish daughter. Father, why are you being like this? I chose to give her the money. There's nothing wrong with us using it for her wedding. We won't be using money you earned by risking your life for anything in this household. You are part of this family. Don't do such things to upset us. Dad, go get some rest and make sure this doesn't ever happen again. Adopting an orphan from the dungeon was a lucrative business, particularly when it came to dungeon babies. However, not all dungeon babies were as fortunate as Kim when it came to finding a loving family. Sadly, many individuals adopted dungeon babies solely for financial gain, which ultimately led to tragic consequences. He was blessed with a loving and supportive family, who stood by him through thick and thin. However, the impending financial burden of his sister's upcoming wedding was causing a sense of unease within the family. Despite being highly skilled in a particular field, it appeared that he wouldn't be able to utilize his talents to help ease the financial strain. Today's expedition had only given Kim new things to worry about. In particular, the new tattoo upon his wrist. And if he rubbed it, this happened. After doing some research on the internet, he learned that in video games, this was called the HUD. The Naga's Labyrinth had to be the name of the labyrinth he fell into. Was he chosen as the master of that labyrinth? There was also portals in video games. Wait, this wasn't here before? Kim stuck his finger through the red dot. And the world cracked around him. He was deposited in front of the snake emblem. This time he could barely see its movements. Wrapping his jacket around its head. No way I was going to fall for the same trick twice. This could only be a temporary measure. The emblem most likely wouldn't have any problem freeing itself. 18,230 snakes released, the one to inherit underground and sit upon the throne of Naga. You're too small and inferior to handle the weight of the crown. But I am not in the condition to hold back the flow of time, so I shall think of this, too, as fate. Kim couldn't make any sense of what the snake emblem was trying to tell him. Naga's throne? Are you this labyrinth's master? Glorious Naga's new king. I wish you luck. Kim was taken aback by this last statement. Hey, don't play with me. I hate labyrinths. I never even glanced at a labyrinth for years. I only went in one for Hyunji's wedding fee. God damn it! Things like this keep happening to me one after another. 
If only he had stayed out of the labyrinth. He heard something move in the darkness. Big brother, can I come in? We need to have a chat. Kim yelled. Give me a minute, I'm changing. Is this the portal I came through? It looks to be more a tear in reality. Kim had to rush back as his sister was forcing her way into his room. As he passed through the portal, he felt as if his body was breaking. But once on the other side, everything was fine. Big brother, what was that sound? Why are you sweating? And you're still in the same clothes as earlier. Ah, uh, wow, you're a gamer now? No, that's just a live stream. I wouldn't have thought my uptight brother would ever get a hobby. What do you mean uptight? She explained that even as kids, he never had a hobby. He just spaced out in his room for hours. So that's how you see me. Kim thought back to his earlier years, and she wasn't exactly wrong. After leaving the labyrinth, he had a hard time adjusting. All he could think about was the labyrinth. He was uncomfortable in this world above the ground. This was most likely the reason other dungeon babies were attracted to the place. So, what's up? Big brother, I'm sorry. I didn't know that you went back to that place for me. It's nothing. Don't worry about it. He reached to give her the money, but it was in his jacket. He had left it in the labyrinth. As he looked back to the portal, he saw an imp digging through his pockets. Hyunji's wedding money. I'm fine, little sis. Don't worry about it. I was so into this new game that everything that happened yesterday went completely out of my mind. You think it'd be okay if I just go and enjoy my new hobby? Thanks, you're the best. See you later. His sister stood there perplexed. She had never seen him so excited before. Kim locked his door and headed back through the portal. He raced back to his jacket. But it was too late. The imp had emptied it of its most important item. The system explained the situation. While you were gone from the labyrinth, an imp came and stole your money. To find the imp, you must finish synchronization and activate the labyrinth entrance. What kind of bullshit is this? Why would an imp be interested in paper? Kim was dejected. He tossed his coat to the side and sat upon his throne. All his hard work had went to shit. Detail schematics, with all its information blocked out. Set before his face. The system asked him would he like to proceed with synchronization. The marble upon his throne seemed to work like the tattoo on his own wrist. He had to retrieve the money as soon as possible. Should he proceed with synchronization? He had to retrieve his money at all costs. The best idea would probably just be to leave this place and never come back. Hopefully I am not becoming like the other dungeon babies. Kim accepted, initiating the synchronization. This all seemed to be more complicated than he expected. Hopefully he wasn't wasting his time. After taking its precious time, it finally started. 18,230 Snake's Nest Naga's Labyrinth has registered Kim Jin Wu as its master. Reorganizing the labyrinth according to the new master's, Kim Jin Wu's data. The labyrinth dissolved before his eyes, reorganizing into something only a bit better than before. It was still dark and creepy, but it aligned more with his tastes. The mention of gates on the status box was the only thing he observed to be different. The imp was slowly making its way back into his labyrinth as he turned to face the door. He was able to witness each stride it took thanks to his enhanced senses. A typical individual probably wouldn't have even noticed, in my opinion. This imp was an expert at moving covertly. Kim scooped the imp up by extending his hand. As it swam around, he held it by the throat. How dare you come back here again? Return my money before I kill you. The imp's posture gave away the fact that it didn't have the money anymore. Do you know how much money you stole? The imp offered to trade trash that he pulled from within his robes. I don't want this shit. Give me back my... And at that moment, Kim realized that the imp was offering him a treasure like no other. It was a down gem. Down gems are special jewels only found in geyser. You found them buried deep in the ground or hidden within a rare plant. However, it was impossible to find them with the giving methods. The most popular way of obtaining down gems was to kill dangerous monsters in the geyser. Because of this, 
down gems were ridiculously expensive. A single carat could be worth millions. As Kim thought over the situation, the imp produced a second gem from within his robes. Kim was in shock over this. The imp tossed the gems into the air and as Kim snatched the red one out of the air, the imp made his escape through the entrance. As the second gem made its way towards his throne, it began to dissolve in the air. You've sacrificed a medium rank down gem. The damaged durability of the labyrinth will be restored and will proceed with an upgrade. Kim dashed towards the gem, shouting on whose command? As he snatched it out of the air, it disappeared in the palm of his hand. Twenty-four hours until the durability restoration. You have seventy-two hours left to raise the labyrinth's rank. He was shocked something worth so much had slipped through his hands. Four days later, his sister's wedding went well, all thanks to the generosity of her in-law's family. After a bit of negotiation, I sold the down gem for eighteen million one. Well, I didn't get as much as expected. This amount would be a very nice wedding gift. I have to give it to her discreetly to keep father out of it. I can't believe such a small rock is worth eighteen million one. The labyrinth upgrade, paid for by the stolen gem, would take place in less than twenty-four seconds. There was no point in regretting it. Hopefully it was worth such a large sum. Kim headed to the labyrinth to see what was worth the eighteen million one. He looked over the status windows. The labyrinth is now rank two, and new facilities had been activated. But because of this, beasts and creatures were now able to detect the labyrinth. The labyrinth's defense was weak. He would need to create a defensive force. And that's where the naga nest he just unlocked would come in handy. A new room appeared in his throne room. It was nothing like he expected. He thought it would be sticky and wet, not dry and clean like it was. As he surveyed the room, beasts started appearing out of the nest. The system informed him that six level one workers had appeared. And more would appear as he ranked up the labyrinth. The Naga workers were nothing like he imagined. They were the cutest things he'd seen in Geyser. Since in his past he had been an excavator, he knew very well what the lowest level workers should do. He ordered three of them to act as scouts. Their job was to create a map with the labyrinth in the center. They were to investigate nearby risk factors, resources, ecology and such. He wanted them to prioritize survival and to avoid battle. They should have a guard protecting them. But at the moment, he had none. He ordered the rest to dig out the area opposite the nest. It will be used as their storage. He didn't really have much expectations of them. They were short and stout. They wouldn't be fast or strong. In all his time in the geyser, he had never seen anything more fit to be prey. But to his surprise, the group had created the storage and under an hour. Storage size one by one has been built. A part of the Naga worker exploration team has returned. Kim was in shock. Because of his recklessness, two of the Naga workers didn't return. He should have went with them. They were a rare commodity. He wouldn't be able to replace them through summons. This was a permanent loss. Shriek, 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 shriek. Wait, are you telling me they're fine? That you returned to drop off the spoils you collected? And you think it's an honor that I'm so worried? The morale of your Naga workers has increased. Worker efficiency has increased. The Naga worker passed Kim the map they had built. The system updated the labyrinth's map. A very detailed map popped up in Kim's HUD. Thanks to the system functions, there will be no need for him to run around creating a map. This area had lots of natural resources surrounding it. Shriek, shriek. So because you didn't know what was useful, you brought back everything you could. Most of the stuff was junk. It was old and rusty. But because these items were from the past Great War, Kim knew they weren't on the deep floors. Something sparkled among the trash, and he dived towards it. The exploration team had recovered down gems. Shriek! What, you spotted more of these items out there? I want you to go get them immediately and to inform the others that these are very important. Shriek! Kim dashed towards the portal. He needed to get these gems evaluated. He stopped abruptly, realizing that if he left, who would protect this place? 
who would protect his defenseless workers, he asked the Naga scout, if it was sure there were more of these gems out there. Shriek! This place had become too beneficial. Be it money or opportunities. He would most definitely come across more of these gems. So, Kim tossed the handful onto the altar. You sacrifice one low rank down gem and two lowest rank down gems to the altar. The down gems are being processed into four labyrinth energy. Energy. I traded tens of millions of one for mere possibilities. He had tried for the last five years to put the labyrinth behind him. After entering the labyrinth once, he was now obsessed. But he believed he now understood why this happened to the other dungeon babies. Why it seemed they were dying to throw their lives away. It wasn't a matter of adjusting to the safe life above ground. No, that clean life was just boredom. He was bored out of his mind. As you wish, Naga King. I will bring glory to the Naga Empire. A glory so great it will encompass the entire of Geyser. I summon Naga. Kim had two options in his summonable units list. The first was a Naga soldier. It was rank one. It was primarily used to defend the labyrinth. The second was the Naga Maid, ranked one. She was highly intelligent. Her primary use was to take care of the daily tasks of the labyrinth. She can also command soldiers, but was weak herself in battle. He wouldn't be able to carelessly spend on increasing his unit size, as there was a monthly maintenance fee for each unit. He decided to summon one of each. You have consumed one down gem energy to summon one Naga soldier. The soldier flashed into existence before his eyes. Naga soldier normal has been summoned. He was thankful the soldier carried a shield and the spear. If it was a sword carrier, it wouldn't be as useful to him. Kim ordered his new soldier to defend the storage and the workers at the front gate. The new soldier exceeded his expectation. Just looking at it, he believed it could survive to the fifth floor. You have consumed two down gem energy to summon one Naga maid. Mystery of Geyser has activated. You have passed incredible rare odds, and a heroic rank Naga maid has been summoned. As the maid was summoned, a glare ten times brighter than the normal soldier blinded Kim. Naga maid, Dominique, heroic, has been summoned. Dominique is incomparable to a normal Naga maid. She is the true advisor that is dedicated to the honor of her master. Master. Her voice resonated in his head telepathically. Please tell me what to do. So, she can also talk as well. He explained to her with his mind the situation they were in. So, you're still in the tutorial, she replied. I guess. Master, please give me permission to view the current labyrinth map. Permission granted. As she examined the current situation, Kim was surprised that she was able to use the system map also. Before making a decision, we should see all of this for ourselves. I will explain the situation to you as we walk. Their first stop was the stalactite cave near the entrance of the labyrinth. They could dig through the cave wall closest to the mining load giving them easy access. This would allow them to set up a gathering station in the opening near the stalactite cave. Primarily it'll be used to forge minerals. But if they were lucky, down gems will be found also. Next they visited the geyser flower garden. The down gems they produce will be small but the plants require little to no maintenance. Dominique decided since they were there that she would harvest the flowers herself. Finally, they should secure the large territory in the center of the labyrinth. It will be their primary water source, and they could set up a hunting area nearby, where the wild beasts roamed. This would allow them to mitigate the cost of maintenance fees. You said your name was Dominique? Correct, master. Since your name's a bit long, I'll shorten it to Dominic. Incredibly, extremely, she replied. While I have no intention of neglecting the labyrinth, a lot of my time will be spent above ground. Dominic understood his concerns. While currently their labyrinth was no threat to the rest of Geyser. You should always be prepared. She advised him to increase their unit count and to upgrade the labyrinth as soon as possible. These were tasks that only the leader of the labyrinth was able to accomplish. I understand. One last question. What happens if I don't meet your standards? There could be Nagas, who leave, or rebel. While they will be able to harm the labyrinth owner, 
they wouldn't be able to absorb the labyrinth. Only the ones chosen by the labyrinth can be its owner. And there isn't a Naga foolish enough to challenge the royalty that encompasses the geyser. Kim thought over what he was told. All right. We have a lot to accomplish. I'm looking forward to working with you, Dominique. I will do my best, master. Do you believe we have enough down gems to upgrade the labyrinth? Yes, master, I believe so. You have offered three good quality intermediate grade down gems to the altar. The labyrinth upgrade is starting. Kim decided to sell a few down gems at the jewelry store. The jeweler hadn't seen such high quality gems since the end of the war. Kim informed him that he had noticed that the first floor wasn't doing too well. The jeweler explained that the wolf monkeys who lived on the eighth floor was starting to hunt the first floor. The quality of explorers had dropped since the end of the war. And this new development wasn't helping matters at all. I'm not going to inquire about how you obtained these. How about you do exclusive business with us? You don't have to worry about being cheated here. Kim decided the information that the old man attained would be very useful. Seeing as how he was very much out of the loop. We have a deal, but on one condition. You keep me informed on the goings-on in the labyrinth. The old man decided to inform Kim on a major business opportunity. Have you ever heard of hell spiders? An expedition will be formed soon to hunt down the hell spiders at Paiyu Gate. Kim wasn't interested in hunting hell spiders. The old man was surprised that he would decline such an opportunity. He made his first mistake bringing up Kim's personal life. He karate chopped the old man's desk in half. Did you do a background check on me? The old man insisted that Kim calm down and listen to him first. You have to understand what it's like working with dungeon babies. They're essentially superhumans. They're not all as easygoing as you. And then there's my responsibility to my clients to make sure my items are clean. The first gem you brought me was kind of iffy. But the rest has been surprisingly good. I obtained them with my own hands. I understand that, but you can never be too sure. Most of the people I deal with have lived harsh lives. Their families have all died by the blade. It's hard to trust someone who has nothing to protect. But Mr. Kim, you're different. Since you have a family to pro. If something ever happens to my family, you'll see clearly what happens when a dungeon baby goes psycho. Yes, I understand exactly. I promise this will never happen again. It seems as if I've sacrificed my credit to check yours. Make sure to send the down gem money to my account. Damn dungeon babies. He didn't even mention my table. Mr. Kim had a dream about his life before leaving the dungeon. The hell spiders were on a rampage. We dug the ground our entire lives for your labyrinth. So why are you doing this? Duke Geyser! Kim awoke from the dream. All his subordinates were worried for their master. Are you okay? I'm fine, Dominique. I just had a dream about my past. No need to worry, it's all in the past. His workers stirred at him, looking nothing like a labyrinth beast should. All he can do was laugh. Dominique picked up on this. What's the problem, master? They all just look not very labyrinthy. If they aren't to your liking. It's fine, Dominique. I like them just fine, Kim thought to himself. Thanks to these non-labyrinthy guys, I have become less nervous. I heard the hell spiders were migrating from the lower floors. There's quite a distance between us, so we shouldn't be in any danger. But we should prepare for other deeper floor beasts. What's the upgrade status of the labyrinth? Sir, there's only three seconds left till upgrade completion. I can't believe we're about to progress to a rank 3 labyrinth. The third rank upgrade to the labyrinth has been completed. Construction is now possible in places that have previously been locked. New units can be summoned. Six rank 1 Naga workers have been added. The labyrinth core has been added. That core is the heart of our labyrinth. If it's destroyed during battle our labyrinth features will be disabled. The power of the labyrinth is limited. When that power exceeds the labyrinth's capabilities it produces one of those. I don't care for it. It seems to me to be an unneeded weak spot. While the labyrinth will collapse if it's destroyed. If you can defend it, everything in the labyrinth can be restored, even ruins. 
Hmm, I see. Due to activation of the core, beasts and creatures far away have become aware of the presence of the labyrinth. A swarm of, twenty out of twenty, horned rats are marching towards the labyrinth. Fifty-nine minutes and fifty-nine seconds until their arrival. Dominique, we're being attacked. You must increase your troops. We cannot defend them with one Naga soldier. I've never even heard of horned rats before. Should I summon Naga soldiers? I'm not sure of the capabilities of a Naga soldier. Naga soldier, rank one, energy costs one. Warden that defends the labyrinth. The Naga soldier who does not know fear is specialized in combat only. Naga archer, rank two, energy costs ten. Deadly snipers. They pierce their enemies' hearts with sharp arrows. Naga warrior, rank two, energy costs six. Born warriors, possessing unbelievably tenacious physiques. Naga mage, low rank, energy costs nineteen. The ones who explore the mystery of geyser. Naga mages dominate enemies with strong magic in combat. Naga priest, low rank, energy costs seventeen. The first priest to deify snakes. Naga priests heal wounded Nagas. Even though there are more units to choose from, their energy costs are much higher than I imagine. I currently only possess twenty-one energy. And there's twenty horned rats on the march. I guess I have no choice but to summon twenty soldiers. Master, one Naga soldier can take on four horned rats on its own. A warrior or a priest equals two soldiers. An archer is three soldiers. And the mage matches the power of five soldiers. But aside from the warrior, the rest are extremely weak to melee attacks. So, you must be careful how you use them. Dominique, you are amazing. Thank goodness I have you by my side. I'll summon one Naga soldier and two Naga warriors. Reality cracked and the soldiers stepped through. Everyone was in awe of them. One Naga soldier and two Naga warriors have been summoned. The soldiers exceeded Kim's expectation. With this, even fighting wolf monkeys might be possible. Kim noticed that his favorite worker seemed to be upset. Dominique explained that Naga workers were a type of mutation from higher level Nagas. The stronger a Naga is, the higher chance of a subspecies like that could be born. That child is facing what it could have been if it was born normal. So even though this little guy follows orders, this is the reason why he's so sluggish and lacks willpower. I originally thought he would fall behind the others. But he's much stronger than they are, so he keeps up just fine. I have to teach this little guy a lesson. Sir, please don't. Gather all the Naga workers. Do you trust in your master, Dominique? Then don't worry. You told me that Nagas gave importance to honor. Everyone will participate in this labyrinth's first battle. No one will be left behind. I'll protect all of you with everything I have. I choose this as my weapon. This is most definitely a brave Naga's weapon. A small but grand warrior's weapon. Kim stared at his favorite worker, hoping he had encouraged him moving forward. Now! Forward! Nagas! We shall make those rat bastards, who dared to go after our labyrinth, realize they walked into a snake's maw on their own. A horde of horned rats marched upon the labyrinth of the Naga. Kikek, we found the stupid snake cave. Found the hidden snake cave. They're only digging snakes, no fighting snakes. New snake owner not know how to make troops. Stupid. Our trench knows all. Our trench smart. Trench big horns. The bigger the horns, the more smart. I trench is smart. Strong. That snake be soon extinct. This last snake cave. We eat them. Destroy snake cave and eat. We all be stronger. Horns grow bigger. The group of rats only wanted to become stronger. They were tired of the place life gave them and wanted to rise up in position. They would not be slaves any longer. They would forge themselves into something new. With this wish in their hearts, they attacked the baby snakes. Kim struck down the first wave of rats. Nagas! Prove your worth! As he held up a dead rat, he shouted, Leave none alive! The horned rats realized they had fell into a trap. Their leader, Trench. Flashback to what led them to this uprising. 
Trench are you satisfied with this life? Trench no small talk. Trench go dig. Were you born to dig? Trench gets eaten. If not dig. Owner big. Owner strong. Trench only small and weak. I must have been mistaken. I thought you were the biggest and bravest among the rats. Trench knows difference between bravery and recklessness. I guess I'll have to show some other rat how to become stronger. Really? You could become the owner of your very own labyrinth. Trench. 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 As Trench came back to reality, he realized his people were in trouble. If he wanted them to survive, he had to become stronger. If he swallowed that marble, Trench would be able to protect his people. Trench dashed toward the labyrinth's core. He ordered his people to protect him. They would not be used anymore. They would not be eaten for fun anymore. The rats would no longer have to lower their heads and pretend it was all fine. Trench was the only hope for their kind. If he could just eat that marble. Dominique alerted Kim to the rat charging towards their core. Kim borrowed the spear of his soldier. As Trench leaped towards the marble, Kim sprung into action, piercing him through. Their altar's durability dropped from the blow. Kim was in shock. No way this was happening. There was no way he could lose his labyrinth so easily. Trench's head raised towards the core. The last words that left his lips. Freedom for my brothers. Trench had made it so close. Kim had not suspected a surprise attack. I believe he was trying to eat it. Dominique by chance, was it dangerous? The teeth of the horned rat wouldn't even have made a dent in the labyrinth core. All the damage to the altar was caused by Master Spear. It got so close to the core to think it sacrificed its comrades. I'll have to be more careful next time. Kim realized he left his soldier defenseless. Dominique explained that there was no need. After their leader was killed, their fighting spirit evaporated. It would only be a matter of time before the rats were taken care of. Kim had gotten worked up for nothing. It made no sense that the rats were so weak. These horned rats were barely stronger than his Naga workers. Dominique explained that she had heard of labyrinths that captured beasts and forced them to excavate. Kim realized that the horned rats were similar to him and the other dungeon babies. This practice disgusted him. He was surprised at how strong his Naga warriors were. Their tails allowed them to wind up with little to no movement. And thanks to their long bodies, they had the perfect center of gravity, allowing them to be quick and flexible. Even he would have trouble if he had to face these Nagas. Dominique knew exactly what he was thinking. A spy had been watching from the shadows. It slinked away at its first opportunity. The spy reported its findings to its lord. One heroic level and four normal level troops. I believe the owner is ignorant. I observed him reinforce his summons at the beginning of the invasion. You wasted twenty workers for that week of a fighting power? I apologize, my lord. It's whatever. Be sure to replace the rats you lost. And what of the mercenaries? They're taking care of the blood subjunction outside the labyrinth, my lord. Have them prepare for war as soon as they return. Sir, we're going to leave the war up to mere mercenaries. Aren't you a mere mercenary? The bastard said they were a dragon's descendant. Even if the blood went stale, they can still take care of a weak labyrinth. And I'll be able to see. A nice sight. Victory, the Naga labyrinth led by King Jin Wu. Zero unit losses. The horn rats led by trench. Twenty unit losses. The Nagas have gotten used to combat by a very small amount. The opponents were too weak to gain any experience. The charisma of the dungeon owner has risen by a very small amount. Beginner commander. Beginner commander, title has been earned. Dominique congratulated her master. But for Kim, there was nothing to celebrate. A weak enemy had made it into the owner's room. His most defenseless subordinates could have been injured. We were really lucky that these were our first opponents. If anything stronger were to attack us, we would be wiped out. His subordinates were in awe that their owners placed their safety above the core. Kim needed to increase their defenses urgently. Nagas! Store the happiness of triumph deep in your heart. This place is the geyser. 
the weak die and the strong survive. We have no time to get drunk on the victory over weaklings. The Naga labyrinth now is weak. However, a new chapter in Naga history has risen. The storage will be a treasury, territories will be possessions, and this place will become a fortress. Made by our own hands. You guys will be remembered as legends. Many days since the battle with the horned rats had passed. The corpses of the rats had went into the bellies of the Nagas. Their weapons were deposited into the storage. The Nagas feel satisfied. Your unit maintenance costs will be lowered for a while. Dominique decided to lead the three workers who will be in charge of mining construction. An escort took the other workers to harvest, down gems from the loads and plants. Kim had so many plans, but he lacked the gems to orchestrate them perfectly. He planned on taking the horns of the rats to be appraised. The old man informed him there was a market for basically all items from the labyrinth but he was more interested in whether Kim had brought down gems. He wasn't shocked that even Kim was struggling in that department. I'll deposit your money in your bank account as usual. Kim decided to breach the subject of why he really visited today. Is there still space on the Hell Spiders subjunction team? So you're interested in that now? Only because I'm in need of down gems. What are you planning to use the down gems on? Um, I should sell them. So you're in need of money. But that's the way of the world. Money is everything, said the old man. The advance team has left already. If you want to join, you'll have to join the main squad going to the section. Hey, Mr. Kim, what's your level? You don't know, then what was the point of your background check? How long are you going to be upset over that? I have no idea what my level is. I was born and raised on the twelfth floor. The twelfth floor... You shouldn't joke about such stuff. I lived in the labyrinth of one of the geyser dukes, before I came to the surface. That would make you Korea's highest level dungeon baby. Why are levels so important? To tell you the truth, I haven't been back to the labyrinth since I escaped. I don't know anything about the situation inside geyser or information on dungeon babies. Ah, uh, that makes sense. That's the reason you put the condition on information. I'll break it down to you, Mr. Kim, in the easiest way possible. Dungeon babies all have a given level. These levels are tied to the floors from which they were born and raised. So you're level 12. You're one of the rarest dungeon babies. Babies born from levels 1 to 3 are a bit stronger than an adult male. Because of that. They are usually part of the exploration teams. Levels 4 to 6 are medium floors. They make up the most of geyser assault squads. And their strengths are comparable to American Captain, or whatever his name is. They're essentially super soldiers. Level 7 to 9 will be considered monster territory. There aren't many of these, and they're very cocky. Levels 10 onward are considered the deep floors. During the Great War, humans couldn't reach these levels. Dungeon babies from these levels are considered cosmic horrors. There isn't much information on the deep floors because there are so few of them in the world. But since you're from there, you wouldn't need me to explain them to you. And also, the deeper the floor, the higher chance that a dungeon baby possesses a special power. Mr. Kim, do you possess a special power? You know, like fire breathing or laser eyes. I possess the ability to see a person's weak points. For example, at my current power level, speed and with no weapons. Your whole body is a weak point. I understand, Mr. Kim, I understand. So, do you believe there will be room on the team? They'll make room for someone as strong as you. I want you to lower my level before you tell them. I thought you needed to make money. The higher the level, the higher the payout. A lower amount of money should be fine. Okay then. I'll text you the schedule and all the information you need to know. And you can borrow equipment from my storage. So, there will be no need for you to break your mother's table legs. I need your ID card so we can forge you a dungeon baby license. What is an ID card? Mr. Kim, you're going to drive me to drink. You guys will be remembered as legends. Dominique, what are you doing? Master, I was just. Give me the update report first. Right away, Master. The mining harvest in the cave is going well. 
We harvested a small amount of down gems from the plants and the loads. Another small amount of down gems were harvested from a subjunction near the wild beast. The beasts are being disassembled in a storage room as we speak. Good, hand me the down gems. Kim tossed the whole handful into the altar. This will allow me to summon another naga. Dominique was impressed that her master would invest in the labyrinth without hesitation. Dominique, you will be in charge for the next two weeks. May I ask you why, sir? I will be attending the subjunction of the hell spiders. Our current down gem production is too slow. We'll be able to progress faster if things go well with the hell spiders. Naga Archer Normal has been summoned. Ah, so this is the real form of the green worker. I want you to go to the gate and keep watch with the Naga soldier. Sheik. All the down gem energy collected over days is already gone. I'll leave too for maintenance purposes. Dominique? Yes, master. The portal I come through. Do you believe the size can be adjusted? I'll start the final briefing before we enter Paju Geyser Gate. I'm Lee Junyum, the commander of this Hell Spider expedition. I won't waste too much of our time. The majority of you should already have experience. We will subjugate the Hell Spiders that have invaded the second floor within two weeks and return to the surface. The expedition team is composed of 22 people. The assault team is composed of 7 people. And we have 15 normal explorers. I want the assault team to line up in level order. You can check the right arms for their level. The briefing is over. Expedition team move out. Be gate opening. Gate opening. We will move quickly to catch up with the starter squad. I pray for the safety of everyone. And right off the back they lost their first explorer. He begged for them to save him as the beast chewed on his body. It's a whiptail lizard. Because its tongue is blocked, you must be careful of its tail. Aim for its armpits. To think we're starting off with such a worthless monster. There's nothing like taking a break at the beginning of the expedition. The rumors are right. The explorer quality sure has fallen. To be losing people this early in the operation. I don't believe they were that selective. It's been ten years since the war. The useful ones are off enjoying the good life. I put my money on the majority of them being in debt. And technically it's the same thing. You can die to debt collectors above, or beasts below. Kim had gotten tired of sitting around watching this display and decided to end this quickly. The commander wasn't pleased with his actions. Aim for the wounds. They had lost their first explorer. They had to move fast. They had to process the scene before the blood scent spread. Whiptail skin is pretty rough. And your skill level is very impressive. I guess the old man wasn't wrong to recommend you. But even so, next time, stick to your orders. I appreciate seeing your skills in action. But I'd rather not lack manpower when we really need it. Kim was confused. Had he done something wrong? It's just that a normal person can face a whip tail. I need you to save your energy for the fights that normal explorers can't participate in. We don't need you wasting your energy here. I was just worried my body would freeze from the cold. So, I needed to get some cardio in. Sure, that makes sense. Boss, we're ready to move out. We have an hour to travel to the safe point. Kim hadn't expected the treatment for normal explorers and dungeon babies to be complete opposite. They left behind the body without batting an eye. The group's reaction would have been different if it was a dungeon baby. But it wasn't as if it mattered to him. It took them a week to reach the entrance of the second floor. They had only lost three minor people while taking down two more whip tails. The normal explorers were excited to collect the down gems. They would earn two hundred per person for the small gem. The group had collected a few gems on the way to the second floor. The hell spiders, we're going to be facing, have gems the size of your fist. The intelligence level of these explorers weren't very high. They most definitely had scraped the bottom of the barrel with this bunch. The not very bright explorer noticed a sparkle in the distance. Boss, we have a problem. We should have caught up with the lead group. Ma'am, the strange part is their tracks are a complete mess. It looks as though there was quite a battle here. I believe the first team found the spiders. Excuse me, boss, there's something unusual going on. 
down gems were falling from the sky. We were trying to collect them, but our bodies won't move in the air. What do you mean from the sky? Everyone prepare for battle. Yungte fired the flares. The group located the first team as the flare illuminated the ceiling. There's only ten people. This is only a part of the first team. We'll leave and regroup for now. Commander behind you. The commander destroyed the beast that was camouflaged behind her. Dungeon babies to the front. Explorers bunker formation. The group was doused in darkness as the flares went out. The dungeon babies guarded against incoming attacks in the dark. Someone fire off a flare. As the flare lit up the cave. The group had been completely surrounded by hell spiders. Bullcut Kid was excited to finally get some action. He rushed in and sliced one hell spider in half and skewered the second to the ground. With his sword stuck in the ground he drop kick tossed the incoming spider to the dungeon baby young ho who chopped its legs off, leaving the spider helpless. The brawler dungeon baby commented that young ho's cleanup was clumsy, as he smashed a spider's head in with his fists. He then proceeded to use the dead spider's body as a wrecking ball, saving fencer dungeon baby from an incoming attack. But Fencer was not pleased with his actions. She gave him an unamused stir, before slicing the spider in front of her into one hundred pieces. Brawler explained that he thought she needed help since she was taking her sweet-ass time. She sighed. Fencer was not amused by the strength of the enemy. The normal explorers wondered how she could fight anything stronger than the monsters before their eyes. The bunker group prepared for an incoming attack. But Kim dispatched the two spiders. As he ferociously cut down a group of them, frightening the normal humans and the commander alike. He's level seven? Him? As the battle drew to an end, the commander took charge of the situation. Check the injured first. Those who are fine should capture the spiders. Most of the dungeon babies had enjoyed their workout. I'm all warmed up. Yeah, I thought I was going to die from doing nothing for a week but Fencer was only interested in washing her hands. Weird. What is? Our records stated that hell spiders are beasts that live in the deep floors. But those spiders were weak. They could be no more than warm-ups. Maybe the beasts from the deep floors aren't that scary. Or maybe we're just too strong. But anyway, I'm just happy I didn't have to waste such nice explosives. Kim told the others that these are not hell spiders. I classify them as the same species. But hell spiders are so much bigger than this. This spider has no exoskeleton. And its epidermis is weak. This species is inferior to the hell spiders. And its fighting style is different. The hell spider specialized in close quarter combat. How do you? Kim silenced her. He thought to himself, spiders are careful organisms. The dum-dums were having another one of their genius breakthroughs. Why are there so many spider webs? Because we fought against spiders, duh. Kim thought spiders wouldn't make the first move, but these weren't here when we passed earlier. I don't know if these are even spider webs. Look how thick they are. They wait for their prey to fall into their traps. Kim thought as he processed the situation. Guys, look over here. The entrance we came in has been sealed. That's when Kim picked up on the murderous intent. You said you had explosives earlier? It probably would be a good idea to set them up on the blocked entrance. And you should do it as soon as possible. Isn't the battle over? Bullcut Kid understood the situation. This is like those cliches that often occur in comics. The strong enemy waits around and attacks when you least expect it. The hell spiders are hiding nearby. Bullcut Kid, Brawler, and Young Ho looked at Kim as if he was reading them a scary bedtime story. And then they all burst out laughing. I got scared for a second there. Yeah, I was wondering what you were going to say. But after all, we did come here to fight hell spiders. Did I not just tell you guys the things we fought just now are not hell spiders? Like I was saying earlier, exactly how do you know? How dare a microscopic bug? Wound my body! Don't even dream of having a graceful death. Kim knew exactly what was about to happen as he screamed. Get away from it! It's a hell spider. Have you been asleep this whole time? 
Fencer's last words were what nonsense, as the hell spider casually pierced her through the torso. Fencer couldn't believe this was happening, as she stirred up into the maw of the hell spider, fear painted across her face. Crunch. The hell spider devoured Fencer, and the battle began. They're coming. Explorers, stop what you're doing and gather. Jin Wu. So, those are the hell spiders and... Jin Wu? A normal explorer being tortured triggered a traumatic memory in Kim. Please save me. I don't want to die. Jin Wu? Are you alright? Jin Wu. Jin Wu. Ah. I'm sorry. The large one is the queen. And the two right in front of her are her babies. All the rest are part of the weaker, inferior species from earlier. You're going to need all of your explosives to make an exit. There's no time to worry about a cave collapse. Hell spider webs are far stronger than you could ever imagine. So, this isn't your first time seeing hell spiders. It seems that you have a lot of experience dealing with them. The dungeon babies were starting to tire out. The smaller spiders came at them in endless waves. We need the rest of the advanced party's dungeon babies to back us up. Do you not understand? There's not going to be any backup. The people hanging from the ceiling are the spiders' preserved meals. And the rest have been eaten already. What's the ETA on the bombs? Just a little longer. Why is running away a given anyway? Huh. Cause that archaeologist said so. We're the hell spiders, not what we came here to fight. Why are we retreating? Right after spotting our goal. Did you not see how easy they took Fencer out? She was being careless. Evade, the hell spiders at all costs. Brawler Baby was ready to give this his all. This is what I've been waiting for. He took to the air to meet the baby hell spider head on. You crazy bastard. You're going to get yourself killed. Hiya! Brawler Baby threw a fearsome punch. Squish! He was in total anguish. His arm had shattered from the impact. That's not possible. Fear had truly spread among the dungeon babies. They were frozen in place, as the second hell spider baby made an attack. Kim jumped in to rescue them. He enraged the hell spider baby, fracturing pieces of its exoskeleton. Kim readied himself. He knew he had to go hard, if he was going to force this hell spider to retreat. The dungeon baby stared on in amazement. Is... is he a monster? What are you staring blankly for? Hurry up and get back here! Kim glanced over his shoulder. He had succeeded in buying the time they needed to make it to safety. The baby hell spider's exoskeleton was in a horrible state. As Kim retreated in the opposite direction, the second baby hell spider came forward to reinforce his sibling. This isn't the time for me to show off. I'll die if I take this too lightly him. How long has it been since I last used my electricity? Arcs of lightning rippled off his body. The ground crumbled beneath his feet. Kim wasted no time, he charged headlong into battle. This sparked shock and fear in the other dungeon babies. We need to retreat now are the bombs ready? Yes, ma'am, the bombs have been installed. Detonate them then. What are you waiting for? Yes, right away, ma'am. Jin Wu. We're retreating, head for the exit. The normal explorers were in a frenzy, don't forget the rations. Yes, we need the rations. Kim knew this leader would never abandon him. He wouldn't second guess what he had to do next. He charged towards her, before she knew it, she was flying through the gap in the wall. He plucked her axe out of the air and sealed the exit. As the exit crumbled between them, he explained that it was impossible to give hell spiders the slip. It was always going to happen this way. Don't look back. Jin Wu. Don't do this. I'll be there when you reach the surface. Kim had ensured their safety at the highest cost. Why are you laughing at me? What a ridiculous bunch of spider bitches. So you think you won, huh? But in my opinion, I just shed a bunch of unnecessary responsibilities. You dumb spiders don't seem to understand what's going on. So, why don't we have some fun? Portal! Gate open. The Empire of the Naga stood in wait. I'll take the bigger of the two baby hell spiders. 
Warriors, you guys will take the other one. Soldiers, I give you the responsibility of protecting the gate and the archers. Archer, provide us with cover fire. The only problem in this plan is the Queen Hell Spider. So far, she hasn't interfered in any of the battles. The second floor is too small for her to attack us because of her massive body. She has to be careful not to collapse the cave and bury us all alive. This explains why she's only watched us up until this point. But she most definitely won't sit by and watch her babies be destroyed. Master, the spiders are making their move. Dominique, you stay inside the gate. There's no need to worry. They're hardly any better than some horned rats. We won't let a single one leave this place alive. Annihilate them! Kim started his attack with a feint, dodging at the last second. The archer understood immediately and fired off an explosive shot, which landed a critical hit on the hell spider. With this, the battle started in earnest. The archer fired constant shots towards the spiders. The hell spider charged towards the archer. I'm your enemy, foolish spider, the warrior said as he plucked the hell spider up and slammed him against the ground. Kim was shocked that this was going better than he expected. It was as if the archer were firing cannons. The soldiers were dedicated to the job of protecting his back. As his workers, and Dominique cheered them on. I guess I should put in some effort. I can't let my subjects outshine me. Kim decided he should show off a little after all. Dominic shouted in his head that the queen was starting to make her move. Kim instantly dodged the incoming blow. The spider's attack crashed to the ground, sending him flying. He was in shock. How hadn't he sensed that incoming attack? The queen let out a blood-curdling roar. He clenched his head for dear life. Combat force has exceeded the threshold and the hell spiders. Fear. Status alignment has been cancelled. Kim instantly looked towards his Nagas. A Naga soldier has received a fatal wound. A Naga soldier has died. The spiders were swarming his gate. The Naga archers and the Naga attendant Dominique have successfully resisted status ailments. A Naga warrior has received a fatal wound. Kim had to act now. He shouted for Dominique to answer. She explained the situation at the gate telepathically. The gate is in danger. We are being swarmed by the inferior spiders. The queen attacked him as he screamed for them to hold on. Kim put his arms up to defend against the attack. He was knocked back as he took the attack head on. He had no time to worry about the gate as he dodged the second attack. The queen hell spider turned her back on the gate, putting all her focus on the most dangerous enemy. There was no way he could ignore her and head towards the gate. If it started rampaging, everyone would be lost. There was no way he would let them down. They were all trying their hardest. As Kim hung from a perch on the wall, something caught his eye. This was exactly the chance he needed. He dodged away from the queen, dashing towards the second hell spider, at top speed. He split open its lower jaw, revealing a down gem the size of his fist. Kim released lightning from his hand. As he reached in, he said, I fully understand why you're stronger than I remembered. It's obvious since you've been holding on to something this nice. Kim ripped the down gem from its mouth as he dropped kicked its head. He rolled away as the queen hell spider attacked him with her front legs. Kim threw the down gem like a curveball towards his altar, just barely missing Dominique's head. You've offered a good quality intermediate down gem to the altar. Naga summon. Magician. Take down the spider. The weak mastery of Geyser has been activated. A rare plus rank Naga magician has been summoned. The magician released an ice attack that swept across the room, sweeping up all the spiders. Kim stared on, amazed at the sight. The baby hell spider bursts free of the ice prison. The smaller of the two warriors used his sword to block the attack. All the inferior spiders had been obliterated. But the baby hell spiders were completely fine. The magician must have prioritized area of effect over force. The half-dead weakened baby hell spider attempted to kill off the warrior while he was held up by his sibling. Out of nowhere, the fatally injured warrior cut the hell spider down. He roared in triumph. The magician had augmented his stump into a weapon a proud warrior would wield. 
Master. The warriors have finished off the hell spiders. All right. And what should we do about you? I sense that your weak points are your eyes, your mouth, and your leg joints. They're all obvious weak points, but none of that helps me. There's no way for me to reach its brain by haphazardly stabbing at her eyes. Entering its mouth is not an option either. Kim pondered his options as the cave around him crumbled. Master, the surrounding area has been heavily damaged if you aren't careful. That's it. Dominique, have the Nagas on standby. We'll attack the ceiling and dig our way to the first floor. What? Master, that's too dangerous. I don't have enough attack power to take this guy down Dominique. This is our only chance. Good. His attention is fully on me. It's time for me to repay you for ruining half my life. You should feel honored to be the first. He can't be planning to bury it alive. Master always has a plan so, let's see. We're on the second floor, and he's digging up to the first floor. There's no way something that large will be buried by just one floor. Is there something on the first floor? Think Dominique, the master is fighting desperately by himself. What can I do? Even the Nagas that should be fighting to protect can do nothing but watch. Their very existence is being denied. I'm his attendant. I must figure out his plan. Surely I can. That's it. He doesn't have enough attack power. Nagas. There's no need to be so depressed. We haven't been cast aside because we're useless. The master has always gone ahead of his servants to face danger head on. He's always watched out for our safety even in the midst of battle. He wants to avoid sacrificing our lives. He does this for the Naga. He's taken the initiative because this is something only he can do. Ah, uh, how magnanimous can one be? We're not mere spectators. He gave us the order to stand by. If we believe in him, our turn will surely come. All the Nagas roared in celebration. They would all wait for the opportunity to assist their master. Magician. We're going to need your assistance soon. Be ready. Our window will be brief. Kim dashed upwards, guiding the queen towards the first floor. Guiding this thing upward wouldn't be so hard, if it wasn't for these walls. Tremors shook the first floor. Doesn't it feel like the tremors in the ground are approaching us? Yeah, there shouldn't be any raid-class beasts on the upper floors. We should head back. Something doesn't feel right. Wait a second. Look there. The ground cracked and rose before their very eyes. The hell spider queen burst through the floor. A new entryway has opened between the first and the second floors. As such, the states of the first and second floors have changed. I don't have time for this. Close all pop-ups. I made it to the first floor, and I lucked out with such a large cave. Run back to the exploration team. Don't look back and just run. If there's explorers here, I most definitely didn't hit the surface. Now for the real problem. How do I send this guy back to the second floor? Magician! Now! Screamed Dominique. The magician cast his largest spell covering everything, including the queen. Kim wondered what was going on. A magic attack from below? No, that's a weakened ice attack. I bet the Hell Spider Queen is confused right now. No, we didn't attack you. We just covered the path leading up with a thick layer of ice. I doubt you'll be able to support your weight. Time to wash the spider out. Kim praised Dominique telepathically. I can't believe you caught on to my plan. You really are the best, Dominique. His? No, she most definitely won't die from the fall. Our master needed neither technique nor traps. All he was lacking was pure attack power. He needed the opportunity to launch a single, powerful blow which he wouldn't be able to launch from our current floor. The queen crashed into the second floor. Everyone moved before the sun dries the spider out. We can't let her move from that spot. Hold her down. Give it all you got. The Nagas pen the hell spider queen to the ground. Hold her steady. The master will finish her off. Kim charged himself with electricity. The moment he was full, he blasted down the hole. As he exited the water spout, he connected a direct hit to the eyes of the hell spider queen. Victory! 
Now the labyrinth, led by Kim Jim Woo. One casualty. One of your units has suffered permanent damage in combat. Its combat power will permanently decrease. Hell Spiders, led by Hell Spider Queen. Complete and other destruction. Rest in pieces. You have earned a heroic victory after absolutely crushing your enemies. Your charisma has risen sharply. Normal Commander. Kim Jin Woo has advanced from beginner commander to normal commander. Making a command will now boost ally combat power by 10% instead of 5%. You have defeated the Spider Duke's army. The fame of the Naga Labyrinth has risen. Your units have gained experience. Unit rank will be increased. Naga Warriors, increased to rare plus. Naga Magician, remained rare plus. Naga Archer, increased to rare. Naga Soldier, increased to rare. The Naga's body armor dropped to the ground. I can't believe their shapes changed as well. His severed arm isn't recovering. The Magician contributed greatly. Why is he not transforming? There's a few reasons for that. The first reason is mages require much higher experience. The second reason is mages have to raise their level themselves using the laboratory, which we won't attain until the labyrinth reaches level 4. 50 down gems are needed to upgrade the labyrinth, and we currently only have two. As Kim turned to check the loot, his workers rushed to present it to him. There was a total of six good quality down gems from the hell spiders, and another 44 good quality low down gems from the rest of the inferior species. While it was unfortunate he lost the Naga soldier, he definitely got some spare gems from this outing. You have offered two good quality intermediate down gems to the altar. The labyrinth upgrade is starting. There are 120 hours remaining until the upgrade is complete. I'll look suspicious if I return empty-handed, so I'll bring a few of the low down gems with me. Whatever master desires. Naga the fight is over, but there are still tasks to accomplish. Scavengers will appear soon, looking for scraps left behind after a large battle. Beasts, and explorers alike, will soon swarm this place. We have to conceal the gate at all costs. Take as many spider corpses as we need. And block all the nearby entrances with magic once I leave. Sheik. What's wrong with this guy? He's about to run out of mana. The rest of you, hide the gate with boulders. Sheik. Are you leaving right away, master? Yes, the road to the first floor is clear. I'll be back in time for the completion of the labyrinth's upgrade. As Kim collected rations for the trip, he noticed Dominique acting strange again. He looked over his shoulder and smiled. Good work, Dominique. It was a half-assed plan, but because of your improvisation, we made it out the other side. As for everyone else who fought, do you think about what you want? I'll reward you after I return. Good work, everyone. I'll see you in five days. Kim dashed upwards through the hole in the ground, making his way to the first floor. Five days later, the expedition team finally made it back to the entrance of Paiugate B. They all stood in shock to realize someone who they believed had perished had made it back before them. Oh, you finally made it back? Took you long enough but I only took five days for what should have been a two-week trip. Isn't that fast? That's not the problem. Kim stared blankly. Oh, you're hungry. Want some? This guy. So how did you make it back alive? I got lucky and managed to run away. You're not being serious. I'm pretty sure there was someone that said it was impossible to escape the hell spiders. I'm not sure who you're referring to. But if that's true, I really did get lucky. Were you always like this? I don't know. I owe you a debt for saving my life. I'll do my best to fulfill your wishes. We're born and raised in Geyser. You owe me no debt. We're living here on borrowed time in the first place. We don't live underground anymore. I owe you something. Then if you insist, there's one thing I want. What, what is it? Finish this for me. We'll call it even. With that, I'm headed home to rest. Oh, and I'll be keeping all the spider loot for myself. Jin Wu, I'll call you later, so please tell me about the deeper floors. I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. Ha ha ha, 
as expected of a twelfth floor dungeon baby. This is on a whole other level. I can't believe you retrieved twelve huge gems. I attained these from behind the backs of my expedition team, so I would appreciate it if you didn't tell anyone. Of course, of course. After the cost of the damaged gear, you'll receive around four hundred million. Four hundred million one? Why is it too little? I gave you a bigger cut. No, that's not it. Mr. Beck, please find me a house situated in a secluded area. The budget is three hundred million one. What do you take me for, a realtor? I guess I'll have to look for another dealer then. Since it's my number one customer asking, there's really no reason for me not to do it. I'd appreciate it if you also called someone and told them I work for you. What? Kim's father yelled through the phone. What nonsense! Sir, please calm down. No, sir, this place is just a regular jewelry shop. There is no need to go underground. Only the items from the labyrinth are. Kim headed out as Mr. Beck was berated on the phone by his father. It's not as if I could smash his head in. A portal cracked open in the throne room of the Naga's labyrinth. Welcome back, master. Yeah. It's not as if I can continue to put my family's life in jeopardy by opening a dangerous portal in our home. So I have no choice but to live independently. It's the best option for my family. Kim thought. Even if you were on a trip, how could you go twenty days without a single phone call? And what exactly is a labyrinth jewelry shop? You just want to go underground again. Kim thought really, I just want to avoid the nagging. He sighed as he made his way into the labyrinth. Master, are you hurt somewhere? I'm fine, just a bit tired. Are the upgrades complete? Yes, they finished a little while ago. It doesn't look as if much has changed. And there doesn't seem to be a new core either. Sir, no buildings were self-constructed automatically. But there are more buildings and units added. Rank 5 is when you can expect the labyrinth to undergo drastic changes. I guess the best option would be to slowly develop the labyrinth out. Master, a guest entered the labyrinth while you were gone. What? A guest? In our labyrinth. Yes, they've been waiting for you at the entrance. I've never heard of underground guests. There's a party that visits all labyrinths. There's no doubt that their power is great enough to cover every flooring geyser. Oh, oh, you're the new owner of the labyrinth. The black merchant greets the king of the great country. I look forward to working with you. Dominique spoke to her master telepathically, out of politeness to their guest. He's the black merchant master. I understand. This is so unlucky for Mr. Beck. I fear I might be losing a few gems here. So how did you find us here? Of course, I knew about this place. The news about this labyrinth's courageous owner, who has led the brave Nagas to victory against the Hell Spider's army have already spread. Master, he's lying. The black market's black merchant is watching almost everything that happens in Geyser. The black marketer seems to be in charge of this area even if you make an impression as a picky and weird person, you cannot let yourself be underestimated by him. Oh, you've got a pretty excellent attendant. Well, that's true. So what business do you have with me? Ah, we black merchants wish to establish a friendly relationship with the new labyrinth owner and to foster that relationship. In other words, I'm here to make some sales. Kim stepped away from the merchant, to have a chat with Dominique in private. I thought the black marketeers were dangerous. Can't we just kick him out? We cannot. If your relationship with him goes wrong here, he'll definitely go around Geyser spreading information on us. Since they've already noticed us, we have to play their game. This is such a pain. If you do a good job using them, it'll be beneficial to us. They're the best merchants in underground. They deal in many valuable goods. I guess I have no choice but to do some shopping. Can you bring the down gem, ah? And lastly, master. I recommend that if possible, go ahead and buy the first item that the merchant recommends. It seems you're done talking to your attendant. Yes, show me what you've got. What would you like to see? I'll take your recommendation. Ah, what an honor. I'll have to show you my greatest efforts since you've chosen to trust this lowly merchant. 
You're in luck. I happen to have a rare article. There are only a few of these left in Geyser. They're called parasites. The price is one high rank down gem. It's rather rude for me to say this, but I'm not sure you can afford that. Do you mind if I take a closer look? Of course. Kim inspected the parasite. He glanced back to Dominique to see if she agreed with this purchase. She nodded that this was the right choice for them. How much would it be if I use this good quality down gem? Five of those will do. This would deplete Kim's down gem supply. He inspected his newly purchased vials. So I'm going to assume that it's in their tradition to show their most precious artifact? As their first recommendation. Yes. I know it to be a very old tradition. Like I said before, it has no value if you keep it in that state. You must take it into your body. Yes, it's not like I will keep it as a pet. I trust you, Dominique. You've never steered me in the wrong direction. The parasite dug into Kim's hand, disappearing in an instant. It feels as if I'm slowly moving further away from being human. Well, it's not like I was ever close to being one to begin with. A parasite has invaded your body, starting synchronization between parasite and host. Well, to hell with the parasite. The merchant's visit has complicated things for us. Let's begin upgrading the labyrinth. I've put it off long enough. Dominique, please advise. Yes, master. Labyrinth upgrade complete. Labyrinth rank has advanced from rank 3 to rank 4. You can now construct facilities that were locked previously. You can now summon new military forces. Six rank 1 Naga workers have been added. Beings in Geyser that have yet to find a home may visit the labyrinth. It's been a bit since I've seen the stat windows. It looks as if our durability and limit for acceptance has gone up a lot. I feel like I rushed the upgrade a bit. Usually with a labyrinth, it's normal to build up the interior facilities or military force first, then you upgrade slowly. But our labyrinth possesses more than 90% of its military force, so we should be able to grow fast seeing as we don't have to expend resources on summoning a military. Or other labyrinth owners weak? No, they're not weak. They're more like shut-ins. I see. I will deal with the interior right now. Construction list. List of facilities available for construction. Cattle form. You can grow food for the Nagas who work hard for the labyrinth. Training center. By appointing a great senior as an instructor, you can have it slowly train your Naga military force. Bar. You can gain information from neutral creatures who are visiting the labyrinth. If you're lucky, they might even ally with you. Blacksmith. Laboratory. Temple. Each are needed for maximizing the ability of physics, magic, and healing. Each facility will help better the skills of the military force. Expand the labyrinth map. Dominique ordered the archers and warriors to find out the situation with the beasts that lived nearby. Don't worry about the labyrinth's defense. I'm planning on summoning a new defense force. Yes, master. Let's start by constructing a cattle farm and a bar near the Naga's nest. The laboratory, blacksmithy, and temple take up too much energy. So, I'll summon a military force to compensate for the time being. I'll sacrifice all of our low rank down gems to the altar. You've sacrificed thirty low rank down gems of good quality to the altar. Summon Naga. No, I shall summon a military. A week later, Kim set through a boring briefing of the state of the labyrinth. The Naga nest expansion construction's finished. I see. The capture of giant rabbits and black bears for cattle is also complete. I see. The workers without a job have been put to digging hallways and creating traps. I see. They are taking breaks, right? Yes, they're taking enough breaks. Good. The newly added military force is also on rotation between guard, patrol, and training. Lastly, I think the new map creation will be completed soon. It feels more like a proper labyrinth now, but I feel like we're too busy. Our maintenance costs skyrocketed. The down gems we get from hunting and farming is barely keeping us afloat. I understand now why the Duke Spider was obsessively starting wars. I guess I'll have to make another trip underground to get more gems. 
Master, are you sure that's okay? Is what okay? You've been staying in the labyrinth for longer than usual recently. I like it, but what about your family? Oh, I forgot to tell you. I moved out of my family's home about four days ago. I live alone on a mountain ridge now. There's absolutely nothing close by, no convenience stores and I don't have any neighbors. If there's an opportunity, I'll give you a tour above ground. Yes, please, incredibly, extremely. I mean I'd like that master. The portal's about to close. To think I've been in here for twenty-four hours straight. I'm headed out to get some rest. You do the same, Dominique. Okay. I'm beat. I didn't even have time to get anything to eat. I had to think of a way to heat up meals in the labyrinth. The parasite has succeeded in assimilating into the host's body for synchronization. The parasite will attempt to dominate the host. What? Dominate? Kim's right eye began to ooze blood. The pain he was in was unbearable. The whole right side of his face was melting away. The parasite was doing its best to assume control of him. Kim screamed out in horror as he fought for control of his body. Lee Jun Young had chosen a bad time to visit unannounced. Does he really live here? There's absolutely nothing around. Lee heard Kim's screams and rushed to help. Jin Wu, are you all right? Jin Wu? The melting flesh of Kim's right eye was retreating as he looked up at Jun Young. So, you've calmed down. Yes, I'll be fine, Jin Wu. I apologize that you had to see me in that condition. What exactly was that? It looked as if one side of your face was melting off. Well, it's not that serious. It's an eye disease that I got living in the labyrinth. I've never seen anything close to that and I've been in and out of geyser my entire life. Even among the dungeon babies who are known from the deeper floors. Are any of them from the twelfth floor? What? I got it from the twelfth floor in the Duke Spider's labyrinth. No way. But dungeon babies from the twelfth floor are all either dead or... Missing? Well, I don't know why people are considering me dead. When I'm right here, and obviously alive that explains why you know so much about hell spiders. Well, now she knows that I'm from the deeper floors. She seems pretty trustworthy, so it should be fine. So, what exactly is the reason for your discourteous visit? I'll assume old man Beck told you where I lived. I was wondering if you would be interested in joining us on our next expedition. I knew you would reject me even if I told you. It was because I wanted to repay my debt. So, I was thinking that I should just say that I wanted you to be a part of our team. I'll pay you more also. But I guess you're not interested since you've been strong enough to act on your own for years. All right. Huh. In fact, I haven't been acting on my own. I've been living on the surface, but I've started to think about getting back into the underground business. And it seems Geyser has changed a lot from the past. I can come along until I'm adjusted to it. Really? A dungeon baby from the twelfth floor. Will be a part of our team. I tell you again, it's only till I'm adjusted. I was sure you would reject me. I have to go back and edit the plans for the exploration. I'll see you out. The next exploration is in four days and our plans are to visit the sixth floor for about two weeks. Including us, the team members are five dungeon babies and ten normal explorers. You've previously met two of the dungeon babies from our last expedition. A team that could only run away from things on the second floor is going to the sixth floor. Huh. I guess we do seem a bit unqualified considering that you've only seen us in a bad light. But we're a veteran team that can even make it to the eighth floor if we try a bit harder. I'm just teasing you. The opponent was a bit hard. We're preparing all the equipment ourselves, so see you in four days. I'll text you the details. I need to run. I have a lot of stuff to prepare. By the way, next time you visit, call me beforehand. Or else I'll report you for trespassing. For sure. I've only been here a few days. It would have been a problem if the portal was open. Four days later near the Paiyudi gate. The entrance is pretty small. It looks like a subway entrance. A, B, and C gates are used for large-scale explorations. 
while D, E, and F gates are open to anyone as long as you show your ID card and report the number of your team members. Also, there's a new second floor path at the B gate. So, it's chaotic over there because of a bunch of second floor beasts. Ah, that's totally my bad. Damn, you must be the Kim Jin Woo. That saved our Jun Young, right? Nice to meet ya. I'm Jong Chan Sik, it was just a stroke of luck. I'm Kim Jin Woo. Luck? No, you're just really strong. When this guy looked at you, he ran away screaming. Heek! A monster! What are you talking about? You were the first to run away screaming. Anyway, nice working with you again. We'll also do our best. Well, enough with the chit chat. Let's go in. Young Ho, you lead the normal explorers. Got it. Chansik, I look forward to your good work today again. Of course, it's my job after all. You're not the captain? Just watch. You'll get it. Naga Labyrinth Bar. Dominique was drunk out of her mind. The attendant seems down these days. She's like that whenever Master is gone. At least we have a bar now. Before you came, she was so hysterical. She tried to cut off my tail for a snack. Saying don't worry, it'll grow back. That's so sky. There's also the rumor that she has a secret room where she keeps stuff that reminds her of him. Hyuk. What a secret room. That's not a bad idea. Soe. Since all of them were from one team, both dungeon babies and normal explorers were very efficient and systematic. Hyanil, you do the chasing if something happens, and you guys with the spears move to the center. Jun Young and Jin Wu stay in the back. Explain Zhang Chansik. Cool, right? Yeah. I see why he's the captain, despite the fact that his level is lower than yours. He has an ability even though he's from the middle floors. Detection ability. It gives you awareness of all living beings excluding those with camouflage or hiding abilities. This cheat-like ability can bring you to victory in most battles. I thought you had the same ability, Jin Wu. No, I just happened to sense them. I guess that the 12th floor dungeon baby's sixth sense is just on a different level. Did you just? Did you hear? I think she mentioned the twelfth floor. I told you, I hate when things get complicated. My bad. Captain order for all dungeon babies to get together. This is... It's the entrance to an abandoned labyrinth. Wolf monkeys have settled down on the path we usually take. If we want to go around them, we gotta go through here. I can't detect anything with my ability, so I don't think there's much risk. It's still a labyrinth so I'm asking for your opinion. It seems to be huge. Will it really be okay? Won't we get lost? I've been memorizing the path. So, it'll be fine. Then I have no objections. It will be a nice reference for the expansion of my labyrinth, Kim thought to himself. Well, that's decided then. We'll head to the center of the labyrinth. The owner's room. Now that I think about it, I hope the Nagas are doing fine. Don't dig more on that side. Make it as unnoticeable as possible. How's Draken's condition? He has a fatal wound, so it'll be a few more days until he recovers. How can he call himself a descendant of dragons? Can we not take a detour through the blood-marked territories? It's possible, but... For Master and the other ancient dragons to travel that distance is... There's no need to be afraid. All of Geyser knows that us ancient dragons are slow. So, if we take that detour? I expect the trip to take us three months. What if you go alone? The trip would take me around two weeks, Master. All right, since Darkin is useless, I'm putting you in charge. Imposter Rikshasha. It's the owner's room. It's only been a few hours since we entered the labyrinth. There weren't any beasts or traps. This is a very old abandoned labyrinth. It's been empty since the Great War. That's why the map says there isn't anything worthwhile here. The military has plans to redevelop the center of the third floor into a base. Wait, did you mention a map? Yes, you can buy one from the labyrinth shopping mall. You'll only be able to get a map of the upper floors. Only the military has maps of the middle floors. 
That makes sense, since they've done geyser explorations for a decade. I'll have to pick up a map to update my map synchronization. We're camping here for the night. You two take a few explorers and set up a motion sensor devices. The rest of you get the camp up and running. The quicker we get it done, the more time we have to rest. Chop chop. He won't tell me to do anything. I explained this to you last time. You need to conserve your energy. You're the strongest in the team, so you should get used to us treating you like this. When the time comes, everyone will be counting on you. If you're really that bored, why don't you go explore the owner's room? Do you see that over there? That's the throne of the dude that ruled over this labyrinth. To think monsters were treated like kings. I can't say I ever get used to it. Activating parasite ability detection. Kim's eye lit up like a sharingan. The pain was bearable this time. Cook. Jean Wu? Are you okay? Is it your eye's disease again? Yeah. It is not as bad as last time though. Just in case, can you make sure the others give me some space? Yes, no problem. I just think it might shock people. I guess she can't see the panel in the air. Ah, uh, there's no pain anymore. It's been pretty calm since the parasite domination failure. My vision's a bit weird. What's this? It only shows up with my parasite eye. Kim dug through the remnants of the altar. Detection. This isn't a down gem. You've found a labyrinth fragment. Abandoned labyrinth fragment. Eleven out of thirty. A fragment that's been exposed to dungeon energy for a long period of time it's old but still useful. I guess I saw it because there's a use for it. Though I wish it was a down gem instead. Parasite is expanding its detection ability. Kim's attention was instantly captivated. Wait, could it be? This is all. A down gem? Dominique was back to being drunk and depressed. She just wasn't herself without her master. The two workers stared at her with big, open eyes. Hewo. Aren't you guys on watch today? What are you doing holding equipment? Greeny. Sunbeam. What's wrong with the attendant? Well, the thing is... What? You're telling me she's feeling conflicted because she's decided to make a room dedicated to Master, but she's feeling guilty that she's building a room for herself before Master has his own. Why doesn't she just ask us to construct a room for herself then? We can make a room for Master and a room for her too. She's of a higher status than us, and she's very similar to a human. So of course, it would be uncomfortable for her to sleep in the nest with us. She's behind me, isn't she? Excellent. The expedition team had broken camp and was headed to their next checkpoint. It doesn't seem as if you got any rest last night. But strangely, you seem in a good mood. Do you have a weird fetish or something? No. But I am tired from the amount of sleep I got last night. Most were small and low in quality. So I feel like shit at the moment. But I collected tens of down gems during the night and hid them in this labyrinth. I also ran around to unlock parts of the map and mark the location of my treasure troves. I'm going to have to make a trip back here alone to retrieve them. The parasite is solely responsible for this, to the point where I almost feel compelled to grant it a wish, if it were possible. Parasite is curious about human cooking. It looks like we've run into some trouble. He's calling for the dungeon babies to gather around. It must be a beast. Around that corner there are two groups of beasts blocking the exit we have to pass through. My best guess is that they're either blade incisor bats or four-armed monkeys. In the worst case scenario, there are wolf monkeys. I believe there to be twenty bats and around eight monkeys. I'm assuming that your ability doesn't let you know the particular species we're dealing with. I can only tell their location, numbers and whether they're the same species or not. There's nowhere around them, and they won't be moving out any time soon. Shouldn't we wait for them to fight each other so that they decrease their numbers? That's more dangerous. Both groups are far too large. If they fight, they'll track other predators. If that happens, we'll most likely get trapped here. So, I guess the decision is obvious. We have to fight them. I really wanted to avoid battles until the sixth floor. But I guess there's no other option. 
They haven't started fighting each other yet. As soon as they do, we'll use that to our advantage. No, it's not that simple. There are twenty-eight mid-sized third-floor beasts in the next room. And there's enough in each group for them to be fighting over territory. Ha ha ha! Third-floor beast, as if. They're just like little bugs. To Jinwu, that is. You can't be serious. There'd be no end to this if we just sit around and wait. So in my opinion, we should just fight them. If possible, that would be the best to. Then let's head in. I'll take half, you guys can have the rest. Luck was on their side. There wasn't a wolf monkey in sight. Perfect, they've started the battle for us. There is over thirty of these beasts. Today's the day I die. No way. Kim dashed towards the battle, leaving the ground behind him destroyed. He's moving so fast, I swear there's more than one of him. No way he's killing them in one hit. Normally it takes a lower floor dungeon baby minutes to kill just one beast. Dungeon baby's fighting methods are related to the labyrinth they were in. The floor level as well as the environment. Attacking without thinking until the opponent falls. That's the way most dungeon babies fight. But, he's delivering one-hit kills. He's aiming only for the vital points, as if he can see them. His speed and strength seems just a bit higher than Jun Young's. There's no way he's able to move like that. Jin Wu's from the Marcus Labyrinth. Marcus? You can't mean? The labyrinth from the deepest part of the seventh floor. Sarlat Lion Marcus Labyrinth? That's the one. He would have had to go through many labyrinths and beasts to get to the sixth floor. He probably learned the most efficient battle method in order to survive. Since that labyrinth location is deeper than the eighth floor entrance. That totally makes sense. If he's from that labyrinth, he would most definitely have an inherent talent for battle. There's just no other way to explain it. He's not even attacking at full power and I had to make a lie up to protect him. I'll have to think up a believable story for him to tell people. Are we gonna let him have all the fun? Right. He's carrying us all on his own. We need to at least. Show some effort. My body feels extremely light. And the enemies are moving so slow. I don't get it. I'm sure I wasn't fighting with all I had just now. No, I'm most definitely repressing my strength. My level is currently close to Jun Young's. So why are the mobs falling as if I'm giving it my all? Due to the parasite, your dormant powers have been activated to a low degree. Depending on the host's dormant powers, there may be a difference in the increase of power. Due to the parasite, Kim Jin Wu's ability, weakness detection, has been strengthened. Kim turned around. The parasite allowed him to see through the chest of the forearmed monkey. The monkey's ribs were protecting its vital points. So... This is what the parasite is showing. The more I find out about the parasite, the more wonderful it seems. The price I paid seems cheap by comparison, other than the part where it tried to dominate me. I have to do my research in order to fully utilize it. Parasite has already recognized the host. A parasite who has completed synchronization with the host will try its best to keep the host alive for its own survival. Jin Wu. We're done here. Me too. You said you'd take half, but you killed around 70%. Was it too much? It does make the exploration more convenient. But please think of me, who has to make excuses for your skills. Rumors are spreading among the explorers about how you're the hero made for war. You're about to become a legend. I guess I overdid it a bit. The battle's over. So don't fool around and go gather the down gems before the other beasts arrive. What are you waiting for? Move out. Jun Young. Ah, Chansik, you did great. We have another problem. What is it? Another explorer team is nearby and they're twice our size. They're approaching us, dividing into groups as if to surround us. I was distracted by the battle, so I wasn't able to detect them earlier but they were probably watching us from at least halfway through the battle. Everyone prepare for battle. Be on guard. I don't understand. They're not beasts, so why do we? Beasts aren't the only enemies in Geyser. Because laws are meaningless down here, 
it's commonplace for others to steal your spoils. There are about thirty mid-sized beast bodies, and everyone is tired from the battle. An exploration team twice our size, watching us from afar and only approaching after the battle's over. If we didn't have Chan sick with his detection ability, we would have been ambushed. They know we are aware of them. They're gathering together. Are they leaving? Have they abandoned the idea of an ambush? Not sure, but they're still approaching. Everyone stay on guard for now, and act accordingly. The exploration team's tired, so we'll get caught even if we run. Jean Wu. I know it feels like we're depending on you a lot. Can I leave it to you if things go amiss? Of course. I like you guys. Well, well. If it isn't you guys. Jun Young was instantly furious. Song Jiangchul, you bastard. Huh. Don't be so mean. We haven't seen each other in a while. I'm happy to see you. I'm surprised you're back on your feet. I heard you guys got massacred by the spiders on your last outing. How productive. You must have extra lives of something. Enough with this bullshit. Just go your own way. Why are you so sensitive? You know everyone has to pass through here to get to the lower floors. So, did you? Get anything good? Who is he? There's an organization called Exploration Association. The government has backed them up recently, but they're basically a gang who restricts the labyrinth's entrances and creates tyranny. And the government's okay with that? It's hard to believe, but there are already a high influx of people who registered for the association. At this point, more teams are in the association than those who aren't. These kind of things happen because so much money is involved in the geyser business. They probably think their cause is just and perfect for everyone. But in the end, it's just a fight for money. I don't care for such power structures. Parasite is evaluating the opponent's power. There are nine dungeon babies. Song Jiangchul is a bit stronger physically than Jun Young. The rest are below 7th floor level. They have about 40 explorers, all holding weapons. And their facial expressions haven't changed at all. So, I would assume they're used to this. If we fight this side, we'll most definitely be massacred excluding me. They're getting on my nerves. Killing intent! And it's on par with that of the king of the labyrinth. My body won't move. This is dangerous. Is the king nearby? No, this is coming from right behind me. Don't tell me. Wahaha. Look at you. Why are you acting so scared? It was just a prank. My little Jun Young has become so cute since escaping the labyrinth all those years ago. No way I'm scared of you. Chansik waved her off. She had to keep this between them. Ha, you're making me seem like a bad person here. But I had fun regardless. You guys must have suffered quite a bit thanks to the spiders. But surprisingly, it looks like you got everything under control here. This big brother has quite a lot to do, you know. Wink wink. Everyone, we're heading out. Let's not touch our little Jun Young's prey. Oh, that's right. I don't believe we met before. But let me give you a piece of advice. My little Jun Young here is cute and all but her expedition team here couldn't even record their names down in the association. I will advise you not to join their expeditions in the future. Well, you seem pretty useful, so let me know if you're interested. I'll treat you well. Just drop my name, Song Jiang Chul at the association. They should recognize it, and they'll take care of you. I'm not interested. Yeah, I'll be waiting. See you around, Jun Young. That little. Calm down. We just dodged a bullet. Jean Wu, you should calm down as well. Oh. You already have. What did I do? Stop acting so calm. There's no use pretending. I've never felt such a strong killing intent in my whole life. I thought that the Labyrinth King was behind me of something. I'm sorry. Sometimes that just happens. What killing intent? We didn't feel anything. Your senses need to be at a certain level in order to feel these things. If everyone could sense it, the normal explorers would have fainted. So how do you know this song, Jiangchul? The two of us came from the same labyrinth. He wasn't like that back then. He was pretty normal. He was always quite aggressive, but he was a good leader. 
I knew he had got a taste for freedom and money after escaping. But there's no way a person could have changed that much. I think it's best if we head back after collecting the beast here. Yeah, we should head back while we're still ahead. At the moment, this trip is quite profitable. Wasn't our goal the sixth floor? Song Jiangchul's expedition team would be a problem if we continue. We got lucky this time, and we have no idea what he'll do if we meet again. With the size of that expedition team, the floors are going to be a total mess under normal circumstances I would have us continue, and just be extra cautious. But we've already earned a profit. So, it's best we just head back. Everyone gather around. We'll be heading back to the surface now. Our journey back went smoothly, and we made it back to the surface after being underground for only a week. Look, it's the exit. Unfortunate events used to happen every time we set foot in the geyser. Please come up to collect your payment after I call your name. It feels strange to have everyone come back alive. It's because we decided to escape before anything happened. Explore Association Song Jiangchul. I should look into it more. Sure, I know of Song Jiangchul. He's with the Explorer Association. I would describe him as the brute of the association. He's quite noticeable. I understand why Junyum is so against the association. They directly restrict and control the geyser. But thanks to them setting a minimum level requirement for the dungeon babies, the survival rate of the normal explorers has increased drastically. The survival rate increased? Back then, dungeon babies had no restrictions on bringing explorers in. It was common for whole teams to be wiped out. That's why the survival rate used to be around 50%. Depending on how you look at it, it could be a restriction or just a set of rules. But public opinion seems to lean in favor of the association's control of the geyser. So I guess it's something like an adventure guild that you commonly see in novels or comics. Did Song Jiangchul cause trouble or something? I've never come across any rumors about him. And I keep my ear to the ground. But if he is up to no good, it's not like he's going to go around spreading stories about himself. He's going to keep it on the down low. And you knew so much about someone's familial situation. Do you think gathering information about the geyser is easy? After thorough investigation, all I'm able to attain these days are rumors. Now that I think about it, there are groups called human hunters roaming around. Human hunters? They're high-level dungeon babies that band together without any explorers. They prey upon the expedition teams in the geyser. They're crazy bastards who cover themselves with bandanas and go around with their teeth sharpened like that of a shark. Some may be from the abyss, so you should steer clear of them at all costs. That's exactly the kind of information I need from you. But I don't think you have to worry too much being that you're from the twelfth floor. You don't have any down gems to sell? They paid us in cash this time, so I don't have any on me. Seeing as how public opinion is in favor of the association— I wonder if Jun Young has a different reason for not caring for them. I can't seem to find any problem with the Explore Association. This is a total pain in the ass. I don't think I'm going to involve myself any further. Dominique was a nervous wreck. All she did the whole time her master was gone was wander the halls, pining for his return. She was in shock that Kim was back so soon. Master, you're back early. My expedition ended earlier than expected. Is everything all right in the labyrinth? Dominique? We have a guess. They're currently waiting in the pub. What? Again? Is it the black merchant again? I don't have any gems to spare. He can just bugger off. No, he hasn't returned. It's an underelf mercenary. What? An elf. I'll go see for myself. Master. Underelfs have either a sense of loyalty nor pride. If you're thinking of hiring an underelf. If they're so untrustworthy, why didn't you just kick them out? Why would you let them inside our labyrinth? I wanted to do that, but... Unfortunately, we don't have anyone skilled at scouting in the Naga labyrinth currently. We have archers with a wide range of vision, but they're all too big to be scouts. Because of this, I figured an underelf would be useful to master. They are quite far from the dexterous type and our map production has been delayed as well. An appropriate scout would speed that up. 
Thank you, Dominique. I understand. I'll make the judgment call myself. I apologize, Master. Don't worry about it. I should be the one making these decisions anyway. Kim greeted the barkeep right away as he walked into the bar. A mysterious figure sat alone in the corner. She instantly charged towards him. Kim stared at her, not flustered in the slightest. So, you're the elf I heard about. She stared at him with disgust in her eyes. How rude! As a guest, you should be paying your respects, elf. The elf glanced in Dominique's direction. She got down on her knees and prostrated herself in front of Kim. Oh, so lord of the throne who sees through the veil of darkness. This lowly wanderer of the underworld has dwelt unauthorized, in the darkness that you own. Please give me the great honor of presenting the name of this worthless wanderer to the great master of the... Speak. I am Rikshasha, an underelf mercenary. Very well, Rikshasha. You seem rather confident in your speed. But I wish to know why you approached me with a weapon in your hand. It almost seemed like you were going to stab me if I couldn't match your speed. How dare you! Dominique! Stop it! O oh, King of the Naga! This lowly, worthless being imprudently questioned the king's competence. There's no need to embellish your words like that. I can't stand that stuff. Rikshasha instantly stood straight up. I've never seen a human sit on the throne of a labyrinth. I just wanted to confirm if you were competent enough to be worthy of my servitude. Ha! Huh. So, did I pass? Yes, I judge that I have no way of harming the king in a direct fight. How straightforward. I like it. You said you were a mercenary? Yes. What's your specialty? Scouting, searching, and collecting information. Perfect. You're hired. Master. Calm down, Dominique. You're the one who said we needed a scout. But, let's continue this conversation while we show you around the labyrinth. Yes. Rikshasha slyly smiled towards Dominique. Dominique was furious. This place was sloppy. Everything seemed so sloppy. The labyrinth core is wide open. You can even see it from the hallway. This labyrinth doesn't have a trap at the entrance, let alone the maze. Their workers don't show a hint of seriousness. Just what is this human trying to accomplish? Is he even aware of the fact that he's the master of a labyrinth? Rikshasha was shocked at the sight of two workers roughhousing. Master, your workers are slacking off. Ah, those guys are off duty today. Off duty? It means they have the day off. How could a worker of the labyrinth get a day off? Nonsense. Providing them with proper meals and rest is a much better decision than working them to their limits. The more you use your muscles, the less effective they become. Less effective? I was once part of an excavation team. I'm just thinking from the perspective of a worker. His mindset is way too naive. What can you expect from a human? Even if they're the master of a labyrinth. I'll give you a tour of the training hall. This labyrinth won't last very long. This place is worthless. Dominique who's using the training hall today? The mages currently have access. I'll follow my plan. A few days later. The development of the labyrinth is too slow. To be more exact, our down gem income is too low. The down gems we mine from the load are barely enough to keep our workers paid. Fortunately, we have plenty of food and potable water. Our forces occasionally hunt down the beasts near the labyrinth for down gems and supplies as well. Our daily income is around three low-grade down gems. Since a single low-grade down gem is three points. I keep thinking that I went overboard creating my military force. I had 162 down gems, after summoning 50 soldiers, that brought me down to 112. Keeping those soldiers fed... Trained and entertained cost me another 90 down gems. Dominique, what's our current soldier count? Two of our soldiers died in the last battle. We currently have 42 soldiers, two knights, one mage and one healer. Kim leaned back on his throne, disgusted with the situation. The bigger our forces grow, the harder it is for me to command each individual. Now that we are scouting farther, we're also encountering wild beasts more frequently. We suffer losses every time we battle. 
if not for the healer we summoned towards the end. Our forces may have already been annihilated. Our soldiers are as strong as mid-level floor beasts, yet they're still dying in battle. I don't know how the situation on the first floor has become like this. Master? There isn't a first floor in the Naga Labyrinth. What did you just say? I arrived at the Naga Labyrinth by falling from the first floor. The deepest I could have fallen and survived was to the second floor. I think the labyrinth devoured you, master. After you succeeded the throne, the labyrinth moved you back to the original place. Sometimes a labyrinth without a master usher in a new potential master in this way. Is that so? So the reason why the human items my first scouts brought back seemed to come from the war era. Isn't because we're in an isolated part of the dungeon. The entrance I used with that camera crew team was an illegal path off the ridge. So, what floor of geyser is this? I haven't stepped foot out of the labyrinth since I was summoned. So, I have no clue, master. That's quite troublesome. As much as I want to worry, so much time has already passed. Besides, there are relatively safe places even at deeper levels. And there's no guarantee that this place isn't on the deeper level. Where is Rikshasha? She's most likely in the pub after returning from scouting. Why are you asking about that rude and arrogant elf mercenary? Because it's ridiculous that I don't know what floor of my labyrinth is on. However, she might have an idea of exactly where we are. Rick Shasha. I'm honored to be visited in person by your esteemed self. Humph. It's not like we can allow an ungrateful mercenary like you in the throne room. Then why don't you add a door to that room? What did you say? Both of you cut it out. Rikshasha. You said you were a wanderer before coming here? Yes, that's right. Then do you know what floor this labyrinth is on? I do remember hearing about how humans divide the underground according to that concept. But as someone who was born and raised in the underground, I don't understand that human concept. That makes sense. If you want, I could tell you about my experiences prior to being hired here. Oh, that sounds like a good idea. Please carry on. Hmm, I see. I'm sorry to inform you of this. But right beside the Naga Labyrinth, there lies the Labyrinth of the Flood Dragon King. A being who has survived the War of the Underworld. Kim was shocked that his enemies were so close. Rikshasha informed Kim that the Flood Dragons were her previous employer. And they were a very old labyrinth, dating back to before the Great War broke out. Anaxtus is the labyrinth's master and king of the flood dragons. He's the strongest of the flood dragons and has ruled upon his throne for many decades. Kim was more interested in knowing exactly how close his adversaries were. If you take the direct path, which by the way is the most dangerous, it will take you four days to reach their location. He couldn't believe that such a dangerous labyrinth was right under his nose. Kim wondered exactly how powerful they were. For them to exist for multiple decades could only mean they had plenty of time to gather resources. He wondered exactly how many labyrinths this behemoth had absorbed. It's not uncommon for larger labyrinths to absorb smaller ones on a regular basis. He knew this firsthand. Back when he was just a little dungeon baby slave, he spent all his time digging attack routes to other dungeons. Because of this, he had seen his fair share of battles among the dungeon beasts. Also. I'm pretty sure they know of the existence of the Naga Labyrinth. The Flood Dragons, they know about us. Why do you believe that to be the case? Rikshasha explained that between the two labyrinths is a dangerous area ruled by the Blood Leopards. For some reason, the Flood Dragons attempted to conquer the Blood Leopards' territory. But they failed in the process. I don't see any other reason for them to attempt such a feat other than to get to you. So them failing to secure an attack route means what for us? It means they're going to be forced to take a detour to get to this labyrinth. And seeing as how the flood dragons are among the slowest species in Geyser, it should take them at least two months to reach this location. Kim let Rikshasha know that was a silver lining indeed. They truly needed the time to prepare. And two months would be enough to accomplish their goals. He was puzzled why exactly she knew so much about this situation. Rikshasha wasted no time explaining that she was employed by them after all. Dominique accused her of being a spy. She admitted that, after all, 
she was indeed a mercenary. And as a good mercenary, she always accomplishes the tasks that's set before her by her employers. But currently she's hired by the king of the Naga Labyrinth. And she's loyal to the gems he provides. Kim wasted no time providing her with a new objective. But she immediately informed him that any type of fighting was out of the question. She didn't have to worry. He had no intentions of sending her into battle. First, I want you to inform me on everything you learned and experienced while being employed by the Flood Dragons. Next, I want you to go on a reconnaissance mission I need to know their precise numbers and the trajectory of their attack. I'm assuming you didn't get fired so the danger level of this task should be low. Rikshasha assured him she could handle the task, but such a job wouldn't be cheap. Good. We'll have your money. How long do you believe the ETA should be on this task? It will take me about a week. He supplied her with food and supplies and immediately sent her to accomplish the job. Time was truly of the essence. He would need to get to work immediately. Dominique believed the dirty elf to be hiding something. She didn't have to worry, for her master was well aware. She offered her services to a weaker labyrinth on the verge of war. Oh, she definitely has alternative motives. Kim doubted she was currently employed by the Flood Dragons, although there is a chance that she's an aggressive mercenary. But his true reason for asking her to divulge her experiences and thoughts while working for the Flood Dragon King wasn't to gain information. Kim was assessing where her loyalties lie. And currently she has very little loyalty for Anaxtus. Kim had a plan and he fully expected Rikshasha to sell every piece of information she gained under his employ. Dominique was ready to order a group of soldiers to cut her down immediately. But her master ordered her to hear him out. If she delivers the information she currently possesses, it wouldn't be a disadvantage in the least. She currently believes that the Naga soldiers are our only forces. That we don't have any down gems saved up. She will report that we're weak and trembling in fear. Dominique was confused for everything he had just said was true. Kim admitted that it was indeed all true except for the part about them trembling in fear. But he had discerned a key piece of information early in their conversation about the Flood Dragons. The king of the Flood Dragons and Axtus spent the entirety of the Great War hidden from humans. Rikshasha explained that he had heard a rumor that the humans had in their possession a weapon that could kill him. For a dungeon monster who believed himself to be immune to all forms of attacks. Such knowledge just didn't sit well with him, sending him into hiding. And here I am, a human, the very thing the great flood dragon is afraid of. With that, he informed Dominic that he would be back in three days and that she should look forward to a gift when he returned. Jun Young awoke with a start. This was her day off, and she fully intended to sleep it away. But when she realized that Jin Wu had initiated a conversation, she hurriedly answered immediately inquiring on whether he was interested in joining her team. Kim held the phone away from his face until she calmed down. He immediately inquired about the favor she insisted she owed him. She encouraged him to call in that favor at any time. It turned out he had a few things he was interested in, and hopefully she could obtain them. In only one week's time, the Naga Labyrinth had their first altercation with the Flood Dragons. A large dragon had cornered a Naga soldier. He wasn't impressed with the small soldier in front of him. He knew it couldn't even scratch his hide much less do any serious damage. It was most definitely his noble bloodline that afforded him such luxuries. His lineage only created greatness. He was truly the descendant of dragons. The golden dragonoid was truly in a world of his own. His two companions knew better than to inform him that the Naga soldiers couldn't touch them either. They really couldn't take another epic about how great he was. The last time they made such a mistake, he went on for literally days. Day in and day out, they had to put up with him putting descendants of dragons at the end of every sentence. When they were crossing the territory of the Blood Leopards was the only time they got any peace on this trip. During that treacherous crossing, he could barely bring himself to speak. He had almost died during the Flood Dragon's attempt to subjugate the Blood Leopard territory. The two had gotten carried away discussing their dragon-obsessed friend. He had almost heard them. They instantly did their best to cover for their lapse in judgment. The legendary descendant of dragons is so powerful. 
You're not just a descendant of dragons, you are a dragon. The golden dragonoid instantly took to such compliments, he was truly flattered. Energized by their words, he rushed towards the Naga Labyrinth. The first thing he would do when he got there would be to rest upon the throne. Such a tiring journey required him to do nothing less than that. The flood dragons instantly reminded him who that throne belonged to. For if Anaxtus heard such words, he would truly be angered. The golden dragonite spotted a naga, giving him the opportunity to ignore the two flood dragons. Spotting such a poor defenseless worker could only mean they were very close to the entrance of the naga labyrinth. They couldn't let the little green guy get away, for he would blow their cover. They chased after him, knowing he would lead them right to their destination like a good little green GPS. The golden dragonoid had Greeny cornered. He threatened to make him pay for causing him such trouble. As he reached in to snatch up the Naga worker, he was blinded by a flash of light and the Naga worker was no longer in arm's reach. Kim wanted to know if it was normal for descendants of dragons to be so loud. He was not pleased, for no one tarnished the name of the great dragons. Such words would ensure that the two would battle to the death. The golden dragonoid asked for the identity of the rude stranger. Kim immediately announced himself as the Naga King. You could tell that the flood dragons had the fear of humans instilled in them. They wanted to report back to their king immediately. But the golden dragonoid Draken Nim could care less that Kim was a human. He insisted that there was nothing to worry about. He would just take care of this human problem and all would be good in their new neighborhood. Draken Nim, the descendant of dragons, would never back down to the likes of a human. Come human, let's fight to the death. In the short time Kim had been around this wannabe dragon, he had heard descendants of dragon this and descendants of dragon that. It was really getting old. He ordered Dominique to get the show rolling. All around the cavern glowing eyes stared down at Drakenim. He knew this had to be the ideal of the cowardly human. Who else but a human would stoop so low as to set up an ambush? When his opponents came into view, he couldn't believe his eyes. It was a bunch of little tiny workers. While the Naga Labyrinth's workers got ready, Drakenim chastised him for endangering the lives of his Naga workers. He insisted that having a new labyrinth was no excuse for such actions. And such a king should be ashamed of himself. The Naga workers took aim. Dominique had had enough of this trash. As the descendant of Dragon flipped out and started his rambling again, she ordered the workers to light this fool up. They alone would be enough to handle a low-life descendant of a dragon. With that, they opened fire. Rikshasha had arrived in the domain of the flood dragons. This was a true labyrinth. It was dark and depressing. To enter, you had to pass through a maze full of traps with the sole intention of taking the life of intruders. This place wasn't soft. It had no breaks and food was hard to come by. The workers give everything they have until the day they die for nothing in return. This was a true labyrinth. Not some paradise made by a human. She bowed before the great flood dragon, honored to be in his presence. She informed him that she had accomplished her task of passing on the knowledge of the flood dragon's labyrinth existence and intent to wage war upon them. They would soon begin to prepare for the war if they haven't done so already. But I advise you, honorable king, to not have high hopes for what this labyrinth can achieve. Their lack of manpower severely restricts their ability to acquire down gems. Rikshasha revealed her plans to exploit the Naga labyrinth's lack of resources. She would advise them to subjugate the blood leopards for a chance to earn the fortune needed to survive this war. The most opportune time for your invasion will be when their workers are weak after their clashes with the blood leopards. If things goes well, the human may even have ceased to exist. The Honorable Flood Dragon was pleased with her work. He gave her new orders to make sure the Naga Labyrinth attacked the Blood Leopards one week after they entered its territories. With her prompting, the Flood Dragons will begin their journey to the Naga Labyrinth the very next day. He informed her that she didn't have to worry about how long it took them to arrive, for they had other means of transportation. They had no intentions of taking the normal two-month route. The muzzles of gunfire flashed around the cavern. The Naga workers were eager to put a hurting on these intruders. The flood dragons believed they had nothing to fear from human weapons. 
but within a few seconds their beliefs changed. The bullets were penetrating their hide, causing their blood to flow. If only they had retreated when the human first appeared, they would not be in this situation. But listening to Draken was once again complicating their lives. They urgently needed to get word to their king of this new development. But as they turned to retreat, the Naga soldiers had blocked them in. They were fully surrounded. Gunfire at their front and shields at their backs. Their situation was truly dire. A few days ago, Jun Young had came through on her promise. She was like his very own merchant of death. The weapons she delivered were originally illegally created to be used in the geyser. They were mass-produced, but in the end the whole business venture went belly up. The firepower had been increased but they were highly unstable. But this was fine by him as it wouldn't take long to get the job done. Jun Young had to have some serious connections to pull through on such an order. She truly didn't understand why he needed such weapons with his power. He casually explained that they were just toys for him to play with. Kim knew the weapons weren't very dangerous at all. And it wouldn't take long for the dragons to figure that out also. But it brought him joy watching Dominique have so much fun. She had no cares in the world as she lit the dragons up with her gatling gun. As Draken cowed away from the gunfire it finally came to his attention that he wasn't in any pain. He cracked open a single eye and realized that he was truly impervious. He was overjoyed with this, his cowardice dropped and his cockiness surfaced. He strutted around, showing how truly powerful he was. Dominique laid it on hard, but it was no use. He was invincible to her attacks. Draken showered in her bullets, enjoying the attention. The Naga soldiers had had enough and attempted to put him down. But his chin was so thick, their blade shattered on impact. He had no time for such trash and punted the soldier out of his sight. He taunted the Naga army. If this was all they had, then they should just surrender immediately. Dominique was done playing games and decided to pull out the big guns, or should I say rocket. But his Naga army had done enough. It was time for Kim to step in and handle this situation. Draken being the coward that he was, wasn't interested in fighting the king of a labyrinth, and decided it was time for him to exit the stage to the right. Kim rushed in, sending his opening attack straight for Draken's head. But you didn't live this long being a coward without gaining great reflexes. And as such, he easily dodged. Kim was stunned that he had missed such a large target. But he was instantly put on defense as Draken countered his blow with a smash to the ground. Kim dodged to Draken's rear and laid attacks into his back. As he landed a blow to the back of Draken's neck, he finally got a reaction. The crybaby hopped around, going ouch, 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 as Kim stood there stunned at his enemy's reaction from taking damage. He was sent flying by the dragon's tail. Kim stood up, not understanding what in the world he was facing. For someone with such an amazing physique, he really had an awful sense of battle. Kim couldn't figure out if the dragon was truly playing with him. He knew this had to be some kind of joke as the joke was trying to sneak away in plain sight. Kim wasted no time resuming the battle. He laid down a barrage that did no damage to the dragon's hide. He didn't understand how someone with such an amazing defense was acting like such a giant loser, as Kim debated how it was possible that such a creature had no weak spot. His parasite gave him a glimpse of where he should be focusing his efforts. Kim really needed to stay on his toes because Draken seemed to be the master of cheap shots. As the descendant of dragons wondered whether his attack worked, Kim emerged from the dust cloud, explaining what he'd learned. He was impressed that Draken was truly a descendant of dragons. But with being a descendant of dragons, you share one of their ultimate weaknesses. Draken reassured him that he had no such thing. So, you're telling me that spot between a dragon's wings isn't also your weakness? Kim marched out of the dust intent on finishing this once and for all. His right eye was throbbing as the parasite slid down his face. But in that moment, things had just gotten serious. The loser aura that surrounded Draken vanished. And in this place was something truly formidable. Hearing about his weak spot had truly triggered him. At that moment, Draken was a truly menacing sight. Kim could feel the ground shaking, vibrating at his mere presence. 
Draken had finally shown his true colors. For Kim, nothing good could come from this, he wasn't even able to scratch this guy before he got serious. He was running out of time. If he was attacked in this state, things wouldn't end well. He needed to make his move now and put everything he had behind it. He blasted from his spot, sending himself airborne. The dragon not paying him any mind didn't bode well for his chances to defeat this monster. But as he landed, he noticed his first attack had sliced through the dragon sending blood gushing all over the cavern's floor. Kim stared towards its weak spot, wondering if it was a trap. He decided not to think about it too much and just give it all he had. As he leaped forward, he destroyed the cavern behind him as he shot towards the dragon's exposed back. But hold on. Something just isn't right. Let's rewind things for a second. No one had ever discovered that Draken had a weak spot. Merely knowing the enemy knew of it put him on edge. He was truly afraid this blue-eyed monster was going to destroy him. He had no idea why he took such a job from the Flood Dragon King. That old dragon was trying to get him killed. He had to be. None of the lies he told Draken was true at all. This labyrinth was supposed to be weak, ran by an incompetent nobody. Being a mercenary was all fine and everything, but he drew the line at death. He would do anything to avoid such a situation. Just because he was sturdy didn't mean he wasn't indestructible. Even though he was able to take all the blows from this human, they still hurt. If he made it out of this alive, who knows how long he would be mistaken for an azure drake. Draken knew it was time to part ways with both the flood dragons and this human monster. He decided to casually let this creature off the hook and immediately part ways. He had only taken his eyes off the creature for a second. But when he refocused, it was gone. In the very next moment, pain shot through his body as blood gushed from his wounds. As blood poured onto his hands, he began to panic. He was going to die. He was really going to die. The mantra I don't want to die ran through his head over and over. He sensed the beast shooting towards his back and he knew this would be the death of him. He dropped to the ground cowering in fear, begging for his life. Without thinking, everything flowed from his lips. He was only a mercenary. He never wanted to hurt anyone. The Flood Dragon King was truly the bad guy here. Draken begged the human to forgive him. Dominique was ecstatic. Her squad had just dealt with the Flood Dragon's army's first wave. With just a little help from their master. But before they could celebrate, they had to figure out what to do with this coward. Dragon materials were very rare, the Naga Labyrinth could make use of such items. But Kim didn't believe that to be a good idea. They could kill him easily. But processing him would be a problem. After all, his defense was through the roof. Draken shot up promising to be loyal to Kim forever. But who could ever trust a two-timing mercenary that didn't honor his contract? He promised to swear it on his ancestors. He put his hand over his heart and swore allegiance to the Naga King. And as the words left his lips, he glowed brightly before their eyes. Kim reached for his sword. He wouldn't take any more surprises from this low life. But Dominique stared on in pure shock. This was the first time she had ever seen the vow of a dragon. She explained to Kim that dragons were a very noble and egotistical species. They could place restrictions upon themselves that was essentially a handicap, enabling them to beat weaker species on their own terms, showing just how great dragons are in the process. If they break such a vow, they cease to exist, dying from excruciating pain. He doesn't even have wings, so I don't know how he was even able to make such a vow. But in the end, his word is his bond, so you can trust him. Kim had never ran across a species with such a big ego. To him there was nothing noble about it. He figured having something sturdy around would come in handy someday. With that, the Naga Labyrinth gained a new member. Albeit a not very useful member. Let's skip a few days into the future and see what's going on at the Naga Labyrinth. Kim was trying to get as much usefulness out of his new member as he could. He grilled him about his approaching enemy. Draken insisted that the Flood Dragon was more durable than even him. And to his knowledge, he had zero weak spots. The whole time they were talking, Kim was nonchalantly loading the rocket launcher. 
Draken made sure his new king knew that while he didn't show damage on the outside, he surely felt it on the inside. Kims responded that he would consider dodging an act of betrayal. The rocket launcher exploded on impact, knocking the dragon unconscious. He didn't feel he was being too mean to the dragon. After all, he truly needed to test the weapons out. Rikshasha had returned from her mission making it back just in time to catch the display. She had no love lost for the dumb dragon, and wasn't surprised at his capture. She had always suspected the Naga Labyrinth would be able to handle such a weakling, but she never thought the Naga King had it in him to torture the fellow. The two of them had worked for the Flood Dragon, but their responsibilities were opposite of each other, causing the two to never have much time to mingle. Not that Rikshasha cared to mingle with the biggest coward she'd ever known. She highly doubted he even remembered her name. Kim wasted no time asking for the details of her mission. He wanted to know which direction the flood dragons were going to be attacking. She explained she expected the war to start in approximately a month. The flood dragons were gathering their forces as they spoke. Rikshasha wasted no time laying out her devious trap. She insisted that a month wasn't enough time to truly prepare their forces. Kim agreed that there was no way he could catch up with the decades of work the flood dragons had under their belts. Rikshasha offered the desperate labyrinth a risky offer that could gain them the power they needed. If they succeeded in subjugating the blood leopards the Naga labyrinth could gain the down gems needed to push back the flood dragons. But she warned that no nearby dungeons were foolish enough to even approach the blood leopards territories. She cleverly advised him to spend his time collecting as many down gems as he could in the coming weeks. They would need to be as strong as they could be to defeat such a foe. They had to go into it with the mindset that if they couldn't defeat the Blood Leopard, then they were surely doomed. Dominique agreed that it was a very desperate and dangerous plan, but it was still their best chance. Kim had his work cut out for him. First, he strategically sent Rikshasha on a mission to map out the route to the Blood Leopard's territory. Rikshasha had no problem accomplishing that task, but only up to the entrance of that territory. She would not step a foot inside. She wasted no time getting to work, vanishing in plain sight. Now that she was gone, Kim too would head out on a mission, one that would involve him dipping into his savings. He left Dominique pondering exactly what he meant about savings, and poor Draken was left hanging. Hopefully this hazing won't go on for too long and he would truly become a member of their team. Let's travel to the Paiyudi Gate a few hours in the future. Kim found a decent spot to begin his mission. He started off by synchronizing the maps he had bought from the geyser's welcome stand. Would you like to synchronize the maps? Yes, synchronize them all. A portion of the maps of the labyrinths on the first, second, and third floor of geyser have been synchronized. The maps went up in a burst of red flames, and his personal maps swelled before his very eyes allowing him to see the path that led to his stash of down gems. His previous expedition had taken his group four days to reach the abandoned labyrinth on the third floor. But if Kim sprinted the whole way there, he would drastically cut down that time. And to maximize his efforts, he would collect every down gem his parasite spotted as he traveled at his top speed. A dungeon baby sprinting at full speed was definitely a sight to behold. He wasted no time enhancing his body and most definitely his leg strength. As he traveled hundreds of times faster than an adult human male, pop-ups invaded his senses as he collected every single down gem he came across. Kim marched back into the labyrinth with a bag on his back that was bursting at the seams. As he unzipped the bag, Dominique was puzzled by what could be inside. He immediately dumped the contents out over his altar causing a constant stream of plus ones and pop-ups to flood his awareness. As Dominique stood next to him with the goofiest look on her face, Kim decided to explain that all of this was thanks to the parasite. While it seemed like a lot, the total only came out to 435 credits. Such a low number of credits wouldn't win a war, but it would get them started. Spawning in a ton of low-level Naga soldiers was out of the question. In the face of a true enemy, they will be totally useless. First, he decided to take a chance. They were short on time, but he would upgrade the labyrinth to level 5. This process would take a full week to complete. 
he was down 100 credits, he would use the remainder to build out his army when he reached rank 5. But to be on the safe side, he decided to spun in a few rank 4 nagas. The first one to catch his eye was a naga gatekeeper. A mid-sized naga specializing in defense. The tough and patient naga gatekeeper will not let anyone pass without your permission. The gatekeeper's first tests would arrive very soon. Rikshasha had accomplished her task and was making her way back to the labyrinth. The Flood Dragon King had passed on taking the long way around, and instead had decided to go right through the Blood Leopard's territory. Or should I say, under the Blood Leopard's territory, he would be using Siege Beast to dig a tunnel that would bring him into striking distance of the Naga Labyrinth. Seeing as how the distance between the Naga Labyrinth and the Blood Leopard's territory took half a day to travel. The Flood Dragon King could arrive as early as a week. Such a time frame would leave Kim at the mercy of his enemies. Rikshasha knew the Naga Labyrinth was surely doomed. She was so busy with her thoughts that she hadn't realized that a formidable foe was blocking her path. Luckily, Kim was there to save her from serious harm. For the Naga Gatekeeper was a menacing sight indeed. The sight of him makes me want to see what other colossal beasts would join the Naga army in the future. Rikshasha handed over the map and Kim instantly added it to his collection. She had not calculated his ability to pull off such a feat in such a short amount of time. The number of soldiers he had now meant that he had a true chance of defeating the Blood Leopards. But Kim had no intention of taking these new soldiers with him, they were his gatekeepers. He pointed out his fighting force, explaining that his group of veterans would be more than enough to handle whatever awaited them in the Leopards' territory. This news upset Rikshasha for a second there she thought he had a chance. She tried to change Kim's mind, but he was dead set on taking the smaller force. After all, he would be fighting alongside them. She insisted if he didn't change his mind, he would regret his actions. And possibly even forfeit his life. As his face began to show his feelings towards her looking down on his soldiers, she decided to change the subject. She was the one being foolish to think that he ever had a true chance. Kim insisted that if she was able-bodied that she should be their guide. They were leaving for their crucial battle against the Blood Leopards immediately. Rikshasha knew that her map-making task was a waste of time. The Naga King's true goal was to keep her, the spy at bay. But such actions were useless in the face of what was headed their way. After what felt like a short trip, they arrived at the entrance of the Blood Leopard's territory. Rikshasha passed on the knowledge of what awaited them on the inside. First and foremost, everyone should remain as quiet as possible when inside the territory. The Blood Leopard's defense is not what it's known for. What truly made it dangerous was his stealth ability and ambush tactics. At times it will be truly invisible, our only chance is to plan the counterattack to its ambush. The whole Naga group was truly relaxed. But Rikshasha was a nervous wreck she explained that the leopards had been an apex predator in this area for decades. And she was not looking to die by their hands while doing mercenary work. While this group was super relaxed, she alone knew the dangers they faced. She had no idea why she agreed to be their guide. Every moment she stayed in this territory meant her chance of survival became smaller. She froze in mid-thought. Her senses detected a killing instinct. A very strong, controlled killing instinct that set all her senses off. It could only mean the blood leopards were very close, so close that she would swear they were right behind her. Rikshasha. If you look back, you forfeit your life. I've decided that now is the perfect time for an interrogation. She pleaded with her master that she didn't understand what was going on. But Kim explained that he knew she detested the way he ran his labyrinth. You believe my labyrinth to be soft. You feel that I'm too lenient on my workers and that they are all weaker for it. Believe none of them will last long in the true labyrinth. And to this I agree. I was born in Geyser so I'm well aware of how things work. And I have a very simple outlook on how things should work. I'll do everything in my power to make sure my allies have everything they need. But on the flip side of that coin, my enemies receive nothing but my blade. And currently I don't know if you are a friend or a foe. Rikshasha insisted that she was only a mercenary and nothing else. 
If that's the case, then why did you go out of your way to deceive us and sell every piece of information you obtained to our enemy? Kim decided to allow her to defend herself. She insisted that her once working for the Flood Dragons wasn't enough for him to force an interrogation on her. She knew she had been truly disrespectful to try to kill him on their first meeting. But since then she's been nothing but the model mercenary doing everything she was asked. If she was a spy... Why would she inform him that an army was marching upon his gates? After everything she'd done for him, this is how she gets treated. She never once lied to him. Kim didn't understand her objective, or what reason she had to be a two-timing mercenary. She insisted that he was out of line to accuse her with no evidence. Through this whole interrogation, Kim's parasite had exceeded farther than we've ever seen it. It had consumed half his body and was in the process of snaking across the ground. He asked her, has she ever heard of parasites? She had only ever heard of them in passing. Kim told her that he had one. And so did she. At that news, a parasite exploded from her hand and quickly did its best to expand across her entire body. She had no idea where it came from. Kim had planted a fragment of his parasite upon her person when they first met and it had truly taken a liking to her. It had obtained so much information while it was with her. It enjoyed the tour of the Flood Dragon's labyrinth above all else. Rikshasha was totally freaked out as it wiggled and squirmed all over her body. She couldn't understand why she was still alive. If he possessed such knowledge, why was he giving her another chance? Kim's answer was really simple. He enjoyed her presence. If she hadn't spent her whole time looking down on him, Maybe she would have saw this coming. She decided to be forthcoming with the reasoning behind why she did what she did. She had nothing against either the Flood Dragons or the Naga Labyrinth. They both were just means to get the revenge that she seeked. Her true target was none other than the Spirit King. Her instincts told her that she was going to die, so she turned around. Kim stabbed his blade towards her head. He promised her she would die if she looked back and he always kept his promises. Rikshasha was knocked to the ground, in shock that she was still alive. But her attention turned fully to Kim holding back the blood leopard. She was so engrossed in her interrogation that she failed to notice its presence. The blood leopard forced through Kim's block. As he slashed back and forth, it leaped into the air, retreating from his sight, disappearing into his surroundings right before his very eyes. Not only was this deception top tier, it had the speed to match. But none of that phased Kim. As the parasite allowed him to see its every move, the leopard was in shock as his enemy flew towards his current location. Rikshasha was fully captivated by the battle, realizing her judgment of the Naga king had been wrong all along. As he flew towards her location, she sat there, frozen in place unaware that the blood leopard had camouflaged himself right next to her. Kim crashed into the Blood Leopard's location, forcing it to flee as his impact caused an upheaval of the entire area. Her opinion of humans hadn't changed. No matter how strong a human is, in the end it was still just a human. The Naga King was simply not a human in her eyes any longer. He turned to her and asked her if she had any plans of moving to safety. They could finish their interrogation after the battle and if she wished, she could run away. But if their paths ever crossed in the future, her chance to defend herself would be gone forever. He would kill her on sight. The Naga King was a monster born from the labyrinth. She knew he could see the blood leopard and wanted to know exactly what it was doing. He looked in its direction and explained that it was just sitting there. Possibly recovering? Kim had a problem. He had never used so much of the parasite before, and it was seriously draining his stamina. If he didn't finish this soon, he would be forced to continue without it. Rikshasha alerted him to the possibility of a second blood leopard. As soon as she told him, the monster chomped down on the mage's shoulder. Kim shot in, but the first leopard attacked ensuring he couldn't interfere. He had no idea why situations like this kept happening to him, but he was getting tired of it. First the hell spiders, and now it was happening here. The situation had changed. He was forced to conserve the energy of his parasite. If he was going to beat both leopards, there was no way he could lose access to it. 
Rikshasha decided it was time for her to join the battle. But the Naga king forced her to stand down. He had no problem with her assessing the situation. But he didn't need her help, and he definitely didn't need her looking down upon his soldiers. The Naga soldiers guarded the mage from all sides as the healer desperately kept it alive. The mage wasn't doing well. The only thing keeping it alive was the constant healing of the Naga priest. They all knew the mage was special to the king. They had to do everything in their power to save his life. The Naga warrior would have to step up and ensure all their safety until their king arrived. The Naga warrior swiped the leopard across the face. But he was rewarded with a counter that rocked him to the core. But such an attack only fueled him to continue. That was, until the leopard chomped down on his weapon, shattering it to pieces. It followed that up with a full body swipe, sending the soldier flying across the cavern. The warrior laid on the ground. As the leopard had one of his comrades trapped in its jaws, he stared on helplessly, watching the soldier slowly slip away from him. Unable to help, he could do nothing but watch on as the leopard meticulously ripped his comrade in half. Then Naga Labyrinth had fallen, as he stared on unable to muster the courage to attack. After decades of ruin, they were finally able to establish themselves in the geyser once more and he the honorable first soldier of the Naga Labyrinth was destined to lead that resurgence. He vowed that he would survive until he witnessed the change in their labyrinth the king had promised. A promise that would ensure that they rose to their rightful place in the geyser. The warrior pulled himself off the ground. He traveled towards his enemy as blood leaked from his body. He had to assist the other fighters. He couldn't let them be destroyed. He had come to the realization that his vow to fight alongside his king was wrong from the very start. The blood leopard tossed his comrade away as he neared, weapon in hand. He didn't care what his chances of survival was. He would fight until he breathed his last breath. The leopard didn't tolerate the blows he received, sending his weapon flying across the room. But he would continue to fight even if he had to do it with his bloody bare hands. As he stared down the maw of the beast, he refused to allow this to be his end. The requirements have been satisfied. With everything he had, he forced himself backwards, dodging an attack that would have ended his life. The Hall of Heroes is responding to the desire of the Naga soldier. A blue flame licked across his body. How did he dare call himself a soldier of the Naga army? The blood leopard shied away as he advanced in its direction. As the one who should have been the protector of his king, he found himself waiting for the king's protection instead. He had no idea how things had gotten to this point. But it would end today. Today, his enemy would die by his hands, even if he had to die right along with it. The Naga soldier's heroization has begun. The Naga warrior wasted no time making his promise a reality. He grabbed the blood leopard by the tail and slammed him against the ground. He wasted no time following up the attack by declawing the beast. He had no mercy for such a creature. Now that he had procured a weapon, he took his leopard claw club and smashed the leopard upside the head, sending one of the leopard's tooths tumbling across the floor, straight to the feet of the naga. It turns out the blood leopard wasn't such an apex predator after all. The naga warrior, now a hero, was truly disappointed. Rikshasha didn't believe what she saw with her own eyes. There was no way the Naga king had planned this outcome. To achieve heroization, certain prerequisites must be met, foremost among them being a requisite level of experience. This transformative phenomenon manifests itself either through the attainment of enlightenment or by experiencing a profound event that acts as a catalyst for the process. However, even the individual undergoing heroization remains unaware of when or how it will occur, making it an unpredictable occurrence that defies intentional triggering by any external force. But Rikshasha couldn't mistake the words the Naga king had used. This truly was his intention. She wondered what other surprises he had in store for her. She was starting to believe he deserved the title, King of the Naga. The heroization of the Naga soldier has been completed. Kim had no idea what was going on. He had never heard the term heroization. But he would take it. Such a change in the battlefield meant only one thing. He could let loose and destroy this beast. 
the blood leopard camouflaged himself before the hero's very eyes. He searched around, ready for the monster to attack at any moment. He wasn't surprised when the monster decided to attack the other Nagas. For sneaky cowards would only show their true faces in time. His new speed allowed him to make it there in time to ward off the blood leopard. At the mere sight of him, the leopard slid back into his camouflaged state. All its fighting spirit had evaporated at the sight of a true enemy. But the tactics the blood leopard was using were nothing more than his normal fighting style. Hit and runs were the way it operated to make up for its weaknesses. The heroization wasn't enough to put the hero on par with his master. He couldn't see the blood leopard's every movement, or even track its top speed with his eyes. Worse than that, he had a handicap. He had to protect his comrades at all costs. The situation wasn't in his favor. As he stood there, pondering how he was going to make it through this, the mage knew it had to help at any cost. The mage struggled to his feet, upsetting all his comrades. As the hero insisted the mage should rest, the blood leopard attacked. As he turned around to defend against the blow an ice prism sprung up protecting them all from the leopard. But such an attack was at the detriment of the mage's health. As the mage reshaped the ice prisms to protect the weaker Naga soldiers, he informed the hero that he didn't have to worry about them anymore. No matter how hard anyone tried, no one could penetrate the ice walls. So, hero, don't hold back. Go and do what you have to. Let loose and destroy that trash. The hero didn't agree with the mage's actions, but he thanked him all the same. As his attention turned back to the battle, he recommended that the mage would be wise to cover the floor as well. Because he was going to blow this place apart. Smashing the ground turned out to be an effective way to reveal his enemy. Before the blood leopard had the opportunity to disappear, he politely returned the leopard's claw to its person. And he followed it up with a giant boulder to its head. After the two attacks, the leopard was in a terrible state. The hero rushed in with the intention of replacing what he had lost. As the leopard blocked his attack, he wasted no time retrieving a new weapon. He reversed its angle, prepared to finish the leopard off for good, but it bounced away. The hero was determined not to let it get away this time. As he tracked his target, its final destination only made him drop his weapon and shake his head at the shamelessness of it. The half-dead leopard was using the ice prism as his cover, which turned out to be an unwise decision. For the mage cast a spell that secured the blood leopard in place. It appears that you hold a somewhat condescending attitude towards us, which could benefit from some improvement. The Naga hero wrapped his lower body around the leopard's head prepared to finish it off for good. But the blood leopard was determined not to go easily, whipping its tail in the direction of the hero. The hero stirred on at the stupid decision as he went full savage on the leopard's tail. He ripped the tail free and stared the leopard dead in the eye. He explained that it shouldn't overreact just yet, and that this was only the beginning. The leopard howled from the blow to his head, barely any teeth left in his mouth. It fell to the ground unconscious as dust rose up around it. The hero couldn't stand the persistent beast. He looked up to the applause of his king who was resting on his dead blood leopard. As the hero dropped to his knee, Kim hopped down and explained he was just taking a little rest before he jumped into battle with the second leopard. But he never would have thought that his new hero could finish such a monster on his own. The hero wasn't pleased with his performance in the least. He took full responsibility for the loss of their comrade. Kim asked if he was going to dishonor the soldier's death by taking away its glorious sacrifice. It doesn't matter whether you are a soldier or a hero. You're all Naga. And the workers are no different in this distinction. You're no better than any Naga who fearlessly puts their life on the line for the good of the Naga labyrinth. If you think you're better than any of them because you're stronger, you're wrong. And I recommend you never look down on your enemy just because you think they're worthless. The Naga hero would engrave such a lesson into his heart. Rikshasha was surprised that the Naga king understood that criticism would be more beneficial to the righteous Naga soldier. The Naga king was proving her wrong over and over. Each of his actions was shining a light on his qualifications to be a king. Kim remembered he never rewarded the Naga for their efforts during the spider incident. 
he would have to correct that error. But right now, he would reward the accomplishments of his new hero. He thought for a minute and decided that the hero would henceforth be known as Quintus. A hero needs a name befitting his station. Quintus is the name of a great military general from history. Kim appointed the hero as the general of the Naga army. The hero Quintus dropped to his knee pledging his allegiance to his liege for all of eternity. With that, the Naga war party readied themselves for their trip home at the command of their liege. Kim insisted if they needed help they should let him know. They reassured him that they would be careful with the half-dead leopard. He didn't care for wasting such a beast, but there was nothing he could do. Their skin would be useless for making armor. So the only thing he would be taking from the dead one was a unique down gem. Heart of the Blood Leopard. Highest grade down gem. The power of the blood leopard lies within. You are able to bring out its power with a special refining method. In order to view the effects of the blood leopard's heart, you require a smithy and a laboratory. He came all this way for down gems to use in his war. And he was leaving with something that would only benefit him in the future. Rikshasha stood back, knowing that the decision to come here was all hers. He turned his attention to her, inquiring whether he had passed her test. As she graveled on the ground, he reminded her that she never needed to suck up to him. With a menacing voice, he reminded her that they had a conversation to finish. They stood there for quite some time as she explained away her life story. In short, all her planning led to the eventual demise of the spirit king, who had destroyed her family, the mercenary corps. Her plan was to drive a wedge between the two kings. But in the process, she had ran across the Naga labyrinth, changing her plans. Her plans now involved using the flood dragons to devour the Naga labyrinth, hopefully sparking a war between the flood dragons and the spirit king. Kim assumed that he had the gist of her plans. It might not be spot on, but it would do. At the moment, there wasn't much he could do about what was set into motion, other than focus on the war party headed his way. So he needs to know exactly when she suspected them to arrive. Five days. Rikshasha believed that if they left when they said they would, they would reach the gates of the Naga Labyrinth in five days. His gamble to upgrade his labyrinth wouldn't pay off in time. Five days wouldn't cut it. Rikshasha didn't understand why he was acting surprised. If he placed a parasite on her, he should have been aware of the approximate time of the flood dragon's arrival. Kim admitted to embellishing a little bit. Well, truthfully, just straight up lying. She stared on in disbelief as he informed her that the parasite wasn't capable of living without the host. So as soon as it detaches from his body it dies. The one that crawled all over her body had just been put there moments before, he informed her. But his act yielded their intended results, so all was well. Rikshasha how dare you make that face when you've been lying to the kings of two labyrinths. The art of deception is a skill, and you just got outplayed. Move on. She reluctantly admitted that he was right. Kim was short on time, so this would be her final opportunity. He promised to refrain from killing her at this moment, regardless of her choice. He needed her decision to be an honest one. He wasn't interested in playing her games any longer. It's your choice, but I need you to choose either the flood dragons who've been around for decades, or the Naga Labyrinth who is an unproven new entity. I won't force your decision. All I can do is promise you that if you side with me, I may be able to help you with your spirit king problem. Rikshasha asked for more time to make her decision. She could give him her answer after the war had concluded. Kim had had enough. She was essentially telling him that she would choose the side that won. But that's not how things were going to work. His parasite came out as he wrapped his hand around her throat and lifted her from the ground. Maybe he had not made things clear but he was done playing games. If there was a chance she didn't understand her position, he would spell it out for her. She was the first person to ever live after betraying him, and there was only so far she could push that. He needed her answer, and he wanted it now. She could choose the king she easily manipulated, or she could choose him. All the Nagas had made it home safely. They stood around discussing the intricate details of what had happened. Kim joined them, thankful they had made it safely. 
Dominique hoped he had taken care of that damned elf. But to her displeasure, Rikshasha stepped into the room, challenging her authority. Kim inquired on whether she had met Quintus, the new general of the Naga army. Dominique hurriedly explained that while he may look different, he was still the same Naga warrior he was before. Quintus refuted this, and Kim decided he must have been mistaken. Dominique had upset Quintus. If their liege wanted them to introduce themselves, they would introduce themselves. He immediately offered his hand in greeting, as if it was the first time he had ever met her. Kim figured he had gained another weird one. Fate just won't allow him to have a group of regular soldiers. Quintus was serious about completing his duties to their fullest, so immediately upon returning to the labyrinth, he informed Dominique of his master's wishes. She agreed that his experiment had the opportunity of succeeding. The only problem was the mage wouldn't be up to completing the project any time soon. Seeing as how he was always planning on summoning more mages, now seemed like as good a time as any. He needed her to immediately put the new mages to work as they were short on time. Dominique was in pure shock when she found out they only had five days to prepare for war. She growled in her enemy's direction, but was immediately called off. Although he couldn't be 100% sure, the elf was on their side now. Rikshasha divulged her full knowledge of the war to all of them. He ordered Dominique to put her personal feelings aside and to use the knowledge wisely. Next, Quintus will be in charge of instructing the workers to build the watchtower and traps. He was given three days to train all their troops. And Kim didn't want to hear any nonsense about how he could complete the task in three hours. And as they worked, he would spend his time procuring weapons and down gem from the first three floors. When he returned, they would work together on a strategic plan to defeat their enemies. After all, from what he had learned, these flood dragons weren't much better than horned rats. Underground, the flood dragons slowly marched towards their eventual date with destiny. The flood dragon king called his heroes Azag and Urzhag to his side. The two would move forward, leading his army to war. Flood dragon hero Azag, flood dragon champion Urzhag, were the elite soldiers of the flood dragon labyrinth. The two bared the hopes of their king on their shoulders. Finish them before I arrive. Five days later, in front of the Naga labyrinth, the invasion was in progress. The Naga king's throne had been moved to give him an unobstructed view of the battlefield. Dominique debriefed her king on the final preparations before the war. The Naga army is made up of ninety soldiers, ten warriors including Quintus. Six archers and four healers, five mages and two gatekeepers. Their enemy had one hundred and twenty-one total soldiers. There were one hundred normal soldiers and eighteen warriors. They possessed two mid-sized flood dragons who were about the same size as the gatekeepers. And there was also a commander of their army who appeared to be a hero. The flood dragons completely lacked ranged troops. Rikshasha believed the flood dragon's strengths were their overwhelming defensive power and size. The only weakness that she could perceive was the fact that all of them were super slow and their severe lack of ranged units. Kim understood why an army full of tanks had no use for archers. But she believed they had developed a tactic that made up for both of those disadvantages. The time for battle was drawing near as the enemies approached the front lines. The dragon army built of only tanks was an imposing sight. It really sucked that upgrading the labyrinth had come down to a few hours worth of time. Having a level 5 labyrinth could have been a boon for the Naga labyrinth heading into battle. Rikshasha's predictions that the flood dragons would attack them straight on regardless of the situation seemed to be right on the money. So, the first conditions of their planning had fell into place. Dominique ordered that everybody move to their positions and erect the first defenses. Kim decided Draken would be given the chance to prove himself. He was given the responsibility of taking out the hero commander of the Flood Dragon's army. Everyone will finally get to see what the descendants of dragons were capable of. Draken stood on the front line of the Naga army, apprehension etched across his face. Nothing surprised Azag, not even the coward turning tail and running to the enemy's labyrinth. A fake descendant of dragons would submit before anything, including Nagas. Draken was surprised that his old comrade would say such words to his face. Azag never felt that Draken was his comrade, 
having the overly talkative mercenary around only contributed to his aging. Being rid of his presence was a blessing to everyone in the Flood Dragon's labyrinth. I've always known that your excessive attempt to make everyone believe you were a dragon could only mean one thing. All the stories about Drakens were fake. They were only tales that were made up to cover up how weak your kind are. Dragon my ass, more like an unsufferable lizard, an outdated endangered species. The Flood Dragon hero had crossed the line. No one disrespected Draken's lineage. The Flood Dragons are more dragon than you have ever been or ever will be. Without realizing it, the Yellow Lizard was halfway across the divide in the battlefield. What exactly do you expect to accomplish alone, you coward? Whatever. It's going to be your funeral, not mine. The Flood Dragons weren't impressed with the pathetic Naga army. They surpassed the pathetic showing in both quality and quantity. Once they dealt with those mages, this battle would be over. Seeing how there was no point in holding back, the Flood Dragons charged. Everyone attack. Wipe the Naga from the face of Geyser. The commander passed responsibility of the mages to the giant Manganel Dragons and head off to handle the yellow lizard. He would show the wannabe dragon mercy and end him quickly. Draken received a full-on blow to the head. Without showing any sign of emotion, he stood steadfast. The enemy's hero began to lay his attacks on hard and fast. After the first blow to Draken's head, a barrage of blows followed all over his body. The dark crystal flood dragon landed countless attacks, but saw no progress. The Naga king gave his newest servant props for going so far as to show his back to his enemy. As worry spread across Dominique's face, Kim ordered her to leave him be. Draken was capable of taking care of himself. Draken is a coward that fears death above all else. Because of this, he's grown the skill to gauge his enemy's strengths. By now, he knows that Hero can't scratch him. Nothing else explains why he gave his enemy access to his weak spot and since his enemy gave his weakness no interest, he knows he's safe to proceed. He's the kind of person who only uses as much strength as he needs. He's weak to the weak and stronger to the strong. Everyone probably thought he was weak because I've been hazing him. But from the moment he offered himself to me, his true talents became visible to my eyes. The flood dragon was impressed, for the lizard before him may have dragon blood after all but he doubted a little dragon blood would protect Draken from his full powers. He rushed forward, intent on killing Draken, once and for all. The king of the Naga was sure of one thing. Other than him, no one in the labyrinth was on Draken's level. Draken. Draconius Ortiga. Hero Plus Plus. The flood dragon hero's weapon shattered to pieces without leaving a dent on Draken. To think you believe you have more dragon blood than me. There's a simple test that will prove if you even possess the basic qualities of a dragon. Draken's next attack is famous for separating the chaff from the wheat. As the flood dragon begged him to stop it, Draken released his dragon's breath, engulfing the hero and causing his body to melt under the weight of the assault. Draken picked up his enemy by the throat. It turns out you failed the test. You're not a descendant of dragons after all. If you were truly a dragon, you would be immune to fire. He released his breath, allowing his enemy's ashes to float away on the wind. Draken celebrated, he had led the charge of the Naga army and proven himself in front of all of his new comrades. As the Flood Dragon soldiers attempted to flee at the defeat of their commander at the hands of a true dragon, they were snatched up by the Manganel dragons. Commander. Formation. Mage. Infiltration. The flood dragons flew in ready to ensure their victory by handling the mages of the Naga Labyrinth. Kim decided not to shoot down the soldiers, wasting his arrows in the process. Two mages should be enough to handle the defense of the other three. Dominic passed the orders on and two mages stepped forward, removing their staves from their backs. Taking care of the flood dragons was a simple task of casting ice spike. As the soldiers fell, they impaled themselves upon the spikes. Of the five throne, only one made it into fighting distance. He turned around, thankful to be alive, and immediately charged into battle. The Manganel dragon wasted no time replacing the impaled soldiers. The two relentlessly launched unwilling soldiers into battle. 
Kim could sense the gatekeepers itching to get into the thick of it. So, he ordered Dominique to have them return the soldiers back to their side. He hoped this action would progress the battle into its next stage. The battle was progressing according to plan. Draken was the true, all-star member. He was bottlenecking the enemy soldiers, forcing them off the easy path. None of them was interested in death by the descendant of dragons. But it was only a matter of time before the Naga army would be overrun by the forces aligned against them. Before they can activate their traps, they needed to lure out the big ones. It was time for Quintus, the commander of the Naga army, to join the battle. He was ordered to relay the message that Draken was to cover the left, and he was to cover the right, and neither of them were to submit to the enemy. Rikshasha came forward to inform them that the tides of the battle were about to change. The main force of the enemy's army, the Dragon King, was on the way. The flood dragons sounded their horns, heralding the rival of their king. As the dust settled, the main army of the flood dragons was revealed. Along with the awe-inspiring sight of the flood dragon king, the master of the flood dragon labyrinth, the unwavering king Anaxtus. There were approximately 300 individuals in their main force. They had over 150 soldiers and the rest were high-ranked flood dragons, and 30 more of the large mangonel dragons. Without accounting for the soldiers, the high-ranked flood dragons alone outnumbered the Naga army. The flood dragon king simply pointed forward, and his attendant blew his horn, announcing the start of the true battle. As the Naga army was already swamped by the vanguard, such an action would surely overwhelm them. The elite soldiers were so much more organized than the previous bunch. Instead of having to be snatched up, they prepared themselves accordingly for their flight through their air, making it easy for the storm of soldiers to rain down on the Naga army. Kim ordered everyone to hold on. The time to strike had not arrived. Everyone had to hold the line till the situation was perfect. They would only get one shot at this. But regardless of what Kim wanted, the reality was the mages were reaching their limit. The Naga king was disappointed. This would only make everything tougher going forward. He gave them the go-ahead to send the creatures to the abyss. Dominique passed the order forward. The mages were to conserve their energy and join the battle. As the flood dragon forces charged into battle, the lead dragon stopped, upsetting the others. If he didn't move, he was going to get trampled. He tried to warm his comrades, but it was too late. They had all fallen into a trap. What they believed to be the ground was actually a giant cliff. The Naga soldiers wasted no time pushing the rest in. Rikshasha had no idea such a plan was in place. Kim had recruited the only soldiers who could have warned the Flood Dragon army of this trap. The Flood Dragon King should have been more cautious after losing both his mercenary scouts. The Naga Labyrinth had put on a great show, but the battle was far from over. So far, they had lost twenty of their soldiers and one warrior. The trap had taken out around twenty percent of the enemy's main forces, and the entire vanguard. They still had to contend with over two hundred and fifty flood dragons. Going forward, the only access the flood dragons had to their domain was a narrow bridge. Such a situation was perfect for the phalanx formation. It was time for Quintus and Draken to truly put some work in. The plan was simple. The main body of the Naga army would spread out to make easy work of the catapulting enemies. They would deal with them quickly keeping them from building any momentum. Kim ordered Dominique to repeat that order to make sure it stuck. Rikshasha had never seen such military tactics in her whole life. But it was amazing the things you could learn by playing human video games. Her face blanched at the knowledge that humans treated war as games, even though the battle was going well. And the next phase would take place when the Flood Dragon King joined the battle himself. Rikshasha was worried something just didn't feel right. So far, there was two prominent soldiers missing from their battle. She hadn't laid eyes on the siege type or the champion. And as if it was planned, Dominique alerted her master that a new entrance to the battlefield had been created. The siege class flood dragon was a giant that dwarfed the battlefield. Kim was shocked that the flood dragons had such a monstrosity. It was as big as the adult hell spider. If such a creature was to be let loose on the battlefield, it would destroy his forces. 
But he wasn't focusing on the true danger. An elite squad of soldiers, led by the champion hero, rushed into battle from the newly created entrance. As the elite soldiers headed straight to the spot that would disrupt his army the most, the siege beast bared down on Kim himself. He wasted no time ordering his force to fall back to the second defensive line. The archers were to provide cover fire, while Quintus and the gatekeepers were to hold the champions at bay. Dominique disagreed with the orders. Quintus was too inexperienced to go up against the Flood Dragon's hero champion. She believed Draken would be the better choice. But at the moment Draken had his hands full laying down suppressive fire. If he was to cease, their retreating soldiers would be doomed. The mercenary Rikshasha insisted that her liege allow her to participate in the battle. She could not just sit on the sidelines when she had the ability to assist Quintus. Under Elf Scout. Rikshasha. Rare Plus. Rikshasha was too precious to lose on the battlefield. But she didn't back down. She was confident in her ability to survive. If somebody demanded that they be allowed to prove themselves, who was he to stop them? So, he allowed her to go forth and reinforce Quintus against the hero-level champion. That only left one last problem. He ordered the mages to let the blood leopard loose on the main forces crossing the middle bridge. The mages released their secret weapon from its ice prison. The blood leopard burst free causing the flood dragons to flee at its presence. They stared on, terrified of the apex predator that lay before them. Kim wasted no time fully transforming, so the blood leopard knew exactly where he should focus his attention. As the two stared each other down, the blood leopard made a quick decision on which side he would fall on. It turned towards the flood dragons and began its rampage. The poor blood leopard had been tempered for battle. Once he was in good health, he had been denied a meal for over five days. Even if the Nagas were a tastier treat, the flood dragons would do in a pinch. Kim was really relieved that the siege beast was targeting him instead of his troops. He forced his hand through his throne and retrieved a weapon that would work amazingly on the task he had ahead. As he ready for battle with his mace in hand, he was reminded that he was eventually going to have to fight the Flood Dragon King. She needed him to promise not to overdo it, otherwise the Naga Labyrinth would fall. He wasted no time rushing his giant foe face on. His first blow cracked and thundered across the battlefield, and the siege beast had a taste of what he was in for but it turns out the beast wasn't after him. Its target was none other than Dominique. It crashed into his dais causing Kim to lose sight of Dominique. But before the dust cleared, Dominique telepathically informed him that she was fine. The siege beast had lodged itself firmly in the entrance to their labyrinth. They had been wrong twice now, the beast's primary target was actually the labyrinth core. Kim ordered Draken to retreat and return immediately but he didn't have time for the dragon to move his slow ass. So, he offered Draken speedy transportation towards his destination, ordering him to handle the problem as he flew. As Draken barreled towards his target, he had no idea how to handle a siege beast. But his king calling him a dragon was all it took for him to man up and face his problems head on. Kim hoped Draken had what it took to hold the beast back while he defeated the king. First, he shouted for an updated status on the battle. And Dominique didn't disappoint. Thanks to the Blood Leopard, the two groups have safely fallen back to the second defense line. And our main forces are currently fending off the Flying Flood Dragons. But more than 20% of our troops fighting against the champions have died. Kim adjusted the battle by ordering the archers to prioritize the champions first. He needed an update on Quintus and Rikshasha. The two were still alive, but they were being pushed back even though they were taken on the champion two-on-one. But she had good news also. The Blood Leopard was doing surprisingly well. It had reversed the flow of battle in its area, and was even causing the Flood Dragons to retreat. Dominique had fully expected the Leopard to eat a few meals and immediately retreat from battle. It was beneficial to the Naga Labyrinth that the Flood Dragons had fear of the mighty Apex Predator. Their fear paralyzed them, allowing the leopard to have its way. He easily destroyed dragon after dragon. That was, until the flood dragon king made his presence known. He easily wrapped his full hand around the leopard's mouth. 
and before he destroyed it, the two had a little conversation. To think your claws would reach all the way to me. How disgusting. And the flood dragon king destroyed his enemy with a fire blast that was surely overkill. But in the process, half of the Naga's left flank was annihilated. The king of the flood dragons had finally decided to join the battle. Rikshasha and Quintus had been fighting nonstop with the champion. But the two weren't making any progress. Rikshasha misjudged her entry and took a blow to her side. Luckily she didn't lose the arm, but it was useless to her now. Their enemy was currently faster and stronger than both of them. If it wasn't for the fact that the dragon king had been neglecting his duties towards his servants, they would be in real trouble. The champion had a lot of experience, but it was obvious he had never been given the opportunity to truly grow. Flood Dragon Champion Urzhag Hero Draken was doing everything he could to hold back the giant beast, buying his master as much time as he needed. He would do his part to allow his master to conserve his energy. All was going well until the battle shifted. The Blood Leopard was destroyed along with a portion of the army. The moment the Flood Dragon King joined the battle was no secret to anyone. Rikshasha insisted Quintus change his approach to this battle. The two of them stood no chance against their enemy. Moving forward, they needed to focus on surviving as long as possible until reinforcements were available. If they persisted long enough, their master would defeat the Flood Dragon King. Time remaining until the Labyrinth's fifth rank upgrade. 24 minutes and 32 seconds. 25 minutes. If Kim could hold out 25 minutes, he could force a shift in the battle. The Flood Dragon King would have never expected a human on this battlefield. He had never heard of a human mercenary in all of his existence. And here one was, employed by the Nagas. Human, where is your employer, the king of the Naga? Depending on your answer, you might live to see another day. No, I'll do one better. I might even let you join my labyrinth. Kim wasted no time informing the Blood Dragon King that he was misunderstanding the situation. He was the king of the Nagas. So, he could take his offer and shove it. Kim put his full speed on display, appearing next to the Flood Dragon King kicking him in the head with everything he had. But the Dragon King didn't even flinch at the attack. Draken had been right. The Flood Dragon King definitely put him to shame when it came to defense. And even worse was the fact that he couldn't locate any weak points. And he went through the full list. His joints, the gaps between his scales and even his pupils were all stronger than Draken's. I was going to let you live because I've never seen such a rare creature but I never considered it a possibility that a human could become the reigning king of a labyrinth. This douchebag's voice was getting on Kim's nerves. The arrogant noises that came out of the king's mouth just didn't sit right with him. The rumors of the flood dragon king being afraid of human weapons were starting to sound legit. Otherwise, there was no other reasons for the king to put on such an air for his enemy. Kim had hit the nail on the head, infuriating the king as he threw a punch in his direction. He was only barely able to dodge. How could something that big be so fast? Before he could even settle into his new location, the king was there. Trying to scoop him up. Kim was forced to let the parasite loose. As the king's attack would have sent him flying to his demise. He had wanted to avoid using the parasite as much as possible. But he wasn't able to even track the king's speed, let alone keep up with it in his normal form. As he recovered on the ground, the king let loose with a dragon blast directly to his location. Dominique was worried for her master, and she took her frustrations out on Draken. She insisted he had never told them that the flood dragon king was capable of using thermic rays. As he struggled to hold the siege beast back, he laid out what he knew about the flood dragon. He knew that the flood dragons were distant relatives of dragons also and the Flood Dragon King in particular have enough dragon blood running through his veins to allow him to use breath attacks. Dominique berated him for just now revealing this information. He insisted she could attack him later, but right now he needed to focus on keeping this siege beast from destroying the Naga Labyrinth. She wondered what this human weapon that could kill a Flood Dragon was. If it wasn't a firearm, what could it be? 
She wondered how something so small could take out the behemoth that the flood dragon king was. As he watched on, her master had cloned himself using his parasite. The flood dragon king wasn't phased at all by there being two of him now. Such a change hardly mattered. But as he grabbed both creatures with his hands, they flowed through his fingertips like water. Kim reformed behind the flood dragon king poised to do damage. He laid his mace into the weak spot of dragons and got the exact response he was hoping for. The flood dragon king roared from the impact. Such useless tricks wouldn't work on him. But Kim thought differently. As the flood dragon king knocked his mace from his hand, he used a parasite to retrieve it. And just for good measures, he wrapped himself around the king's arm, giving him the momentum to come in with a truly devastating strike to its back once again. The flood dragon king howled with fury. Kim was on the right track. He knew he could do this. With the aid of the parasite, he was starting to be able to track its movements. Even if the king had no weak spots, he would just be forced to beat him with his mace until one appeared. Such a large body couldn't have an unlimited amount of stamina. If he remained patient, the tide of battle would turn in his favor. For the time being, he would stay close to the king which would render his breath attack useless. Just as he thought things were going in his favor. The king surprised him. He radiated an immense aura that left Kim stunned. The king was done playing around. He had decided to get serious. The little human had no idea what he was up against. Did he really think he was facing the true might of the Flood Dragon King? All the Flood Dragon soldiers panicked. Danger was headed their way. They had to retreat. None of them wanted to be swept away by what was coming. Rikshasha watched on in surprise of the Flood Dragon Army's behavior. The Flood Dragon's champion hero was thankful for the Naga King's actions. He never thought the day would come when he would be able to witness again his king's true power. Quintus asked him why he wasn't cowering in fear like the rest of his army. He explained that he would be all right. He was capable of enduring the king's attack at least once. He realized he had worded that wrong. What he meant was he would endure the king's attack for witnessing it with his own eyes was a true honor. And after all, you and your Naga king will be wiped away in the face of a single strike. The flood dragon king had slimmed up his body, becoming elongated in the process. This was the exact chance Kim needed. For in this form, the king seemed to forego defense for offense, allowing multiple weak points to appear across his body. When the perfect opportunity presented itself, Kim would strike. The parasite senses a deadly threat. The flood dragon king was behind him. Kim got his hands up in time to block the blow. But he was sent flying away, as if he was nothing more than an insect being thumped by a giant finger. Before he could even catch his breath, the king was there, reaching for him. Kim faked a dash to get into position to give the flood dragon king a taste of his own medicine. But the attack only put him in position to allow the king to ready a fire blast to roast him alive. He instantly realized his mistake and his parasite yanked him away from death. Kim bounced off the ground and up to his feet. The king's offensive form was magnificent. He was so fast Kim barely had time to react, let alone counter. He couldn't miss the opportunity presented with this form. He had to find a way to act. You look like a little bug squirming around hoping I don't squish you. Kim had to avoid the thermic ray at all costs. His secret weapon would be destroyed if it came in contact with such a devastating fire. But as he stared on at the king's follow-up attack, he knew there was no chance he could escape what was coming his way. Parasite's ability. Cognitive haste. Has been automatically activated. The risk of instant death has triggered its activation. This ability will consume a drastic amount of the parasite's health. Kim gained a third eye as he felt like time had stopped all around him. But he realized it was only flowing very slowly. As he moved, he felt as if gravity had increased. Which meant only his cognitive functions had improved. Such an ability was a game changer, but it had its drawbacks. Every second he stayed in this form, the parasite slipped away from him. If he overused his ability, the parasite would die, and he would soon follow. This would give him the opportunity he needed, but first he had to dodge the incoming attacks. 
In this form, the Flood Dragon King did not discriminate. He would roast his own man if they got in the way. The attack was like a wave of destruction. It roasted everything in its path. The king stared on as smoke rolled away in the aftermath of his attack. He watched and waited to find out if his enemy had been eliminated. But his answer came in the form of spears bursting from the smoke. As he blocked the attacks, Kim came into view, his parasite holding countless spears all around him, as he launched them one after the other. He released them all to buy him the space he needed to get into position. His time was running short. His parasite would die if he continued for much longer. The attacks he launched didn't face the flood dragon at all. What a foolish human. As the king reached in to snatch him up, he reactivated cognitive haste, pulling his mace towards him as he leaped into the fray of things, but as he narrowed in on his target's weak spot, a tail whipped in his direction, causing him to momentarily retreat. The flood dragon was tiring of such games. Everyone on the battlefield could feel it as he kneeled to the ground. Kim smiled as the position suited the king quite well being that he was nothing more than an overgrown lizard. The dragon took offense to the insult. Reacting exactly as planned, the egos on these dragons were just too big for them not to be offended. As the flood dragon king loaded up an attack that would scorch the earth, Kim tossed three packages towards his mouth. Checkmate. The flood dragon king stirred on, only able to take whatever came his way. An immense explosion went off that rock the cavern. Kim knew it wasn't a fatal blow as he could still sense weak spots emitting from the flood dragon. The giant head of the king burst forward as he shook off the sea for attacks altogether. The king's exoskeleton had protected him from the blow. The parasite is entering hibernation. The king scooped Kim into his mouth. The Naga king shouted, Do you really think that I'd die in a place like this? But any further noises were cut off as the king closed his mouth tight. Dominique's master had been snatched from her hands. She stood there, staring on as the flood dragon king announced. The Naga king has fallen. Time remaining until the labyrinth's fifth rank upgrade, three seconds. Time remaining until the labyrinth's fifth rank upgrade, two seconds. Time remaining until the labyrinth's fifth rank upgrade, one second. The labyrinth upgrade has been completed. The owner of the labyrinth, Kim Jin Wu, will fully recover their health. The parasite has fully recovered. The parasite will awaken from its hibernation. The flood dragon king was in a state of shock. The territory of the labyrinth is expanding. Two snake heads rose up and wrapped around the siege beast as the entrance to the Naga labyrinth went through a drastic transformation. You are currently battling within the Naga labyrinth territory. Draken held on tight. He wasn't giving up. 30% increase in Naga strength. The owner of the Naga labyrinth, Kim Jin Wu, has fully recovered. Kim forced his way out of the dragon's mouth, determined to end this here and now. He pulled himself up to the height of the dragon. He looked the flood dragon dead in the eye and let it know that his humiliation at its hands had ended. Recovering has changed nothing. I'll force you down as many. Kim screamed silence as he sent electricity through the parasite to the stash of C4 he left in its mouth. An explosion went off, this time with zero chances of missing. The flood dragon impressed Kim. Even after the C4 rocked his world, he still pushed on. But regardless, how long the dragon fought death was inevitable. Even if Kim had to cut the king's neck himself. To accomplish such a promise, there was something he needed. He burst through the side of the Flood Dragon's champion hero, snatching its weapon from the air as its arm was parted from its body. The champion's sword would do just fine. Kim turned around and rid his labyrinth of the hero champion's presence. Rikshasha couldn't believe her eyes the king of the Naga had easily dealt with a problem she could barely stand up against. Having their leader killed sent all of the weaker champions into a rage. They all rushed Kim intent on revenging their leader. He dropped his newly acquired sword as he grabbed them all out of the air with his parasite. His subordinates stared on in disbelief. As their master crushed the entire squad of champions, Quintus dropped to the ground and presented his king with a new weapon. As he retrieved it, Rikshasha warned him of the incoming attack. 
he slowed down time with cognitive haste once again. He was determined to finish this in a single blow, even if the side effects came back to haunt him later. He lit up as electricity flowed through his body. Kim would attack with the full extent of his powers. A flashing light shot towards the Flood Dragon King. Such a useless attack wouldn't face him. He grabbed Kim out of the air, only to have his hand blasted away. The Naga King thrashed the Flood Dragon, causing fire breath to unintentionally splash from his mouth as the pain wrecked his body. With his final blow, he dug into the dragon's neck. The Flood Dragon felt he could survive this. The blow was shallow. He intended on countering the moment the blade left his flesh. But he never got the chance. As Kim pounded him with one champion sword after the other. As he readied the blow that would end it all. With a single swing, Kim came through on his promise to cut the flood dragon's neck. Even with his neck removed from his body, the dragon refused to yield. The stubborn dragon would grasp at victory regardless of the cost. If he had to use every piece of energy he had from his entire hoard of down gems, he would do just that. The parasite is requesting to consume the Flood Dragon King. Kim approved the request. A giant parasite head shot out, sucked the dragon's head in, and crunched away. The armies on both sides of the conflict stared on. Both groups were in disbelief for two different reasons. Rikshasha watched as a human devoured the king of the Flood Dragons. Dominique was so proud of her master for consuming that dragon's head with zero mercy. You have absorbed the core of the Flood Dragon King, Anaxtus. Dominique was fangirling way too hard. The parasite has acquired a new ability. Kim was shocked as the parasite wrapped him in a thick armor. New ability fortification. Able to recreate the defense of a Flood Dragon. The owner of the Flood Dragon Labyrinth Anaxtus has died. The summoned flood dragons can no longer exist. The cute little workers are defending the core with all their might. The existence of the powerful beings is being broken down sequentially. The siege beast disappeared as the poor little workers were tossed from its back. The intelligence of the weaker beings is slowly deteriorating and they will turn feral. At the sight of this, Kim summoned Naga champions burning through all the energy he possessed. Naga champion? 25 energy can be summoned after reaching Labyrinth Rank 5. A lethal unit heavily specialized for attack. Nagas go forth. Do not let a single one escape. He was truly vicious. The Naga would not show a single shred of mercy. He wanted each to be killed as painfully as possible. The whole lot of them would be slaughtered. Victory! Naga Labyrinth vs. Flood Dragon Labyrinth King, Kim Jin Wu vs. King Anaxtus the Naga Labyrinth lost 48 soldiers, 4 warriors, 1 priest, 2 archers, 0 mages, and 1 gatekeeper. The Flood Dragon Labyrinth was fully wiped out. And the victory goes to the Naga Labyrinth. You have emerged victorious from the war against the Flood Dragon Labyrinth. You have overcome an overwhelming difference in power, and your greatness will be widely announced throughout the underworld. The Flood Dragon Labyrinth has been defeated by the new Naga Labyrinth. The flood dragons that served under the flood dragon labyrinth will turn feral. That muscle head went and got himself killed. I wonder just what kind of weapon did the job. King of hammer and anvil, Malaxus, he placed all his faith in defense. Truly mindless. It took a while, but I always knew this day would come. The king of wanderers, Hecarim. That disgusting lizard. I'm so happy he's finally gone. Queen of dreams, Ariane. His cautiousness did nothing to save his life. I always knew his arrogance would get the best of him. The king of the swamps, Corinthus. I can't believe something like this happened in my neighborhood. This is only going to end up being a pain in my butt. Especially since the spirit king will most definitely be looking to make a play. King of gluttony, Uther. There's no reason for me not to go and scout the area now. Let's see this Naga labyrinth. And the labyrinth of the dead. King of the Dead, Belicious. Dominique was surprised that the cleanup didn't take long at all. But seeing as how the larger flood dragons evaporated, there wasn't much to clean up. All that was left was the smaller soldiers, and the workers are hard at work processing their remains. Kim was disappointed with the outcome. 
losing fifty soldiers was a hard blow. Dominic insisted that if it wasn't for him, the vanguard would have wiped them out. To overcome an enemy that was five times their size and only lose half their troops was truly remarkable. The soldiers who perished would all enjoy eternal honor. Rikshasha knew the Naga soldiers were truly fearless on the battlefield. If it wasn't for that random dragon breath that hit their left flank, their losses would have been severely reduced. The battle at the Naga Labyrinth would be talked about all across Geyser. A smaller army with weaker soldiers holding out against the overwhelming force, killing over 200 of their enemies while only losing 20 while fighting in direct combat. News of this feat was surely spread like a wildfire. The king of the Naga Labyrinth gave her hope. As she congratulated him on his victory, he inquired about her arm. But all was well. The healers easily patched her up. Rikshasha explained that their work was far from over. The Flood Dragon Labyrinth was wide open. They would need to make a quick trip there to plunder its goods before someone else did. Kim naively believed they were done with the Flood Dragons. But they had to claim the rewards before the Labyrinth chose its new master. And luckily for them, the Flood Dragons had made the job easy. They had dug an express passage straight to their front door. Kim understood that the job wasn't done until it was fully over. But his frustrations was truly getting to him. But luckily there was someone close by who could remedy his problems. The black marketer stepped up, offering to help. For a price, that is. Quintus had the little guy by his hoodie. He congratulated them all on their heroic victory. He was amazed by the sights that he saw this very day. Quintus had snatched up the little guy as he was loudering around their bridge. Kim explained to Quintus that he was the black marketeer. They've done business in the past so he should be safe. Go ahead and drop him. So, what made you grace us with your presence? That's simple. If there is a war, there is a victor. And if there is a victor, there shall be spoils. And us black merchants are always looking to get our hands on the spoils of war. In particular, the body of the Flood Dragon King. So, I assume this is how you do business throughout the geyser. Well, everything above his neck is gone but everything else is intact. Kim decided to restock his stores and would sell everything else to the merchant. With that piece of business out of the way, the merchant moved on to the true reason of his visit. He had come to deliver the Naga Labyrinth's barren seal. You have received an underworld barren seal. This is the first barren seal given to the master of a labyrinth that is not located in the abyss. Would you like to inherit the position of a baron? You have been appointed as a baron of the underworld. The territory of the Naga Labyrinth has been declared as the baron's territory. Intelligent beings in the underworld will not be able to infiltrate the Naga Labyrinth. You are able to set a toll on the territory. You are able to assemble an order of knights. You are now qualified to pass through the abyss levels. You have obtained the authority of a lower-class noble. Such a role came with a lot of privileges— but even so, Kim still hesitated. He knew such a group existed in the geyser. But he would never have guessed that the black merchants would be the deliverers of such a treasure. Kim wanted to know why the black merchant chose to follow them to the Flood Dragon Labyrinth. The merchant hurriedly explained himself. As of this moment, the Naga Labyrinth is incapable of running a labyrinth the size of the Flood Dragon Labyrinth. Kim agreed with such a statement and seeing as how the king died away from the labyrinth it's still in perfect shape. And, us black merchants are willing to pay more for a labyrinth in this condition. What nonsense! Who said I was selling this to anyone? Since you can't operate it, what else are you going to do with it? Kim shouted orders to all the naga. Retrieve everything that could be of use. And anything that's not, destroy it. The naga labyrinth will plunder this entire area. The merchant was in shock. There were very few labyrinths left in all the underground in perfect condition. If Kim destroyed it, no new labyrinth would be able to grow in this place. And that was exactly what he wanted. The merchant tried to comfort him by explaining that his title as a baron would protect him from most enemies. But Kim could care less about such a title. The labyrinth core before him had immense power. The core of the Flood Dragon Labyrinth. Rank 7. 
5,400 out of 7,000. Luckily for Kim, the Flood Dragon King never saw an outcome where he would lose. Because of this, he was able to take it all. Would you like to deactivate and disassemble the core? Yes. The Black Merchant panicked at this, screaming no. The Flood Dragon Labyrinth has been deactivated. Kim wasn't interested in another labyrinth growing up under his shadow. The Black Merchant was truly devastated, a decades of growth gone in an instant. Kim wasn't going to be greedy. He would leave some for the Black Merchant. He would sell all of the specialized Flood Dragon equipment. Seeing as how the Naga couldn't use it. But as he glanced over to it, he realized the workers were having a little snack. He insisted that if the black merchant was interested, he should hurry, otherwise the Nagas would eat it all. Rikshasha broached a more important subject. She had retrieved all the horn rats that had once worked for the Flood Dragon King. Some were still in hiding, but she had collected most of them. She left the decision of how to handle them in his hands. Kim felt that such a group would come in handy. Rikshasha ordered the rats to listen up. She introduced all of them to the Naga Labyrinth King. He's the very person who removed the head of the Flood Dragon King. The underworld has recognized his feet and appointed him a noble title. She insisted if they wished to save their life, they should pay their respects to the Baron. Your authority as the Baron of the Underworld is activating. The Horn Rat submits to the Underworld Baron Kim Jin Wu. All the rats bowed before their new master. Kim explained that he had come to this labyrinth to loot and plunder the whole place. He was willing to take them in as his own, but only if they were useful. If not, he would strike them down and leave them for dead. He picked the closest one up by the scruff of his neck to look it over. He wasn't impressed. He was expecting more. They were all skin and bones. In their current state, they would hardly be able to lift tools. The lot of them were malnourished and overworked. And some even had illnesses. In such a state, they would only be a burden to the Naga Labyrinth. Spreading disease throughout his domain. The poor little rats knew finding a new master would be too good to be true. It was probably best he killed them. They had worked their entire lives under the Flood Dragon King. At least this way they wouldn't have to struggle on. Kim decided to solve this problem. He would need to quarantine them. Before he put them to work, he would fatten them up. They would get three meals of nutritious food a day. And plenty of time to rest. And once he constructed his new temple, they will all be sent there until they were ready to become his workers. The little rats couldn't believe he was planning on fattening them up so he could eat them. Kim hurriedly explained that that wasn't his intention. They would be safe in his care. They will be treated right and no one would cause them any harm. As soon as they recovered, they would all be put to work. As a benefit for working for his labyrinth, they would be provided three meals a day, eight hours of sleep, and at least five hours of free time each day. Each of them will be provided two off days every week, and if they finish their assigned work early, they would be free to do whatever they wish for the rest of the day. He explained that he was feeding them so they can gain muscle and rest would strengthen the muscle they gained. In his labyrinth overworked workers were useless workers. Kim decided it would be best if he showed them. He reached out with his parasite and snatched up the closest Naga worker, who was snacking on the black merchant's merchandise. He held the chubby little guy up for all of them to see. The rats couldn't believe a chubby little caterpillar existed in the underground. But Kim ensured them it was indeed a Naga. The rats understood now. The chubby little guy was emergency rations for the Naga Labyrinth. No, it's a Naga worker. The rats were surprised. They had never seen a worker with such chubby fingers. So Kim explained the conditions again. Three meals a day, plenty of rest. Guarantee sleep and time off. If a task required them to leave the labyrinth, they would have a soldier escort for protection. So, I invite you to come work for the Naga Labyrinth. The rats' foreheads hit the floor. They would serve this king until the day they die. At such news, the rest of the horned rats that were in hiding rushed to be seen. But Kim didn't mind. The more the merrier. They had plenty of food to feed them all. Listen up, horned rats. You no longer need to shiver in fear of being eaten by the flood dragons after being overworked. 
as he held the chubby worker up by the head. He asked them to come to his labyrinth, where they would all be fed flood dragon meat for dinner. Horned rat workers plus 176. Daily food and take one flood dragon per 16 rats. Two days later in the Naga labyrinth. Kim stood before the altar with the flood dragon's core in his hand. There has never been an instance of there being two cores in a single labyrinth. No one knows what changes will result from this. Do you still agree to activate the new core? Kim was sure no one had ever done it because the system scared them half to death. But he was willing to be the one who blazed the trail forward. He agreed for the core to be added. The new core of the labyrinth has started activating. Main core Naga Labyrinth Core Rank 5 Subcore Flood Dragon Labyrinth Core Rank 7 The main and subcore differ in rank. The subcore cannot fully bring out its potential. The rank of the subcore will temporarily downgrade to rank 5. The efficiency of the two cores have increased significantly. The total energy capacity of the main core is increasing. 1700 to 2500 The total energy capacity of the subcore is decreasing. 1700 to 2500 The energy inside the subcore has exceeded its maximum capacity, and you will lose 2900 energy. Kim was horrified, but it was too late the system went through with the procedure. He had just lost over 1,000 low-grade down gems. Adjustment complete. He got over it quick. He was still gaining over 2,500 energy. So that softened the blow. Synchronization and process time left until completion 6 days, 23 hours, 59 minutes and 52 seconds. All that was left for him to do was to wait and see what all this meant. So his attention turned back to his new horde of horned rats. Dominic informed him that the group was currently resting. A group of them wasn't down with the good treatment. Even the flood dragons weren't treated so well. They just knew they had been trapped, and would be eaten any day now. Kim felt that in time, they would get used to their new life. Once they were put back to work, they would feel more at home. He had no idea how Dominic predicted that they would need a new room, but he was thankful. She must have given up her personal fangirl shrine she had built to worship her king. They were nearly done tallying up all the spoils of war. So she briefed him on what they knew so far. They had been extracting down gems from the flood dragon bodies. When they ran out of space in their storage, they froze them on the battlefield. There was 176 flood dragon soldiers. 47 heroes, 4 Manganel flood dragons and 10 flood dragon champions. All of them could be used as a food source. Kim was truly thankful for the ice mages. This place would reek if it wasn't for them. They have also obtained 236 low-grade down gems, 72 mid-grade down gems, and 8 high-grade down gems, far lower than he had hoped. And last but not least, one super-grade down gem. Kim had no idea how she obtained it. The siege beast had evaporated like all the other living large flood dragon soldiers. But it turned out to be the core of the blood leopard. Meaning now they had a pair of them. Heart of the blood leopard, super grade. You can only check the exact worth of the down gem with a research lab and a smithy. Kim was ecstatic, such a treasure made up for all the lost energy. Now that they were done cleaning up, it was time to focus on expanding the labyrinth. Unlocking rank 5 had expanded their usable territory all the way to the bridge. First, they would build gates at the new borders of the territories. This would cost them a whopping 120 energy. Next, they would be moving the farm, the barracks, and the training hall to the left side of the lake, costing a grand total of 135 energy. In the area below the lake, they would build a research lab, a temple, and move the pub to that location. The cost for that would come out to 210 energy, and the empty spaces would be used to house the Nagas and the Horned Rats. Dominic insisted that the king should have his own personal room. What she said made sense, so he decided to go along with it. And her trap was set. She speedily explained that Quintus believes, as a reward for eliminating the spiders, that any one hero rank or above should have their own private quarters. Kim didn't believe this for a second. 
Quintus was the type of person that would want an armory, above all else. But he agreed. Because providing them with such a luxury would encourage them to work harder than anyone else. He would need to thank Quintus for such a great idea later. But Dominique insisted that she would do it. She hurried away, ecstatic that her plan had worked. She would have her own personal room right next to her king. Kim was sure that everyone was excited for the changes to come. The Naga Labyrinth's growth was about to explode. But he wouldn't be satisfied with just being a strong labyrinth. They would need to become the strongest before he could rest. In an isolated part of the underground, humans were dropping like flies. All of their level 8 dungeon babies had been easily slaughtered. They had all come here with the intention of scaring away this monster. But instead of running it attacked. They had no idea how the small beast caused so much damage. Old Man Beck had a peculiar occupation that only Kim was capable of undertaking. However, he feared that revealing the complete nature of the job would jeopardize their relationship. The explanation he provided to Kim left him deep in thought. While Beck had the ability to acquire gems from any location in the underground, the question lingered, why did the old man specifically require Kim to venture to the seventh floor? Please assist me this one time, pleaded Beck. All I ask is that you acknowledge having been sent to the seventh floor. The old man's request seemed nonsensical. If there was nothing for him to retrieve on the seventh floor, how would Beck know if he had actually gone there? Resigned to the fact that he had no way around explaining the job in its entirety, Beck steeled himself for Kim's reaction. I have a client who desires a specific item from the seventh floor, Beck finally confessed. I am unwilling to sell such an item but I do appreciate money. Therefore, all I need is for you to visit the seventh floor, allowing me to inform my client that I made an attempt. Sending anyone else would inevitably result in their demise, as the seventh floor is a treacherous place. Although I value money, I would never subject someone to certain death. Can you help me with this? Kim's mind raced, grappling with the implications of Beck's request. The situation felt eerily similar to his own and he began to voice his concerns. Mr. Kim Jingwu, have you ever heard of the war beast? Beck asked. Do you mean those horned rats? Kim inquired. Beck clarified, the war beast I refer to are not mere talking creatures. I speak of the magical beings found in human fairy tales, humans with animal ears and tails. I have a client who specifically wants me to obtain one for him. However, personally, I cannot condone the capture and enslavement of any living being, regardless of the lucrative nature of the business engaged in by the wealthy. Are you suggesting that these humans are engaging in activities similar to those that led to the creation of Dungeon Babies? How is this any different? Beck acknowledged the gravity of Kim's concerns and clarified his intentions. No, I am not asking you to capture anyone. I merely require evidence of your attempt, not your success. I will provide you with equipment and supplies at no cost. All I ask is for you to go to the seventh floor and return safely. There is no need for you to capture anyone. I'm more than willing to offer you a generous payment. I understand that the seventh floor should not be taken lightly, but my primary reason for approaching you is to prevent harm to others. If the job only entails going there and returning, I am fully prepared to undertake it. Thank you for considering my request. The only remaining challenge is how to communicate my failure to the client. It is estimated that the journey to the seventh floor and back will take approximately two months. By the way, Mr. Beck, do you happen to possess any knowledge about the Flood Dragon Labyrinth? Wait, are you referring to the Scaredy Cat Anaxtus located on the ninth floor? Dominique was in dire need of counseling. Without her master by her side, she felt utterly useless. Therefore, She had developed a habit of waiting by the portal, eager to catch a glimpse of him the moment he returned. As soon as he approached the portal, it was as if a switch had been flipped, and she sprang back to life, ready to cater to his every need. Fortunately, there wasn't much to report during his absence as everything had gone smoothly. However, she did have an update regarding their new residence, the Horned Rats. Most of them had been successfully integrated into the workforce and appeared content in their new environment. Unfortunately, there is some discouraging news. 
they seem to be approximately 40% less efficient compared to the Naga workers. Rikshasha believes this discrepancy stems from the inherent differences between the two species, as the horned rats are not accustomed to the specific type of work we undertake here. Kim decided to investigate this matter further, confident that he could find a solution. On another note, the refinement process for the blood leopard hearts is nearing completion. Both the smithy and the research lab have reported that they should be finished within the next three days. Three days was perfect for Kim. It gave him plenty of time to kick his heels up and rest. He could head out on his journey after his new items were revealed to him. Dominique's heart sunk upon hearing the news of his impending departure. She understood his ties to the world above, yet it still left her feeling frustrated. Her deepest desire was to be in his presence as much as possible, but the human responsibilities he took on often deprived her of that wish. Such intimacy embarrassed him profoundly, yet he reassured her that his earthly possessions, his house, money, and connections, were all mere facades. Besides his family, everything else held no real value to him. Having been born in the underworld, he found solace and comfort in its depths. The Naga labyrinth had truly become his home. Dominique struggled to contain her inner fangirl, for she knew she had to respect his role. While Kim was above ground, he came across some information that he deemed valuable, at least by human standards. He relayed to Dominique that the Naga labyrinth resided on the ninth floor. Dominique wasn't entirely certain of the significance, so Kim simplified the explanation as best he could. On the positive side, being situated on the ninth floor significantly reduced the chances of humans encountering them. Humans tend to track labyrinths by numbers, with the highest floor being labeled as floor one. We, on the other hand, are nestled all the way down on the ninth floor. However, the downside is that if the beast of the abyss were ever to go on a rampage, the Naga labyrinth would suffer more than any other. We can continue our discussion as we walk. I have yet to witness the labyrinth upgrades firsthand. Interestingly, humans refer to the Flood Dragon King as the Scaredy Cat. It appears that the rumors were not entirely unfounded, as he spent the entirety of the war avoiding humans. This became evident when it was discovered that the C-4 explosives hardly inflicted any damage upon him. Strangely enough, we owe our gratitude to that rumor, as it ultimately saved us. Three days later, the Naga workers had readied the blood leopard hearts to be examined by their king. The one on the left had been appraised by the lab, and the one on the right had been refined in the smithy. Kim thanked both the workers for their hard work, and picked up the one from the lab. Blood Leopard's Heart. Super Grade. Appraised. Down gem from the Blood Leopard, the cruel apex predator of the underworld. It contains the essence of its stealth ability, which had been enhanced from years of hunting. Kim was puzzled as the system gave no instructions on how to acquire the ability that was inside the gem. The parasite requests to eat the Super Grade Down gem, Blood Leopard's Heart. The last time he let the parasite eat what it wanted, he gained a new ability. So Kim had no problems putting two and two together. After the first time, Dominique assumed this would be the case. Kim's parasite required down gems to grow. It explained why it had no problem sensing down gems. He was disappointed to hear such news. Down gems were too precious to waste on his growth. But Dominique knew they had truly lucked out. He could have attained a parasite that required the blood of its host to grow or one that leached away his vitality, leaving him weak and useless. Kim stared at her stunned she had kept all this information to herself when she encouraged him to bond with the parasite. But he couldn't hold a grudge against her. After all, she was right. If it wasn't for the parasite, the Naga labyrinth would have been doomed. Before he can fully get the word approve out of his mouth, the parasite had transformed his hand and was scarfing down the giant down gem. The parasite has acquired a new ability. New ability camouflage. Nothing would be able to see you without a special detection skill. The parasite disappeared, leaving Kim looking like the invisible man manifested in real life. The parasite has reached its growth limit. It will undergo a transformation to surpass said limit. The parasite will be in hibernation for a week. With the parasite asleep, his hand instantly popped back to normal. 
He reached for the next item, which had been refined in the smithy. Blood Leopard's Heart Super Grade. Refined. Dao Gem from the Blood Leaper, the cruel apex predator of the underworld. You are able to add a special ability to a piece of equipment by crafting the equipment with this. They would have to take a rain check on using this one. After all, Kim broke every weapon he came in contact with. He noticed how upset his worker was and reassured him that he would search for a weapon that was suitable for it. He was all done with that. It was time for him to head out on his job. The job would take him around two weeks. He would be sure to rush back since he was eagerly awaiting the results of the Dragon Core synchronization. Dominique was worried for his safety. With the parasite sleeping, he would be vulnerable. But Kim wasn't strong because of the parasite. Don't get things twisted, the parasite helped him out quite a bit. But without it, he was still a force to be reckoned with. He will be fine, just as long as he didn't run across someone as powerful as that scaredy cat Anaxtus. If you were wondering where Draken was, well, he spends his days lounging in the most peculiar of places. Hiding from the wrath of Quintus. Several days later on the seventh floor of the underworld, by the way, it's known as the geyser to the human world. But to its inhabitants it's known as the underworld. A small group of dungeon babies examined a disaster site at the entrance to the seventh floor. They had no idea what could have wrought such destruction. Seeing that all the bodies were stabbed, beaten or sliced apart the culprit had to be on the smaller side. But whatever it was, it had to be deadly as it took out two level 8 dungeon babies. The sight of the carnage put the whole group on edge. The leader passed around the order that everyone should keep their eyes peeled at all times. The experienced dungeon baby among them knew that in situations like this it was best to just head back to the surface. For how would any of them spend a cent of the money earned if they were all ripped to shreds? He could care less how many rare war beasts could be found on the seventh floor. But in the end, the group walked away discussing how they could obtain more money for a job whose difficulty level had shot through the roof. Kim lurked in the shadows, keeping his eye on the dungeon babies. If you could even call them that seeing as how they had all lost their touch. No underworld beasts would ever leave behind a corpse. Or, to be more precise, they never left behind even a single scrap of meat. No beast he knew hunted for anything other than food. An exception to this rule could only be made for a handful of species. But majority didn't waste their time or energy hunting for sport. In the underworld, wasting your energy for fun would only leave you dead. Once the supposed dungeon babies had cleared out, Kim examined the battlefield himself. There were human corpses spread everywhere and there was no sign that any of them had been consumed or looted. So right off the bat, he was able to rule out any territorial disputes. Whatever it was was small and had only been defending itself. He found the remains of orange fur on the corpse of one of the humans. The creature was strong, and he was pretty sure it was still close by. Kim only sensed the beast a split second before it reached him. He knew he was lucky to dodge such a fast attack. Without his parasite, he was in for a rough time. He got his sword up in the nick of time to block its next blow. Dodging away as he sensed the combo attack headed his way. The fight was going to be difficult. Not only was this creature super fast, it was a stealth expert. Seeing as how he barely sensed its initial attack. He would be giving this beast all the respect it deserved. This has to be the rare war beast everyone is clamoring to get their hands on. He couldn't understand why a human client would be interested in something so ferocious. It's highly likely that this beast is responsible for the bodies littered across the floor. Now that Kim had had the time to compose himself, he was ready to get down to business. The war beast shot in like a bullet, but Kim was ready. He blocked each of its blows in kind. It was very ferocious, but it wasn't highly skilled. It felt as if he was fighting against a smaller version of the Blood Leopards. He could easily put it on par with his hero, Quintus. Seeing as how he was done with his evaluation of the beast, he decided to refrain from torturing it with a prolonged fight. He punched her in the stomach, launching her across the room into the cavern's wall. He really hoped it would get the warning that he wasn't interested in a fight. But seeing as how the beast couldn't take a hint he would be forced to put her down. 
and as he was about to do something he wasn't interested in doing. Annette sprung up, binding the beast to the ground. As she struggled on the ground, he could hear the explorers congratulating themselves on the successful capture of the war beast. The group talked amongst themselves as if they didn't see Kim standing right in front of them. They were attempting to claim his beast as if he wasn't in the middle of a fight with it. What do you think you're doing? Huh? Should you really be saying that when we just saved your life? You must be the lone survivor of this expedition team. Here to collect the equipment after running away to save your skin. A few explorers rushed back, explaining they needed to tie down the beasts, otherwise they would get away. On second thought, you're not part of this team. All your equipment is cheap, so you're not a normal explorer. That could only mean you're a dungeon baby that's part of some other expedition team. In its very first attack, the were beast had sliced Kim's bag open, causing his down gems to scatter all over the ground. And greedy eyes had no problems zoning in on the hoard he carried. A nice collection of down gems you have there. It must be nice to have a whole expedition team worth of down gems all to yourself. As Kim explained that he came here alone, and he had no idea who any of the dead people are. The other dungeon baby gave signals to his raid team. And as the bigger dungeon baby let BS flow out of his mouth, attempting to juice up Kim's head, the smaller one activated its ability. He had the ability to see into the future. His ability, along with the stopwatch, would allow him to see the precise reaction time of their enemy. Originally, he saw Kim taking a hit from both of the explorers. But as the time ticked away, Kim sprung up, defeating the explorers with little effort. The dungeon baby with the foresight ability was stunned speechless. His companion insisted he inform them on whether their enemies was dangerous. Initially all he could say was 1.3 seconds. But he went on to say the one we hunted that came from the lower abyss floor's reaction time was 1.3 seconds. Yes. And that's the reason why we almost died back then. His reaction time is? Not bad. But I don't think it's an attack that an average explorer is capable of pulling off. And you're a bit young to be a veteran explorer. You have to be at least a fourth floor dungeon baby. So that leaves me wondering, why are dungeon babies dressed as normal explorers? Kim ripped the dungeon baby's mouth open, revealing the sharpened teeth he expected to be there. Just as I thought, you guys are a bunch of human hunters. His reaction time is... Your scumbags that hunt your own species. None of you will leave this place alive. 0.2 seconds. The two human hunters holding the war beast down stared on as their team was slaughtered by a raging beast. What the hell is that? A monster? Shouldn't we go help them? Help them, my ass. We need to run. Kim's attack intentionally freed the war beast from her bindings. She held the shredded nets in her hand wondering what was going on as she watched a fearsome beast destroy her attempted captors. As Kim took a moment to collect himself in the middle of battle, the soon-to-be-dead dungeon baby felt the need to run his mouth. You. What are you? I'm a dungeon baby. But that's not what he meant. For when the mind of a psychopath comes up against something truly powerful, all it sees is itself staring back. He accused Kim of being the one behind the corpses that littered the room. He believed Kim had killed his own expedition team in order to keep the war beast to himself. You're just like us. And before he could get the words human hunter out of his mouth Kim sliced his head off. For Kim was tired of hearing the ramblings of such trash. But the captain wasn't the last piece of trash he had to deal with. A bunch of this team's underlings felt it was appropriate to abandon their team in the middle of a fight. Kim shot by the dungeon baby who could see the future. After all, he had promised not to let a single one leave here alive. The dungeon baby stared on, not able to perceive reality. In the end, his ability was meaningless. The difference in power was so large there was no reason to fight it. Seeing as how his ability was making him sick, he decided to turn his ability on himself. He stared down at his imminent future and Kim didn't keep him from his destiny for very long. As his head was parted from his shoulders, the last thing he saw was an armband with the number 12 stitched into it. Kim stared on at the corpse, thinking that was one creepy bastard. 
but he soon became preoccupied with the fact that now he needed to search for all of his down gems. He had no idea why he didn't just take his bag off in the very beginning. Are you still looking for a fight, war beast? I've already given you one chance to leave here with your life. But as he turned around, the war beast was staring at him like a lost puppy, who had just found their new owner. Dominique was in the process of performing an audit on the holdings of the Naga Labyrinth. She had made it through most of her audit and only had their farm animals left to process. They currently possessed twenty rabbits and fourteen bears. The growth of the labyrinth was outstripping their food supply, and the farm animals would not help with that at all, seeing as how the group was still in their first generation. Luckily they had the flood dragon meat, but it would only hold them over for so long. They would need to find a solution otherwise the Naga labyrinth's future wasn't too bright. Quintus insisted that the Nagas could sustain themselves on the energy of down gems, leaving the real food to the horned rats. Per Draken was worried Quintus had no intention of feeding him. The only problem with the Nagas sustaining themselves on down gems would be the longer they refrained from eating real food, the weaker the Naga army would become. Quintus wasn't worried about the strength of their army. Their territory hadn't been attacked once since it gained its noble status. Rikshasha was always saving the day. She had a solution to their problem. A variety of beasts had moved into both the territories of the Blood Leopards and the Flood Dragon Labyrinth. This influx of wildlife would allow them to sustain their labyrinth for a few months. Dominique was happy that everything had ended well, but there was still one more thing that was in need of a lot of attention. They would need to put all their efforts into the construction of the wall. The noise Dominique lived for sounded in the background, and she immediately headed straight towards her master. She rushed through the halls, for her king had returned. Two unsuspecting workers stood conversating in the hallway. They had no time to react. They were truly doomed. A pair of fairy orange claws reached for them. But Kim stopped her in time. The war beast had every intent of filling her belly with the juicy workers. Those are friends, not food. You're not allowed to eat anything except what the labyrinth provides you. Now come over here and sit down. The poor workers were shaken from their near-death experience. Who knows if they'll ever recover? Kim explained to Dominique that he had rescued the war beast from being captured, and it had been following him ever since. She was attracting the attention of the humans by wiping them from the face of the earth. So, he felt it was his responsibility to bring her home. War Tiger. Hoya. Hero. Dominique, how common is the hero rank? Well, war beasts are all born into the hero rank. The nobility of the abyss breed them. It's unusual for them to ever leave their nobles' territory. There should be no reason why you should have found one on the seventh floor. She's not the only war beast to journey to the upper level. They're becoming a very popular merchandise for rich humans. Dominique had no idea what was going on in the abyss. I would say based on her behavior, she has never served under the nobles. A truly wild war tiger is unheard of. First the wolf monkeys, then the hell spiders, and now the war beasts. What in the world is going on in the underworld? Well, she's one of us now so make sure you guys take good care of her. War tigers are the strongest of all the war beasts. Having her here will only bolster the greatness of the Naga Labyrinth. By the way, Master the Dragon Core synchronization is complete. Kin was in a hurry. The maintenance of a labyrinth would have to wait till he returned, no matter how bad he wanted to see what he gained from the loss of 2,900 energy. He had only stopped in to drop off Hoya, he patted her on the head and insisted that she be good and listen to Dominique. And if she ate her new friends, they would be forced to eat her. Kim had a lot of rounds to make above ground. First, he checked in with Old Beck the down gem dealer and collected his pay. Next, Kim visited his parents, and seeing as how it had been a while since he had visited them, he had no idea how long he would be trapped there. Mother, father, how have you been? What kind of son are you to not call us a single time? Honey, don't be like that now. Meanwhile, the Naga Labyrinth's new resident was a true menace to society. Hoya was a force of destruction everywhere she went. If it could be broken, she broke it. 
If it wasn't meant to be her scratching post, she made it one. If it was tasty, it went into her mouth. The little creature had ran them all ragged. Kim came strolling into the labyrinth over two weeks later. He instantly knew things hadn't gone well. But it looked like everyone had adjusted. And Draken had finally become useful to the labyrinth. Dominique assured him that the only one that did any adjusting was them, not the little monster. They wasted no time getting to the Dragon Core synchronization. The Naga Main Core and the Sub Flood Dragon Core have been synchronized. A new core has been successfully formed. You are now able to summon new types of troops. Naga Champion. Rank 5. 25 Energy. Naga Long Range Scout. Rank 5. 20 Energy. A capable scout and a hunter. It is very agile and specializes in laying traps, scouting, and searching. Naga Sorcerer. Rank 5. 35 Energy. Sorcerers that are able to manipulate darkness. It is not capable of combat, but it specializes in buffing allies and weakening enemies. These are the basic soldiers added for hitting rank 5. The next group of soldiers are the side effects of synchronizing the Dragon Corps. Naga Calvary. Rank 6. 140 Energy. These new troops have never existed in the history of Naga Labyrinth. These are the troops with the fastest flood dragons. They specialize in breaching large groups of enemies. Your main core rank is too low. Your smithy rank is too low. Siege class. Flood dragons. Rank 7. 1510 energy. This gigantic flood dragon is able to carry tens of nagas. This unit can be used for combat and can also be used as a mobile fortress to place allied units at a distance. This unit requires a lot of food and down gem energy to maintain. 1,510 energy was way out of Kim's budget. And the maintenance costs of such a creature was astronomical. It would be a long time before they ever summoned this guy. The only useful thing was the Naga cavalry, and they couldn't even summon it. None of this was worth the loss of 2,900 energy. But I guess you live and you learn. Kim decided he would at least summon some of his level 5 troops. Summon one Naga Long Range Scout. Summon one Naga Sorcerer. The Naga Labyrinth had two more goofy goobers to join their army. They now had an adequate Naga Scout. And the Sorcerer would drastically lower the casualty rate. The new soldiers were all good and fine, but Dominique really needed him to address the food shortages. In a month's time, their storage would be bone dry and that was with them supplementing it with the regular pillaging of the new hunting grounds. A shake-up in the management structure of the Naga Labyrinth was long overdue. So, Kim got right to work. As soon as Kim mentioned Rikshasha, she appeared. You called Master? I need you to take the new scout and go search the ecology around this area. We need more hunting grounds. Dominique, I grant you the right to use the energy stored in the Flood Dragon Corps. I want you to use it to maintain the labyrinth. Make sure everything that needs to be upgraded is appropriately upgraded. Quintus will be in charge of training our army and protecting our workers. And as for Draken, he will be in charge of Hoya. If Draken didn't have his dragon bond, he would surely escape this hell. If Hoya had her way, she would soon be leading the workers by the head if she had to. A month had passed and the Naga labyrinth had become a well-oiled machine. The labyrinth's strength had risen to new heights. The word had spread that the Naga king was a noble. So no one with an ounce of intelligence came near the place. And anything without intelligence was easily dealt with. The smithy had been put to work cutting through the minerals they had been mining since day one. And through constant training and research, they reached the point where things took care of themselves without Kim having to step foot in the labyrinth. Their command structure was pretty simple. Kim was the labyrinth's owner. Dominique was the labyrinth managing secretary. She was directly in charge of the workers. Quintus was the commander. And Draken was the commander's aide. They were in charge of the soldiers. And the safety of all of the Naga labyrinth. Rikshasha was the scout captain. She was in charge of intel gain from abroad. And Hoya was simply a cutie. She was in charge of bringing joy or destruction to the labyrinth. 
In addition, under Rikshasha's command, they had formed a special scouting team of horned rats. The result was a widespread network of tunnels that spread around all of the Naga's territory. The rats were amazing at their new job. There were scouting bases all around the territory. And at all times there was a horned rat manning it. And the bases were capable of quickly relaying any and all events that took place near the Naga labyrinth. And because of this, they received advance warning. That about a half day's distance from the labyrinth. There was a small army marching in that direction. There were roughly thirty troops. Led by two commanders, both seemed to be hero ranked plus. Dominique popped her head out of her room, which was right next to her master's, by the way, to inform them that hero rank plus on the ninth floor of the underworld must be the least of the elites of the elites. Even though the army was small in size, Kim really wanted to minimize the damage they caused, so he ordered his army to focus on defense, not offense. It should be enough to handle a small army. Being the king of Naga Labyrinth, he felt it was best that he led the charge. The whole command structure waited patiently at the Naga Labyrinth's north gate, for the small army to arrive. A collection of armor-covered soldiers marched across the bridge, dust being kicked up in their wake, as they waved their honor flags high. In no time they stood before the Naga leadership. They were envoys of Malaxis, the king of hammer and anvils. The scary-looking commander was called Mlock, and the large commander was called Block. They sought an audience with the king of the Naga Labyrinth. And how dare a mere human get in their way? The arrogance. The one known as Mlock stepped up. If you wish to remain alive, I suggest you make way. Kim could hardly be offended by such a slight. It wasn't the first time and it wouldn't be the last time, so he would have to grow a thick skin. It didn't take the small army long to realize their mistake and soon all their heads hit the floor in apology. He insisted he wasn't their owners, so they didn't have to show such reverence. They had traveled there to show their respects to the first noble above the abyss. They truly didn't intend to offend him. They just simply assumed that the leader of the Naga was a Naga himself. They continued on about how disrespectful they were, but Kim insisted they move past it. He was sure they didn't enter his territory with an army just to say hello. Their master, Malaxus, would like to form an amicable relationship with you, the lord of the Naga. And their elite troops had been brought only to honor the presence of the Naga king. They truly had no other intentions. Goblin Metal Knight. In addition, to congratulate him for joining the ranks of nobility. They brought him a gift. Kim stared on as they opened a chest full of down gems. It was the equivalent of five hundred energies worth of gems. He wasted no time making sure they understood that their sincerity went a long way. And for this he forgave them. They accepted his forgiveness, knowing that their gift was insignificant in comparison. They were shocked that the others lacked sincerity. Kim didn't understand where they were coming from. The goblin shot straight up, eyes wide and mouth open. There was no way they were the first of the labyrinths to show their respects. Kim assured them that no one else had made their presence known. It was understandable for the labyrinth of the dead, but the others should have made an attempt to show their respect. Especially the lord of gluttony. He was essentially their neighbor. Kim did his best to restrain himself, but he needed to know how they had found the Naga labyrinth. They both instantly understood his worries and they did their best to offer him all the information they could. That included information on every labyrinth on this floor. And the current situation throughout the ninth floor. They immediately began scribbling in the dirt, doing their best to map out the entire ninth floor. Both Dominique and Rikshasha stood around watching the display. The two were building a truly impressive map. They were able to find the Naga Labyrinth by using the Flood Dragon Labyrinth as a starting point to search for the Naga Labyrinth. The Labyrinth of Gluttony lies in the northern Corrupt Valley, while the Labyrinth of the Dead lies in the northeastern Barren Lands. The three labyrinths formed the shape of a triangle. Their labyrinth, the labyrinth of hammers and andals, could be found in the upper underworld mountain range above the labyrinth of gluttony. They had marked out all the remaining labyrinths to give him a good idea of where they were located. Kim could see exactly how the power structure played out on the map. 
All of the labyrinths of the ninth floor kept each other in check, while stumping out any up-and-coming labyrinths. If any of them attempted to attack another labyrinth, they would leave their own home base in danger, which established a deadlock between all of them. Kim could see that the three biggest labyrinths kept all the others in check, and those three were the labyrinth of the flood dragons, the labyrinth of the dead, and the labyrinth of gluttony. The three formed a power balance that Kim was directly responsible for destroying. He knew that a bloodbath was coming to the ninth floor. They went on to explain this as the reason why all the weaker labyrinths would be coming to show their respects for him becoming a nobleman. Kim was impressed by their honesty. But they explained there was no reason to lie, as eventually he would find out and that would only hurt any future relationships between their two labyrinths. Kim wondered if the two remaining powerhouse labyrinths would be enough to keep the balance. The two alone could keep each other in check. But the goblins didn't believe so seeing as how the three-way balance was always an assumption by the Flood Dragon King and the Labyrinth of the Dead. Gluttony isn't interested in power or balance. All he cares about is sitting on his throne and increasing his size. Which is all you can expect from a king of gluttony. His growth has grown out of control leaving him with an unmeasurable amount of power. He's not interested in ever leaving his labyrinth because he's not capable of feeding his gluttons anywhere else. Wouldn't he starve if he and his glutton stayed in their labyrinth? No, their nest is capable of sustaining them forever. To think, they're capable of getting stronger endlessly by doing nothing. It's entirely bothersome that something like that even exists. The information you provided is valuable indeed. Please deliver my greetings to your master, Malaxis. Thank you, my lord. We appreciate your forgiveness and your generosity. Will your army be resting here before you return to your labyrinth? No, my lord. We don't think it's wise for us to risk the chance of running into the other labyrinths. If that's the case, then Quintus, get some soldiers and escort our guests to the edge of our territory. Yes, my king. Quintus and his soldiers escorted the small army out of the Naga labyrinth. Truthfully, I don't think he should be asking Rikshasha's opinion on this seeing as how there's no chance she didn't know all this information already and didn't offer it up to her master. But Kim asked her if she believed the information provided was accurate to her knowledge of the ninth floor. Yes, your liege. The mercenary group I'm associated with has traveled to all corners of the ninth floor. And I can confirm that the information on the swamps, wanderers and dead's locations are all accurate. If that's the case, then record the map before it gets erased. Soon after the goblins had departed, guests from the Dream Swamp and Wanderer Labyrinths all visited within the span of a few days. The Anva that was sent from. From the Labyrinth of the Dreams looked like some type of fallen fairies. The Queen of Dreams, Ariane, doesn't seem to like the emergence of a new noble. If you are not cautious, information about your labyrinth may be exposed. The Labyrinth of the Swamp sent fishy and soggy species. The king of the swamps, Garintos, was afraid that the new power in the underworld will be hostile towards them. They wanted to ensure that their non-aggressive agreement would be upheld. Lastly, the labyrinth of wanderers sent an aggressive group of centaurs. Hakrim, the king of wanderers, is very interested in the story of the king with the new power. Of all the groups, it was very telling that only the hammer and anvil labyrinth brought a gift. The hostility of the centaurs was all Kim needed to know about their labyrinth. These centaurs were definitely not friendly forest guardians in the least. As the goblins had predicted, the labyrinth of the dead had not shown up. And it seemed Gluttony wasn't interested in offering his congratulations either. The parasite has detected a desperate presence. Parasite skill detect is being activated. Kim's right eye turned red as he felt the need to kill. It seemed they had visitors from one of the two after all. Or should I say intruders? His parasite arm shot across his throne room, wrapping itself around the lump of glutton. It had been nestled in the corner on the ceiling of his room. Dominic felt that it was by far the rudest visitors they had received. How dare they send that thing and not come and say hello? Kim kept a tight grip on the lump in his hand. How dare the king of gluttony spy on him? Was he looking for a war? Dominique telepathically explained to Kim that the glutton wasn't intelligent on his own. 
The king of Glutton was able to see and hear through all of his vessels. Kim felt he had just put his foot in it. His actions alone were enough to start a war. Dominique was excited. She felt they should fully commit to it. She had sensitive information that she hadn't had an opportunity to inform him of. But the Nada Labyrinth had a clear advantage against the gluttons. Their ultimate weakness is ice. With that, Kim chose violence. They would have war. He spoke to the slime, extending his message directly to the king of glutton. We know your exact location and your weakness. The Naga army will depart in exactly a week. We will march to your gates and freeze your entire labyrinth. The king of glutton didn't understand what had sparked this madman towards war. If you're interested in apologizing, you have till that week is up to come here yourself and do it in person. The king of glutton was left speechless. This new baron was going to force him to leave everything he held dear. The horned rats were prospering under their new liege. They were filling out well and their personalities were shining through. One week later, the time for war was drawing near. Kim waited patiently upon his throne. He would give the king of glutton the time he promised before they marched. Dominique arrived, with a peculiar look on her face. Is he here? Yes, the master of the labyrinth of glutton has arrived. Kim stepped off his throne and insisted Dominique stand back. If the king of glutton was here to apologize, why had he chosen to enter the domain of the Naga without permission? You must have come here to die, king of glutton. Dominique had no idea they had been invaded. It seemed as if the king of gluttony had planned a smash and grab on their labyrinth. But Kim had prepared for such a circumstance. He called forth his magicians. Their ice puppets sprung up, ready for battle. Kim hated judging creatures, but he knew this one didn't have a shred of pride. The trap was fully set. The king of gluttony had been surrounded from the moment he entered the tunnel. They would blast the corridor with ice until everything was frozen solid. To think. Even in the end, you won't utter a word. But the slime king wasn't acting the way Kim had expected. He showed no signs of being intimidated in the slightest by the ice. If anything, Kim felt excitement radiating off of it. As if he was preparing to attack. For a moment, Kim doubted his choices of letting the creature enter the Naga throne room. Had Dominique been wrong, was he not afraid of ice? No, she was never wrong. He prepared for battle, instructing his magicians to strengthen their blades as he did the same. Parasite ability hardening is being activated. Even if there are millions of you, you're only slimes. You should have just paid your respects like everyone else. Kim was prepared to freeze them all to the core. The king of gluttony made his move, whipping out of the corridor. Everyone attack. Don't hold back. But before their eyes, the king compressed down into a humanoid form. His feet went splat as he landed on the ground. He hurriedly put his forehead to the ground in subservience. As he said he was sorry, the sheer force of his bow repelled all of their ice attacks. Kim stared on with a mixture of shock and intrigue. The king of glutton had been led by the Naga maid to the throne room of the Naga labyrinth. He was very polite, introducing himself as Uther. He immediately stated that his purpose for visiting was to apologize for his rudeness. But the mages instantly cast eye spells to threaten him. He had truly believed that he was being led by the Naga maid. He realized he had made another mistake and decided it was time for him to leave, apologizing all the while. His shock was evident when he realized he was trapped. So, he came back and informed them that the exit was blocked so he couldn't leave. But the king of the Naga threatened to freeze him, and the corridor solid. Uther had only come to apologize. He pleaded that he didn't come here to fight and they should listen to what he had to say. But the Naga king was truly a menacing sight. His sharp claws were ready to rip the slime to pieces. But Uther understood the moment the vicious Naga king insisted he was being a mute. He had been isolated from the world so long that he had forgotten you needed vocal cords in order to talk. So that's exactly what happened, I swear I would never come here to disrespect you. He was devastated. No matter how hard he tried, everything he did was perceived as rudeness. Kim and Dominique stared on as the little slime laid himself bare to them. 
Uther started to panic. Had he forgotten language as well? He was sure that wasn't the case as he spied on the other labyrinths on a regular basis. But he had an idea. There was no way he could ever forget his mother tongue. Sehr erfreut. Geht es Ihnen gut? Hallo, meine deutschsprachigen Zuschauer. Kim slapped his face and insisted Uther go back to speaking English. They could understand him. The situation was just a tad bit shocking, that's all. Kim wasn't sure such a little fellow was actually the king of gluttony, Uther himself. Uther reintroduced himself. I'm Uther, the owner of the labyrinth of gluttony, leader of the gluttons in the corrupted valley. I would like to congratulate you on being appointed a baron. He had never seen a baron before, so when he saw that the goblins had brought a gift, he was thrown off guard as he had no idea what he could offer the Naga king. Uther had never given anyone a gift before. Well, he hasn't talked to anyone since he took over his labyrinth. So he committed one of his gluttons to watch Kim so he would know exactly what would make a good gift. He didn't command his glutton to enter their throne room intentionally. But truthfully it's not like he had any idea he could even be detected. So, he would have easily ordered his glutton to follow Kim everywhere. Kim knew exactly what he was dealing with. Uther was a true shut-in. A hikikomori to the core. From where I'm standing, you don't seem to have any qualities of a glutton. Uther was pleased by such praise, but Kim hadn't meant it as a compliment. You can't judge him by his current appearance. He had been sustaining himself at the cost of tens of gluttony pieces per minute. All of the black marks you see here are the ones who starve to death. You seem pretty calm for someone who's losing comrades at a fast pace. But Uther insisted that his gluttons didn't have any self-consciousness, so it wasn't like he was losing anyone special. And he himself would be the very last one to die. He had brought over a million gluttons, which gave him at least a month to live. If I froze you all at once, it wouldn't take you a month to die. No, I would be dead instantly. But Kim knew that wasn't the case even if Uther believed it. Simply kneeling on the ground had cracked the floor, and banging his head against the ground had dispersed all their magic. He may look small, but his mass was giant. It would be impossible to freeze such a force. He was lucky the slime had no idea and was more afraid of ice than he should be. Uther had came, he had apologized, and now it was time for him to head back home. But Kim wasn't going to accept his apology just because he came to his labyrinth. Uther insisted that he was told to come to the Naga labyrinth if he wanted to apologize. Yes, and I never said I would forgive you. Don't have such a long face. It's not like there's not a way for you to gain forgiveness. With the privilege bestowed upon me as a noble of the underworld. I ask you to become my servant my first night. If you do that, I will most definitely be able to forgive you. Uther began to panic. How could someone like him be offered the role of a noble knight? We've only just met. You don't even know me. Being the master of a labyrinth, I trust in your combat abilities. Our bond would be to a contract that you can't break, so I have no problems trusting your intent. Through this deal, I'll earn a trustworthy servant, and you won't have to worry about ice, your mortal enemy. And more importantly, you will become the first knight of a noble. Think about how dashing you will look when that happens. Yes, the first knight of a noble. A hikikomori through and through. Kim wasted no time starting the contract ritual. I, Baron Kim Jin Wu, name Uther, master of the labyrinth of gluttony, as my first knight. I'll need you to sign here, here, and here if you agree. Let's see, yes, everything seems to be in order. I, Baron Kim Jin Wu, have no obligation to protect Uther, my first honorable knight. However, Uther, the master of the labyrinth of gluttony shall be obligated to protect me and my labyrinth with his life. He will also be required to obey my commands, whatever they may be. In addition, he is required to give up half of his total labyrinth earnings and gems to me as an offering. Furthermore, he is obligated to make all the storage and treasure rooms in the labyrinth of gluttony available to Kim Jin Wu. If he owns any equipment or down gems that may suit Kim Jin Wu, he shall offer it to Kim Jin Wu immediately. Furthermore, if Kim Jin Wu wishes to have any of his possessions, he should acquiesce. 
Uther was seriously on the verge of death. A slime trail ran down the corner of his mouth. As he turned a green hue, that had nothing to do with the fact that he was a slime. The Black Merchants' Council of the Round Table The annual auction of the Black Merchants was soon to commence. This was the Black Merchants' top event. None of them could afford any mistakes. All the invitation letters have been sent. But it seems the first, second and third floor merchants weren't able to attend. But that was to be expected. The humans essentially controlled those territories. But the fourth floor was able to attend even though he had humans nipping at his heel. Do you have someone from the fourth floor interested in entering the auction? He assured them he had a greenhorn that had shown interest in entering the auction. Why is that such a big deal? New labyrinth owners are always interested in the auction. When I say greenhorn, I mean human. That labyrinth has accepted a human once again? Well, hopefully it goes better this time than it did the last. Since we're on the topic of humans, how's yours doing on the ninth floor? It's not as fierce up there as it is on the eighth floor. But new labyrinths are famous for being wiped out on your floor. In response, Kim's merchant pulled out a golden slip of paper with the letters VIP printed on it. Why do you have a noble's ticket? You're not even in the abyss. The merchant held his ticket up with a smooth smile spreading across his face. My human was appointed a baron. And you don't have to worry about his safety, as he's proven he's capable of handling himself. With the special prizes that we've prepared, and the presence of the first human noble ever. This auction is going to be interesting indeed. Kim received a coveted golden ticket from the esteemed black merchant, entitling him to a range of exclusive privileges typically reserved for the elite. This golden ticket granted him the extraordinary opportunity to attend the renowned annual festival hosted by the black merchant himself. Although black merchants typically engage in the sale of everyday items, this festival showcased an extraordinary twist, as rare and highly sought-after items were presented for auction. Such an arrangement ensured that everyone, regardless of their social standing, had an equal chance to acquire these exceptional treasures. Kim's curiosity was piqued, particularly regarding the distinguished individuals set to partake in the event. Being a labyrinth owner himself, he speculated that the attendees would likely comprise of fellow enthusiasts of this unique craft. However, doubts crept into Kim's mind as he pondered whether there would be any significant turnout at all. To his surprise, each year, dozens of individuals flocked to the event. At its zenith, the gathering boasted an impressive number of over 100 participants. This revelation left Kim astounded, as he never imagined that so many labyrinths had managed to survive and flourish. Nevertheless, Dominique, seeking to reassure him, confidently asserted that the labyrinthine landscape was far grander than Kim could fathom. Even the ninth floor alone likely surpassed the scale of the map that the goblins had painstakingly marked out. More importantly, the black merchants never left the auction goers vulnerable to attack. All participants in the auctions are given this distinguished flag to fly above their labyrinth. During the auction, if another labyrinth dared attack a labyrinth under our protection, they would immediately be blacklisted from our services. And depending on the circumstances, we may even destroy them outright. Kim saw the perfect opportunity to prod at the merchant to see how powerful they were. But the merchant simply responded that his organization would surprise you. After all, they hadn't managed to survive for centuries for no reason. Uther, who had been trying to get the attention of the black merchant the whole time, finally spoke up. If it wasn't for the auction venue in his early days, he would have been destroyed. There were many years, he strategically used it to evade destruction. The black merchant agreed that he remembered those days way before the Great War ever took place. Then he took a double take and realized exactly who he was talking to. Yutha was overjoyed that he had finally caught the merchant's attention. Yutha the king of gluttony. The black merchant couldn't begin to understand why the king of gluttony was in the labyrinth of Naga. The little glutton's home sweet home was framed up right behind him. The black merchant was speechless, and all his years he had never seen such a thing. A labyrinth owner's portal residing in the competitor's labyrinth's throne room. What he was witnessing just wasn't heard of. Kim decided to solve the mystery for him. Uther is a knight of the Naga Labyrinth now. 
after Uther signed a contract to become my subordinate. I gained the ability to connect our two labyrinths by way of portal. The labyrinth of gluttony is essentially my next-door neighbor. Both shock and horror pass through the black merchant. To make a labyrinth owner on the same floor, your subordinate was truly devious. He didn't know of any rule that stated that such a thing couldn't take place. But he could see one side effect. An alliance between two great labyrinths meant that the ninth floor had a new superpower. The surrounding labyrinths are going to be in shock when the news makes its rounds. Kim assured him he didn't have to worry about that. He had something planned. But essentially, the only labyrinth that everyone's afraid of around here is the Labyrinth of the Dead, ran by Valicious the Necromancer. All the other labyrinths will just assume that my alliance was made to keep him in check. The black merchant was speechless. He didn't know that Kim had a full understanding of the political situation of the ninth floor. An old man like him couldn't take so many surprises. First the war with the flood dragons, now this. If this kept up, the merchant was surely going to have a heart attack. Kim had expected more from the contract with Uther. He didn't gain control over the labyrinth of gluttony. Only the individual of the contract itself. He was only able to see the labyrinth's rank, but had no access to summons or building functions. Essentially, the two labyrinths were an official alliance. The black merchant had no idea that Uther had made it to rank five. All he ever did was sit around in his labyrinth. When did he have time to grow? Uther was so impressed that they had noticed he had tried so hard in his early years to gain those ranks. Since the attention was on him, he felt it only right that he offered all of them a tour of his labyrinth. But the black merchant quickly passed, he dreaded every time he had to step foot in that sticky, nasty place. Everything about it was unpleasant. With its walls and floors all covered in slime. Kim could only agree. Uther was left in horror, as no one cared for his home. They wasted no time moving the topic off of him and back on to important things. You were provided a VIP ticket because of your status as a noble. Some of the perks you will receive is a VIP room. The room is completely private, allowing you the best view of the auction in a luxurious space built especially for nobles. And the most delectable food is served complimentary to our VIP guests. So I highly recommend you participate, even if it's only for entertainment. Kim wanted to know if the King of Necromancy would be there. The merchant couldn't divulge too much personal information, but he could say that usually Valicious was a regular participant every year. Seeing as how he's a necromancer, he's highly interested in all of our living goods. Kim was surprised at how much information he divulged on the necromancer king. But the merchant found it hard to keep his mouth shut around the baron. And this way, things were sure to be very interesting on the ninth floor. Kim would go, even if it only allowed him to scout the competition. The auction will start exactly one week from the moment the tickets first began to glow and the duration of the festivities will last one entire week. Once the ticket starts to glow. Regardless of where you are, if you rip the ticket in half, you will be transported to the Black Merchant's auction venue. The VIP ticket will permit you and whoever you wish to bring along into the venue. One week later near the Labyrinth of Gluttony. Kim did not enjoy stepping foot in the Labyrinth of Gluttony. It was a slime hole and he wished Uther would clean it up. Uther didn't understand what everybody's problem was. His home was immaculate. He didn't understand why they needed to come to his home to use the golden ticket, when it worked from anywhere. Kim explained it was a simple precaution, just in case a horde of beasts burst out when he broke the seal on the ticket. Uther understood this to mean that his labyrinth was being used as a shield, and Kim confirmed it without an ounce of remorse. The king of Naga went through his checklist to assure the labyrinth would be safe. First, he assured the black merchant's flag was hung above his territory. Quintus agreed that he had taken care of the flag personally. He took this as an opportunity to put the Naga labyrinth in rest mode. Everyone was having a break except for the bare minimum needed to run their operations. Thanks to the flag and the necromancer king participating in the event, their only true threat would be wild beasts and Quintus was on the task of protecting the labyrinth. He wouldn't allow a single insect in, let alone a beast. 
Kim had decided to bring along Rikshasha and Yutha for their prior underworld social knowledge. And as for Dominique being his second in command, she would be left behind to run the labyrinth. He really wished he could take her, but it wasn't a wise decision. She assured him that she was fine and was honored to carry out her job. Kim made sure she knew that she was to take this opportunity to get rest like the rest of the labyrinth. With everything taken care of, there was only one thing left to do. He ripped the golden ticket, and the group set out on their journey. The auction venue was a hot rowdy mess. Monsters sitting next to their sworn enemies. Who as soon as this is over, they would be attempting to kill. This gave them the perfect opportunity to bump noses in a safe environment. And the language that came from them was spicy indeed. Curse words flew all around. Accusations were levied and threats were made. Some were trying to be civil, while others were having none of it. If it wasn't for the rules of the black merchants, things would have escalated into chaos. Kim watched the show highly intrigued. His attendant assured him that the black merchants hadn't intentionally set sworn enemies next to each other. Majority of the attendees were currently in some form of conflict with one another, it was impossible to separate them. So the rules were put in place to keep everyone safe. Apart from the auctions, a lot of them had other circumstances for being here. It was just as Uther said they used this event as the vacation from the endless front lines of battle. Uther needed to make it clear that that was all in the past for him. People don't dare touch him anymore. Uther had finally spotted the necromancer and wasted no time pointing him out. That's Felicius, the owner of the Labyrinth of the Dead. Why exactly are the seats around him empty? I personally can't confirm this. I can only point to the rumors I've heard. But it's said that he smells of rotten flesh. Since I don't have a nose... I can't confirm it to be true or not. The auction will start soon. Guests, please be seated. All the enemies around the auditorium put their differences aside temporarily, as the proceedings were about to begin. The noise in the auditorium dropped. Kim was disappointed. He really wanted to see a fight break out. But it all ended as quickly as it began. Their host poked his head through the curtains. And then he burst out greeting the crowd. Ladies and gentlemen of distinction, esteemed guests who have graced us with your presence at the esteemed Black Merchant's annual auction, I extend to you my heartfelt gratitude and a resounding welcome. Recognizing the value of your time, I shall refrain from indulging in needless prattle and promptly proceed to the main event the auction itself. Rest assured, the spectacle we have in store for you holds a vision so captivating that even the most discerning nobles among us will find themselves yearning for the extraordinary offering that awaits as the grand finale of this remarkable occasion. Therefore, I implore you to remain seated, undeterred by any previous items that may not have piqued your interest, for the grand climax is yet to unfold. And for our first auction of the night, we have. As the host ripped away the curtain, Kim went from stunned. To irritate it, to pissed in the blink of an eye. The item they were auctioning was truly rare. It hadn't been seen in the underworld for over ten years. It was an item that had bitten the hand that fed it and continued to chew to this day. In order to see something of its like you would have to travel up to the shallow parts of the geyser. The item was so rare there was only a few of them left. The host presented the geyserian to the audience. As many of you are aware, the presence of geyserians, once a common sight, has grown scarce following the treaty forged with the surface-dwelling humans. However, allow me to clarify that the Jaizerian before you has not been recaptured after its release. No, what stands before you is a remarkable specimen, a purebred Jaizerian, untainted by any surface influences. Born in the aftermath of the treaty, this creature faced near extinction, yet thanks to the benevolence of an honorable noble, it was rescued and nurtured. In many ways, this noble figure can be hailed as the Jaizerian's savior, for it owes its existence to their compassionate care. The audience was mixed. They saw nothing special in the human. The kings in the audience could see a human whenever they like. What makes this one special, you say? We are aware that our valued customers from the upper levels coexist alongside humans, which may limit their ability to truly grasp the value of this unique offering. However, It is essential to emphasize that this particular product has been carefully tailored for our esteemed patrons from the deeper floors, 
where humans are a rare sight. Imagine the possibilities that lie before you. This remarkable creation can serve as a cherished companion, a captivating subject for scholarly exploration, an embodiment of scientific experimentation, or even a delightful plaything. Moreover, it can rekindle the taste of that long-lost flavor from a decade past, evoking nostalgia in every bite. The versatility and endless potential of this product are simply unparalleled, offering you the means to craft an extraordinary, one-of-a-kind experience, or a truly exceptional meal. I do like a good human every now and then. Yeah, but they're mostly skin and bones. Maybe I'm just hungry. But do you think this place smells of human? It's probably just the product you're smelling. However, this particular Jizerian has a defect. Essentially, it's broken. It can't make a sound, not even a scream, for you particular discerning gentlemen who's into that kind of thing. Due to this particular defect, we have lowered the starting bid. So, let's get right into it. The starting bid will be 100 down gems. The bidding war started as Kim tried to remain calm in his private booth. He wanted to know why a dungeon baby was being auctioned as a product. His attendant explained that their products were determined by the current trends of the geyser. If such a product doesn't meet the expectation of our visitors, the auction house will cease to offer it again unless the trends flow towards a favorable outcome. But that wasn't an answer Kim was looking for. Rikshasha insisted her master calm down. This wasn't some backwoods flood dragons. These were the black merchants themselves. Some of the most powerful nobles of Giza would be weary of taking them on directly. This was not a situation where strength would solve their problems. You're currently seeking revenge against the necromancer king. Rikshasha agreed that she was. Look down there. My kind is being treated as a plaything. If they were elves of your kind, would you have stopped me? It only took her a moment of thought before she answered yes. In this case, their enemies were the black merchants. If they went up against them, they would be slaughtered. The attendant pointed out the simple fact that this was an auction. As a commoner, he did not presume to possess intimate knowledge of the baron's experiences within the geyser. Nevertheless, he empathetically comprehended the baron's motivation to confront this challenge with his unwavering fortitude. There are other nobles who are short-tempered also. Stop beating around the bush and get to the point. This being an auction allows you the opportunity to rescue the young miss with your wallet. Assert yourself and add your bid to the pile. I'm sure the other attendees will think twice about crossing you. The bidding war to possess the dungeon baby had reached 1,200 gems. And Kim's opponent was none other than his enemy. The necromancer king. He would be highly interested in the human subject. And there was no doubt what the young dungeon baby would go through at his hands. Out of all the attendees in the lower auditorium, he was the closest to becoming a noble. But he was out of luck, as a true noble had shown interest in the product. A 1300 bid came from Kim's room. The host had called at the moment he sensed that a noble was interested in the Jizerian. The necromancer king decided to push social boundaries and threw out a 1500 bid. He was choosing to dive into the shark tank head first. The other attendees all became nervous for no one dared touch the things that the higher-ups showed interest in. They all knew he was courting death with his actions. And right on cue everyone in the audience tensed up. The noble was showing an extreme amount of self-control. But the auction venue's booth didn't fare too well under such restraint. After things quieted down in the private room, a simple bid of 1,600 gems reverberated from its enclosure. The host acknowledged the bid, and seeing as how the esteemed noble was not pleased, he issued a warning. They, the black merchants, were not liable for whatever happened after the auction ended. With that, he proceeded with the auction. Sixteen hundred going once, one thousand six hundred going twice. Sold. The Jizerian has been sold to the noble for sixteen hundred down gems. The product had exceeded its estimated worth selling for almost double its intended price. The necromancer wasn't pleased with having to back down. But the human simply wasn't worth the trouble. Kim had put on quite a show. He wasn't interested in playing with the persistent necromancer king. Hopefully the damages to the room didn't offset any gains he made from his little deceptive act. 
Kim was worried for the little girl's well-being and the sooner she was in his care, the better. But the black merchants had procedures for these things. The best they could do was to allow him a private audience with her after the proceedings had completed for the day. Even though he couldn't claim her, he would check in on her. The auction continued in this fashion, but just a tad bit less dramatic after the selling of the dungeon baby. The festival proceedings couldn't pull Rikshasha's eyes from the person of her obsession. There weren't any more human products after the noble incident. And the only living products were deformed or rare creatures. This one is a spirit that was treasured by the elves before their downfall. The majority of the items were down gems with special abilities and luxury products. High quality down gem. Instant amplification. They had obtained this down gem from an elder on the eighth floor. But there were just some items that made no sense. A useless firearm used in the Great War sold for an extraordinary amount of down gems. It was essentially a prop item. And it wasn't the only trash item that the kings fought to obtain. The long day was finally drawing to a close with the grand finale. The host wasted no time revealing the special product he had teased at the beginning of the auction. A vampire with long blonde hair stood proudly. She seemed sure of her worth and knew that her auction would go down in history. Vampires were a rare sight indeed. Only the richest nobles possessed them in all of Geyser. This was the first time Kim had had the opportunity to witness a true vampire in person. Even if this one wasn't a pure blood it was still interesting to witness. He was sure he could feel her glare on his skin. When he brought it up to the others, they insisted that the destruction of the private room was most likely what drew her attention. Her bidding price started at a whopping 3,000 gems and the bidding war shot up fast before the host slowed everyone's roll. For the product had a special condition attached to it. Regardless of the winning bid of the night, the product in the end would be the one to recognize her new master. If the vampire chose not to recognize you, the transaction would be nullified. And the product would be sent back to storage and auctioned off at the end of the next night. Be assured no one would incur any charges for their failed bid. The kings weren't happy with such a condition. How could a product choose you? This auction was a total scam. How dare they? As the tensions started to build, the host calmed everyone down with a few simple words, while they were allowed to badmouth the black merchants as much as they liked. He felt it was wise to disclose that the previous owner of the vampire was a master of one of the deepest labyrinths in Geyser. He didn't even have to explain that such a behavior would irritate the esteemed noble. For as soon as they knew that the product belonged to one of the great nobles, the auditorium was filled with the chirps of crickets. Kim wondered what separated her from the creatures he remembered from his youth. They were humanoid beings that would pounce at any sign of blood. Rikshasha knew the creatures that he referred to. They were known as blood suckers. They didn't possess the ego and were no different than the typical undead. He doubted that a non-pure-blooded vampire possessed their most famous attribute. The ability to bestow immortality upon their master. Kim had enough new additions to his entourage. He had zero interest in the vampire. The auction for the vampire was the biggest spectacle of the night exceeding 23,000 gems. But that wasn't the interesting part. When the bidder confronted the vampire, she refused to even look its way, sending the king off the deep end. He seemed to not be capable of taking rejection very well, as he prepared to erase the non-true blood vampire from Geyser. The host proceeded to teach the heathen manners. Do not defile my holy auction house with your violence. I will kill you. Whether he meant the threat or not, a down gem of the highest level plopped to the floor. The host snatched it up, excited at his findings. If there was a favorable evaluation of the item, there was a high chance it would make an appearance in the very next auction. After the display made by the host, I doubt anyone will forget their manners when dealing with the vampire for the duration of the festival. It had been a long day, so I'm pretty sure everyone was eager to be done until the next auctions rolled around. Many hours later, Kim was finally allowed to see his new servant. His attendant promptly reminded him that while he had purchased the product, they would appreciate him reframing from touching it. There were a few procedures left before it could be transferred to him. 
He stepped into the room as the clearly traumatized dungeon baby stirred blankly on. She sat on the floor as the light shined in, casting both their shadows on the wall adjacent to them. Even though Kim knew there was a high chance she couldn't speak, if he wanted to rehabilitate her, he needed to act normal from the very start. So, he asked her for her name. He wasn't disappointed when there was no reply in return. Even though she was staring directly at him, her eyes refused to focus. He assured her that she was safe in his presence. And if she spoke, she wouldn't be harmed. But her reply was the same. Hopefully one day things could change, but at the moment it was as the auctioneer said. She didn't have the ability to speak. He knew this condition, for he had seen it before as a slave. Some people just had different coping mechanisms for trauma. In cases like this, it was best if you took things slow. So, he pushed forward, introducing himself as her new master. Going forward, she would serve him now. Her reaction to this wasn't too far from what he expected. At the mention of him being her master, she instantly put her head as far into the ground as she could. Whoever owned her before had really did a number on her. They had turned her into a living doll. He asked her to raise her head as he forced back the rage inside. He needed to know if there were others like them trapped in the geyser. Not that he expected her to answer. If he was going to find out, he would have to do it on his own. But he continued asking her questions. Which labyrinth did you come from? Which master did you serve? But it was no use. He got the same answer each time. A blank stare directly into his eyes. He had hoped he could leave her in the care of the Naga Empire. But her condition was too severe for that. In her current state, he definitely couldn't pass her off to a human family as it was more than likely she wouldn't receive one as kind as the one he received. He knew when he purchased her that he was most likely going to have to take her recovery onto his shoulders. He was okay with that, for the time being he would look after her. He started by patting her on the head and reassured her that he would return for her, but for the time being she should rest well. He wasted no time passing a bit of his fury on to his attendants even though he knew it was unfair and unjust. He wasn't pleased with her living conditions, and he expected them to rectify it immediately. She was now serving in his employ, and he expected them to treat her as they would treat him. She needed a room, food, and her minor injuries healed. He did not expect her to be in the same state when he took custody of her. The attendant was one to speak his mind, regardless of the outcome. He expressed his opinion that he believed that it was too much effort for something that had no purpose, other than being a worker. Kim reacted just as he expected. How dare you say something like that to me? The man in front of you is also a Jizerian. The attendant apologized, so Kim didn't push the issue. He had been fair to Kim this whole visit. He walked away, making his intentions to regularly check in on her known. He knew going forward the black merchant's workers would take good care of her, so he had no reason to pound it in any harder. They had spent seven days at the auction house essentially on a vacation. Most of their time was spent lounging around in plush quarters. And the rest was spent sitting through endless auctions. Uther spent most of his time playing with himself as Rikshasha watched on completely fascinated. Or horrified, I'm not sure which. When he originally heard that the food would be complimentary, he feared what he would receive. But it turned out to be decent human fare. And even the beds turned out to be appropriate for his standards. Everything was comfortable aside from the fact that the toilet was the squatting type. And the lack of entertainment. You could only read books and stare at walls for so long. And playing with the Uther gang was out of the question after they refused to stop cheating at board games. All the spare time finally allowed him the opportunity to hear Rikshasha's full story. In the wake of the elves' downfall, Rikshasha united the remaining elves to establish a mercenary guild. Their survival depended on answering the distress calls of various labyrinths in need. Renowned for their unrivaled combat skills, this mercenary guild gained widespread acclaim throughout the underworld. However, their fame and the exquisite nature of their elven composition attracted the attention of Valicious, an individual obsessed with rare creatures. Setting a cunning trap, Valicious managed to ensnare all but one member of this extraordinary group. Through sheer determination, 
this sole survivor managed to escape his clutches, bearing witness to the unfortunate fate that befell her comrades. Regrettably, Kim had to inform her that her ordeal was not an isolated incident, but rather a recurring tale in the tumultuous land of Geyser. She knew that her strength alone was not enough to gain the revenge she was seeking, and her only choice was to be strategic. Kim was down for it all and was willing to help her get her revenge. And after all, it aligned with his current goals anyway. Sooner or later him and the necromancer king was going to bump heads. They didn't know if there was any unwanted ears nearby. So, the conversation was best left for later. Uther and his gang of cheaters were going at it hard, when Kim asked him to check in on the little one. He concentrated hard and burst into glutton number three, who was ready and waiting. Even alone, she was the same as always, staring off into the distance while sitting next to her bedside. The black merchant servants were taking good care of her. But her food remained in the same place they left it. Eat your food! The little glutton screamed with all his might. They had learned this was the only way to get her to obey their commands. She wasted no time being obedient, pulling the tray down to her level. Uther informed Kim that she was only eating when she was commanded to. He was saddened that she was still acting like a doll, only moving when commanded to. He figured he should be relieved that she was at least able to use the washroom by herself. Today is the last day of the auction. Just bear with her for one more day. All right, it's not difficult since she doesn't move that much anyway. Testing, testing. This is an announcement from the black merchants. The final auction of the festival is about to start. Esteemed nobles and guests, please gather at the auction house. Kim was thrilled to get this long week over with. Uther was surprised that Kim had no interest in anything other than the Geyserian. Most of the items were either luxury goods or trash that he had no interest in. Besides, whenever something interesting appeared the auction house would go wild. And the auction price would quickly jump over 10000 With a budget of only 8000 there wasn't much he could buy anyway. It was time to get this show on the road. Glutton number three returned to their room furious. Glutton number four had chosen to ignore his shift, leaving three responsible for the kid longer than he should have been. The other two were just happy that the main body was gone, allowing them to play by themselves. The little devils were intending to hide all of his pieces and make fun of him as soon as he returned. Poor Uther. He wasn't even able to find a friend in himself. The final day of auctions turned out to be the same old trash from all the other days. For example, this tiny gnome statue was a hot commodity selling for thousands of down gems. And I'm pretty sure the host just made an inappropriate gnome joke, so we'll move past it. Kim couldn't understand why any of these people were wasting their money. He would much rather spend it on troops. And for the final time, it was time to head into the vampire segment of the show. The host wasted no time introducing her, even though he didn't have to for she had become infamous for her ability to reject any and everybody that place a bid on her. Kim had no idea why she was even here. He doubted she was the product. So far, it seemed as if she was only here to embarrass the participants. She interrupted the host as he was promoting her for the very last time. He tried to shut her down, but she reminded him that if they didn't sell her, wouldn't they be in trouble? He agreed, so she continued. She felt they should spice things up. Seeing as this was the final auction and all, she freed herself of her bonds as she proceeded to go through her super scion transformation. This time, instead of having the participants choose me, I'll choose my master, and that master would determine how much I'm worth, regardless of how high or low their offer. I'll be sold for that price. A spectacle worthy of the finale was soon to take place. All the participants were excited by such an offer. Someone here was going to get a vampire. In the very near future. The vampire known as the Red Gem of Geyser had already selected her new master. She shot straight to the beat-up private booth. As the audience watched on, not surprised, she chose the noble who went on a rampage on the first day. She was punch drunk on the smell that radiated from the room. Hardly able to hold herself back any longer. Kim needed Rikshasha's opinion badly. 
Yes, master. Are all vampires like this? This is my first time coming across one also. Do you see this? She's a pervert. Yeah, I see it. The host was excited that this ordeal could finally be over. The vampire had chosen her master. And she's chosen his grace. His presence alone has literally driven her mad. The many kings in attendance weren't falling for this giant charade. No matter what, she was going to choose an aristocrat regardless. And now is the time we all find out how much she's worth. As promised, whatever amount the baron sees fit to pay will be the final price. So, baron, what will it be? Kim thought about it for only a second, and since he wasn't a fool, he went with one down gem. The audience was overwhelmed. How could this be? Vampires were considered priceless treasures and one was about to be sold for just one down gem. But let's not jump to conclusions. Perhaps the Lord is offering a down gem of the highest rank. Lowest rank. A single down gem of the lowest rank. The host was left speechless. Even Rikshasha inquired why he was making such a choice. What? I'm not paying good money for that pervert. If I have to take her, I'm not paying much. I didn't want that vampire in the first place, so having to pay even one down gem saddens me. Uther was right there with him. He didn't understand what all this fuss over vampires was about. Kim had plenty of rare servants, so if she turned out to be useless, he would just demand a refund. If that's the case, you should probably just leave her here. There's a high chance that she will be useless. The host was putting on the show of his lifetime. One lowest rank down gem, how can this be? The first vampire in the geyser auction since the establishment of the black merchants has been sold for just one down gem, the lowest price for any item ever in the history of the auction house. Going forward, she might have just earned a new nickname. One gem vampy. Ha ha ha. The vampire didn't take kindly to being mocked. But she let it go because the money wasn't what was important to her. And just like all the other auction products, she wasn't allowed to meet her master yet. After all, there were procedures for these things. This didn't sit well with her. Her patience was running low. The host decided it was probably best to hurry the proceedings. Thank you once again for coming here everyone. But sadly, we have come to the end of the annual Black Merchant Auction. Hopefully this week was worthwhile to all of you. And for those who have placed successful bids, please wait in the lobby or in your private rooms. And your merchant will be with you shortly. The Naga Labyrinth's black market merchant wasted no time bringing Kim his merchandise. They were as eager to get rid of this vampire as she was to be with her new master. He was eager to congratulate Kim. For luck was truly with him. Kim wasn't buying any of this. He could tell they were doing their best to saddle him with this pervert. Before I give you one, Jem, I want answers. Why me? The vampire assumed his question was directed at her. He hurriedly cut her off. Who is behind all of this? I don't believe in coincidence. First, I was given something that's worth way more than I paid. Then I beat up an annoying neighbor and I'm made an aristocrat. Now I participate in this auction as an observer, and a vampire, it's being forced down my throat. I'm not stupid. This is way too obvious. It can't get any more obvious. Mr. Jean Wu, I'm sorry to inform you but you're not special. I hope this doesn't come off as rude. But you're only one of many masters of geyser. Who would profit from things going well for you? They say luck favors the bold. Audit as fortuna yuvat. In all my time in the geyser, I've never met anyone more daring than you. So why don't you just enjoy your well-earned rewards? I say that with the respect due to you and your position. I still don't believe it, but I'll accept it. Of course, it's not that there isn't a price to pay. Her previous owner was very fond of her. So I'm going to warn you. If you don't take care of her well, you may find trouble in your future. Audent as fortuna you've at my ass. Do you want to fight? If not, I suggest you take her back. What do you mean, Baron? I'm sure I didn't stutter. I don't need her. Take her back. I have zero interest in her. I'm being forced to take her in. And if she gets hurt, I'll be attacked. Tell me, do I look like a pushover? 
Do I look stupid? If the pervert's previous owner is that fond of her, he can keep her. Kim was done with this. He turned and started to leave. They could all just screw off. The vampire wasn't going to easily give up on the master of her dreams. She screamed for him to wait. She was a vampire. Just by being in her master's presence, she would raise his status. You're just a mosquito with arms and legs. That's right, a mosquito. Listen closely, vampire, I'm a human. Your value to me is not determined by who or what you are. You see that little girl over there? At the moment, she's way more precious to me than you'll ever be. The vampire took a deep breath and reined herself in. It took her a second because she got a big ego. She understood that he wasn't an ordinary person and him being her new master made her thankful for that. Kim picked up on her, claiming him again. No matter what she says, he wasn't planning on changing his mind. He was her new master, and she wasn't going to keep secrets from him. So, she was going to lay herself bare. The black merchant decided to go outside and block his ears. But she told him to stay because he had a part to play in all of this. In her attempt to lay everything straight, she was going to reveal the black merchant's secret agreement. Kim stared at the back of the black merchant's head. He knew he was hiding something. She started by properly introducing herself. Her name was Angela. Her previous owner was Count Anatolius, a steel giant on the eleventh floor. It wouldn't be wrong to say I was dear to him. But circumstances forced him to give me up. Kim wanted the full story. Circumstances wouldn't cut it. He couldn't fulfill even the most basic condition required to form a contract with a vampire. Our contracts are signed in blood. And that blood is the source of our power. But my former master's blood just wasn't suitable. I'm capable of taking most beasts' bloods. But steel blood is a little much even for me. So what you're saying is he wasn't capable of feeding his pet, so he had to give it away. I don't appreciate your exact words, but yes. I haven't eaten in months. And master, you smell so sweet. And here you go being a pervert again, I'm not your owner. I haven't smelled the real stuff in so long. And you smell just like the real luxurious stuff from the past. I had a simple plan, but all it took was one whiff of you for me to toss it out the window. I was gonna seduce my owner and live the good life. She was so hungry she couldn't hold back any longer. Kim pushed her away. He did not need her. She insisted she had no evil intentions towards him. She just needed food. She was off her rockers. She needed a drink, and she needed it now. If he allowed her free reign, she would surely kill him. The black merchant decided to put his two cents in. Baron, I believe it's too late for you to reject her. If word gets back to the steel giant, he won't be pleased. In the end, it turned out he had no choice. She promised to work hard. She couldn't clean or do laundry. But she promised to at least pretend to work hard. Kim slapped her off of him as if he was trying to squish a mosquito. He had told her he would give her his blood. There was no way he was going to allow her to cling to him. But just because he decided to bring her along didn't mean he fully accepted her. She had a lot to prove, if she was ever one to reach that point. She went full Dracula, causing his parasite to react to what it perceived as imminent danger. She had gotten too close, and it was too late for her to retreat from what she was about to receive. Dominique was speechless. She had no words for the entourage that surrounded her master. So a lot has happened in a week. You won't believe it even if I told you. I'm sure I can figure it out. So, the little one seems to be the same species as you. And then there's the shameless woman standing next to you. They both were put up for auction, and you somehow managed to snag both of them. A human being, auction makes sense. But her. Vampire. Angela. Legendary. Dominique started crunching the math. And soon panic set in. Dominique, it's okay. We got her for free. Well, actually, one gym. Have the workers bring down a single gem. I need to pay for this merchandise. We only have the one room available. Should I also order the workers to start on another room? No, that room should be perfect for our mosquito over here. 
The little one isn't doing too good, so she'll be living with me for the time being. I need you to feed and bathe her and have the healers give her a check over. Her name is Yunwi. You see that uni over there? Her name is Dominique and she's my second in command. I want you to be sure to listen to everything, she says. Dominique was so thrilled by being called second in command that she snatched up Yun Hui and proceeded to claim her as her daughter. Angela had never seen a hero class servant in all of her life. A servant's grade is decided at birth. And since they rarely get the opportunity to raise it, having a hero class servant is very precious. As they chatted on, Uther started to go all googly eyed. Well, Dominic is what keeps this place running. She's essentially the essence of this place. Baron, can I go home now? My gluttons are starting to break down. Oh, you're still here? I didn't even see you there. Uther dropped his head, and him and his gluttons slowly, sadly, marched home. Why was everyone so mean to him? Once he sent Rikshasho away, all he had left was the black merchant. Once you get your money, I want you to disappear, okay? Yes, yes, I'll do as you say. He he. And I'm warning you. I've had enough of your shenanigans. I understand that you're trying to extend your market to ground level. There's no way someone like you who has a terrible sense of money should ever be sent. The black merchant was excited that Kim had figured out their ultimate goal. Seeing as he was the only human in Geyser, Kim was his main source of information on the humans and above ground. Kim decided to give his mosquito a tour of the labyrinth. He wasn't excited about it seeing as how she was forced upon him. But since she was one of them now, he had no choice. She was impressed with how nice and clean this place was. It was so luxurious the way they treated their horn rats. And her new master had an underelf, a draken, a workhiger, and now a vampire. There is no way a new labyrinth should have been able to amass everything that an aristocrat craves. The moment I heard there was a new aristocrat, I thought he may be human. But seeing all this, I'm sure of it, you're the new aristocrat of the ninth floor. You've been in the labyrinth of account. What do you make of all this? Isn't it obvious? You got to this position in less than a year after the formation of your labyrinth. You have aristocrats for and against you. There are old-fashioned aristocrats who reject you. They believe you will bring down the property value. Then you have the ones who feel that you're merely interesting. And then there are people like my previous master, who consider you an opportunity. Kim had heard whispers of rumors about the eleventh floor. It was essentially in the same situation as the ninth floor. A deadlock between powers. Kim's best guess was that in exchange for letting her go. She was given the task to seduce her new owner. Gaining him a secret alliance that would allow him to defeat his enemies on the eleventh floor. If one side grows too strong too fast. The other labyrinths will band together to equal that force. But a secret alliance from a different floor would allow him to strike before they had the chance to band together. Her former master was essentially playing the long game. Seeing as how she chose him, all the way on the ninth floor. It would be a long game indeed. He currently had his own problems to worry about. Her previous master had no say in who she picked. And his alluring scent was all that had pulled her to him but she felt this played right into her old and new master's hands. Most of the aristocrats residing on the 10th, 11th, and 12th floors. Who would ever see an attack coming from the 9th floor? Both her new and old masters would grow significantly from the success they were sure to have in the future. And no one had ever put a deadline on it. They had all the time in the world. Kim was tired of her rambling, so he showed her to her new room. Did I do something wrong? Why am I being given a prison cell? This is standard fare around here. If you don't like it, you can leave. I don't think I can accept such a gross place. Unless you provide me with a cup of blood. He ignored her as he left. To him, there was nothing special about vampires. If she worked hard and proved him wrong, maybe things would be different. But for now, trash gets what trash gets. If you give me a cup of blood... I could prove myself right now. Yeah, yeah, I already gave you blood earlier. Just go get some rest. She couldn't stand her new Scrooge of a master. She hoped he would step and poop. 
Kim had been in Geyser for way too long. It was time for him to get out and find some fresh air. The next day, Kim showed up at Old Man Beck's place. He was greeted by an overenthusiastic gem seller, who had been ringing Kim's phone for days. He was sure Kim had disappeared from the face of the earth. Kim explained that he should just get used to it. Sometimes he takes breaks and during these times he's unreachable. Geyser was in full chaos and old man Beck knew Kim was his man for the job. Kim wondered if the hell spiders had made another appearance on the upper floors. But he was assured that simple insects paled in comparison. The news he had was so important it would change the face of the world. Both above and below ground. Kim insisted the old man stop dragging the story and get to the point. This was one of the biggest problems the old man had with him. He could never have any fun with this dungeon baby. After all the things Kim had seen lately, he doubted Beck's news would shock him at all. A labyrinth has accepted a dungeon baby as its master. Kim's eyes shot open. Had he been discovered? The old man was satisfied. The look on Kim's face was worth all the build-up. Kim wondered what kind of proof had been acquired. Apparently, labyrinth owners have the ability to open doors between their labyrinth and anywhere they choose. I kid you not just like in video games. I was there when the dungeon baby summoned the portal in front of everyone at the association. Who would be stupid enough to let such a secret out the bag? Seems like it happened when they were camping in an empty labyrinth owner's room on the fourth floor. The labyrinth sprung up and chose him in front of all his supposed comrades. And as you know, a secret can only be kept by one person. He would have had to kill them all to hold on to such a secret. But the second bit of news seemed to be tailored perfectly for a person like Beck. There's apparently a secret auction where only labyrinth owners are invited. During this auction, a simple rifle sold for thousands of down gems. If such a thing existed, the opportunities for the old man were endless. Kim wondered why he hadn't spotted the human during the auction proceedings. He needed more information on the dungeon baby who couldn't keep his secret. Beck was saddened to report that the dungeon baby had been killed off by a close friend just yesterday. It was revealed that a labyrinth makes tons of money. And when news like that gets around, someone's bound to die. But the worst part is that we lost access to the labyrinth. It didn't choose the traitor as its new owner. Or anyone else who's come before it. It was highly unlikely that the new dungeon had even formed a labyrinth core. If that's the case, the labyrinth would have died along with its owner. And as you would expect, a group of vultures are at its door trying to become its new owner. Of all the people Beck knew, he believed Kim was best suited to be a labyrinth owner. He was willing to provide Kim with all the information he knew, free of charge. Kim was sure the old man had gone off the deep end. If Kim became a labyrinth owner, old man Beck would gain from being Kim's close personal appraiser and being a level 12 human weapon would ensure you won't meet the same fate as that other guy. Unless you already have a labyrinth, and you're not looking for a new one. Kim didn't even acknowledge the joke with a response. The opportunity to get his hands on a second dungeon was just too enticing. It only took him to inquire about the possibility of an empty labyrinth for the old man to become overjoyed. How could Kim deny that he was interested? According to rumors, the seventh floor has the highest potential. And to think, that was the exact floor Kim picked up Hoya. The bad news is you're two weeks behind and the information was attained from the association, not my private network. And even worse news, if you go there, you're going to have to deal with Song Jongchul. And I know how much you can't stand that scoundrel. But Kim knew that having to deal with trash was much better than aimlessly searching all over Geyser for empty labyrinths so he agreed to look into it. The old man expected him to be interested. He didn't have the best personality, but he was always reasonable. So, when do you plan on heading out? As soon as you equip me, I'll be hitting the ground running. And this time, how about getting me a weapon that'll last? The little dungeon baby was getting more attention at the hands of Dominique than she had ever received. The Naga King's Fandral Club seemed to have gained a new member. Angela waited patiently alongside Dominique for the return of their master. As he entered through the portal, 
Dominic knew he wouldn't be staying for long. His outfit told her all she needed to know. He had a human job lined up. Kim had to increase the size of his team, for the competition on the seventh floor was fierce. This time he would be making the trip up through the eighth floor. He was going to let Rikshasha get some rest this time around. Dominique and Quintus would be in charge of the labyrinth, as usual. Draken was a bit too slow and Hoyle wouldn't be allowed outside the labyrinth any time soon. He was planning on this being a two-man team, seeing as how Yutha was the expert at reconnaissance. But Angela begged to be allowed to join them. Kim wasn't sure, as nothing about this trip would be easy. But she insisted, even if he believed her to be useless, she had talents that could be put to use. First, she was able to detect all living beings in the surrounding area. An ability similar to what Chansik SSI had been able to do. Kim knew a little about vampires, he believed she should have the ability to erase traces as well. She was pleased he knew of such an ability, and wasted no time showing him how she accomplished such a task. She slowly slipped into his shadow. With this ability, she could always be by his side. If he was a willing participant, it would be a smooth ride. Otherwise she would get bounced around a little. This was an ability Kim could get down with. He could keep her around without having her in his presence. Seeing as how her abilities would be useful, he decided she was allowed to come on the trip. Rikshasha arrived essentially dead on her feet. Kim ordered her to get some rest. He had plenty of scouts for this trip. She appreciated his consideration, but she felt it would be good if he had the little one accompany him. Kim had already explained that this wasn't a pleasure cruise, so that was out of the question. Yun, we show the master your ability. The little one's hair and eyes turned pinker than they already were, as pink lightning whipped around her head. Kim stared on as Rikshasha explained that the child has a mapping ability. Whatever she sees with her eyes gets mapped out. It was an okay ability, but it wasn't useful to him in the least. Yun Hui reached up and grasped Kim's cloak. Dungeon baby, Yun Hui, has shared her sight with you. Yun Hui's location will always be shown on the map from now on. Dungeon baby Yun Hui's map will always be synced with your map. Looking at his updated map, Kim realized that the map's detail had drastically increased. I'm going to assume she's not able to share her previous map experiences. Rikshasha had only observed the ability being able to record during activation. It was a shame, for if it kept all of her knowledge, it would have been a true treasure. But even still, in his eyes, she had just become a useful member of the Naga Labyrinth. Their labyrinth was decades behind the others on locational knowledge of the geyser. Heck, they lacked even a detailed map of their current surroundings. Yunui's ability would soon put an end to that, and her ability could be used endlessly seeing as how it didn't seem to tax her. Yunhui was added to the expedition team. It was probably for the best, seeing as how he promised to take care of her himself. Dominic's motherly instincts kicked into full gear. Her baby was going to be put into harm's way, and the vampire promising to do her best to take care of her did nothing to reassure her. Kim had no plans of this taking hours to get underway as if it was a family trip. He ordered them to get ready immediately. Her injuries haven't healed yet. What about her food? Honey, if at any time you're not feeling well, you're to immediately tell Master. All right, you can't speak. You're going to have to do your best using your body language you understand. Dominique did everything she could to baby her. She combed out her hair, washed her face. As Kim watched on in annoyance, he ordered Dominique to prepare meals for at least two. It wouldn't take them long to depart the ninth floor, seeing as how the entrance to the upper floors was close to the labyrinth of gluttony. The news of his inclusion in the expedition put Uther in a sour mood. Kim was surprised. They had been traveling for over two days and haven't had any contact with a living creature. Explain to me exactly why this bloodsucker is staring at us. She explained it was the perks of traveling with two labyrinth owners and a beautiful vampire. She knew of no creatures who would dare look in their direction. Besides, the beast probably perceives your minion as a legion all by himself. Uther was insistent on not allowing the vampire a free pass to join the club of people who could pick on him. He was no one's minion. 
He mumbled under his breath how much distaste he had for the vampire. It hadn't been a single day since the end of the auction, and she thinks she can order him around. On top of that she never announces herself when she enters his labyrinth. Kim didn't understand why he was so upset. So Yutha let him have some also. This was his third expedition in a row, and he was yet to see an adequate break. He had only gotten one full day of rest. A true hikikomori needed to rest for at least a year between expeditions. Kim assured Yutha that if he did a good job as the scout, he wouldn't have to exert much energy. But his days of resting for years in between expeditions were over. Yutha doubted he would get any rest any time soon. If he knew the necromancer king, they would be facing trouble from his direction any day now. After two short days of marching, they reached the entrance to the eighth floor. They decided to rush through to allow the guards who were obviously hiding from their presence to return to their job. Geyser eighth floor. Kim couldn't get over the feeling he received when passing through the passages between two floors. They felt like the only true safe zones in all of the underworld. He turned around to catch Uther, struggling to pull himself onto the eighth floor. In all his life, he had never left the ninth floor. And he could feel it. Kim was disappointed in the labyrinth owner. Angela came to the glutton's rescue. What he was experiencing wasn't abnormal. It was rare for a labyrinth owner to leave the floor they were born on. The farther they get from their labyrinth, the weaker they become. Each floor zaps about 20% of their stamina away as they travel further and further abroad. Kim couldn't believe such a thing was real. But the vampire explained that it's the reason why the humans won the Great War. If the deeper floor owners could have joined the battle at their full strength, the humans would have been destroyed. The humans' biggest oppositions were beasts from the upper and middle floors. Kim had heard of the destruction the lower floor beasts wrought when they joined the battle. Uther argued that the vampire wasn't even there, so what right does she have to include herself in the hypothetical destructive force the lower floors could have brought? But after all, there weren't dungeon babies, so Kim wasn't sure exactly how strong such beasts even were. They got back to the important topic of how Yutha was going to be more useless the higher they went. As the vampire, Angela wouldn't be affected. As long as she was near her master, she would be in peak form. This set Yutha off. His color started to lean towards red instead of green. A mosquito like you can't even freely go to other territories without an invitation from your master. And forget crossing water. You will be stuck at the side of a pond. The vampire had truly struck a nerve. She didn't feel any of that was relevant when she had no plans of leaving her master's side. And if she wanted to, she could just fly over water. Uther began shouting mosquito pervert over and over. But Angela wasn't worried about the words of a little Haribo. Kim regretted bringing these children along. They had a schedule to keep, so he ordered the two to cut the chit-chat. And seeing as how entrances typically had guards, it was probably best they move along. This caught the attention of the two scouts, and they informed him that they had already been surrounded. Uther agreed, believing there to be at least fifty of them. He didn't know why he stuck himself with the two scouts that weren't capable of accomplishing their one job. He ordered Uther to go hide and to take Yunhui with him. He had no problem complying to such an order. Hiding was what he was best at. He turned to pure slime and snatched the little one up, giving Kim a fright in the process. He didn't know what the hell this fool was doing, but Uther insisted that she will be fine. He was going to make her air holes, and he turned his acidity level down to the lowest. He wasted no time perfecting his camouflage, Kim was impressed, and Angela thought the camouflage was perfect for a lazy little kid. Kim ordered Angela to get into his shadow. Time was short. They needed to get into their camouflage. Special skill camouflage has been activated. Vampire Angela's skill has been partially shared. Camouflage skill has been reinforced into invisible. Invisible. Stronger version of camouflage, even the sound of a heartbeat, and other traces will completely vanish. Whatever guarded the eighth floor was marching in their direction. A group of beast oinkers stopped in the exact spot. Kim was just standing. The biggest one sniffed the air. Something definitely oink came up from the ninth floor oink. 
the pig stared around, confused by where the intruders had gotten to. With a nickname like King Nose, it would be embarrassing if he couldn't sniff out even the best hiders. He wasted no time putting his talent to work. And just as he suspected, he smelled the ninth floor on them. The intruders were still here. He ordered everyone to hunt. For tonight the oinkers would feast. Angela knew Kim had no idea of the functions that were available to them when she hid in his shadow. So she passed the thought telepathically to him, hoping he wouldn't be startled. All he had to do was try to talk to her in his head and she would hear it. It wasn't too difficult, so Kim caught on quickly. It seems that even though they're incredibly stupid, their nose allows them to pierce our veil. But lucky for us, they have a little bit of intelligence. The two big ones being led by their noses are most likely the commanders. It turned out that this was another stroke of luck in their favor. Kim had no intentions of manually searching the whole eighth floor for the entrance to the seventh. Angela informed him that his aristocratic authority could be useful in this situation. All he needed was his seal. He never took it off, but he found that sometimes it found a way to vanish from his person. Angela assured him that the seals tended to act that way. But it would appear as soon as he needed it. The plan was simple. Kim whispered in the commander's ear. If you spot a living being you can communicate with, you should guide the way. The commander was surprised by the presence of the human, shying away as it approached him. Humans have too little meat, but they taste really good. The best way to eat them is to grind them all up, bones and all. The commander couldn't wait to have his little treat. He casted earth magic, pulling stone from the ground. With all his might, he attempted to crush the weak human. He finished off his spell, eagerly anticipating the human slurry he was about to enjoy. They could all see the shadow that remained as the dust from the earth cleared away. The parasite's flood dragon armor had easily protected him. But he had no idea why the aristocrat's seal didn't work seeing as how it appeared when you wanted it to. Angela knew her great master had taken the hit intentionally. Kim was impressed that she had figured him out. As he struck a frightening pose, the pig who was obviously a mage prepared his second attack. He cast the spell Mother Earth, trying to draw much more earth than he had drawn the first time. Kim planted his knee firmly between the pig's eyes knocking him out cold. It was foolish to attack an enemy before you gauged his strength. Baron's exclusive skill, low aristocratic authority, has been activated. Kim really enjoyed pork, so it was difficult for him to make the decision to forgive all of them. He introduced himself as the master of Naga, and the Baron Kim Jin Wu of the Geyser. He gave the swine a single chance to yield to his authority. They chose not to waste the mercy they were being shown. The full group of pigs forced their faces into the ground. King Nose insisted he just smelled things. Yunhui's body language screamed that she detested being stuck inside the slime. As Uther did his best to recover as many gluttons as he could. The pigs were his honor guards. They shouted his praise as they led him to their labyrinth. You fools, make way, the baron is coming through. Yeah, and also make way for his honorable knights. The whole time Uther was eating this up. This was exactly how a king should be treated. The commander pig grabbed up one of his underlings insisting he wasn't putting his best foot forward in front of the baron. He would bet that the young pig had no idea what a baron was. For how could it when he, the commander, had no idea either? The way they were acting, you would believe they were soldiers of the Naga army. Angela the vampire was all in her ego again. Believe in the pigs were staring at her amazing form. To her, it was just creepy. I don't have blood. I'm skinny. The other one insisted he had a cold. She had no interest in taking blood from such greasy swine. All of them could get over themselves. Kim was sure they were more afraid of her than they was of him. Just staring at them made her nauseous. There was a rumor among her kind that pigs were good eatings. Wherever you found them, they would be plentiful. And their blood tasted fine if you could get over all the cholesterol. As much trauma as they're showing at my mere presence, I would say they have ancestral memories of my kind feasting upon their ranks. There really was a lot of them. So much so that Angela was starting to gain interest in the mere possibilities such numbers would allow. 
Kim was right there with her, they would hardly miss a few hundred of these pork rinds. If he put them in his farm, it would solve the Naga's food problem indefinitely. His good mood was ruined by something large headed in his direction through the sea of pigs. Angela attempted to warn him, but he had sensed it the moment it appeared. Uther was right there with his new admirers rushing for safety as the giant boar of a labyrinth owner headed in their direction. He had sent them out to return with food. But instead they were throwing a parade for what should be their meal. Kim was impressed. The boar was stronger than he expected an eighth-floor king to be. But king, he's a baron. And he has our greatest enemy, the vampire with him. Kim wasn't going to play around with this creature. It had at least one-eighth of the flood dragon king's strength. He casually flashed his ring in the boar's direction. Baron's exclusive skill. Low aristocratic authority. Has been activated. Big Tusk Boar Tribe's chief has resisted the authority of the seal. Sweat started to pop out all over the boar's head. He had felt the presence of the aristocratic seal. And he knew it well. Failed to completely resist. The chief is a bit intimidated. His tone quickly changed. He greeted them with the respect their position held. It's our honor to be graced by the presence of an aristocrat. And you brought that bioweapon of a vampire with you how great. This is the first I ever heard of aristocrat traveling beyond their floor. The Boar King was afraid it had come to thin out his kind. But Kim insisted they were only passing through. The eighth floor was only a pit stop on their way to the seventh floor. Seeing as how it was his first time traveling through the eighth floor, Kim had convinced the Boar's subordinates to guide him there. The Boar was surprised to hear that he was headed straight for the seventh floor for his labyrinth was in the opposite direction of the entrance Kim was seeking. Both their heads slowly turned towards the two commanders. They insisted they had no idea where it was located, so they felt it was best to seek the assistance of their chief. As the two pigs received punishment for their actions, Kim shook his head because truly, it was his fault for thinking simple pigs could be useful. The king pig wondered what interest they had in the seventh floor. But Kim felt the boar shouldn't mind his personal business. The boar was sure that the baron didn't understand the plight that was taking place on the seventh floor at this very moment. And after all, this was Kim's first time here so how would he know? Can you tell me how to get to the seventh floor or not? What if I told you I couldn't permit you to go there? Seeing as how Kim didn't play around when it came to conversations, he readied himself for battle. Are you saying you intend to stop me? The giant boar had never met such an impatient person. He wasn't saying he was intending to stop the baron. It was more the fact that the eighth floor was currently in chaos. For war had broke out across the entire eighth floor. If Kim were to leave there without a plan, there's a high chance that he would get stuck in the middle of multiple forces at war. The king boar was sure that even for an aristocrat, that would be an unpleasant experience. Kim was in a rush. He would have to risk it. Luckily, his host knew a method. If he joined the battle, the distraction would allow Kim to pass through unmolested. For it's not often that a labyrinth owner joins in on all the fun. Kim wondered if the boar would truly do that for an aristocrat he had only just met. The pig king assured him he would. But only on one condition. When you're done with whatever your private business is on the seventh floor, you'll offer me your aid upon your return. The commanders led their king to the place where most of the fighting took place. Every other day, a war of attrition would take place at this very spot. The war made no sense to the commanders. But the scarlet lions from the seventh floor and the striped wasps could really go at it. The king couldn't believe the striped wasps were struggling against seventh floor beasts. They must be truly past their prime. He inquired with his commanders about the news from the lookouts on the eighth floor. The oink he received in reply didn't sit well with him. The two fought over whose job it was to remember what news the lookout had passed on to them. The king knew exactly who to blame for this. The fault lied with him alone. He knew better than to allow these two to handle anything semi-important. He gave them orders that they couldn't mistake. They were to head back to the labyrinth and fortify the place. His force was to be put on full alert until he returned. You could never be too careful. 
In his absence, there was sure to be someone looking for an opportunity to gain a come up. The task he had to do was best done alone. There was no need for him to sacrifice the lives of his pigs. His commanders warned him that the reports they received implied that might not be wise. The Scarlet Lion Marcus himself regularly made appearances on the battlefield. The king wondered if his commanders really believed he had to worry about that seventh floor loser. He ordered them back to the labyrinth. He would return as soon as he made his rounds. He watched them over his shoulder to make sure they obeyed his orders. He didn't need them getting in his way. It had been so long since he was free to do as he wished on the battlefield. You didn't get an opportunity like this often, so he was going to be sure to let loose. As he started his warm-up, King Nose was worried for their chief. But the other commander reminded him that their chief was invincible once he got started. Yeah, once he gets going, no one can stop him. And after all, their chief was the famous charging Okinotasai. Team Naga knew exactly when the charging boar started up. They were over a half a day's journey from his location and could still easily pick out the vibrations he was making. Yutha was glad he was nowhere near such a monster. Kim inquired with Angela whether or not the distraction was working. She replied that the big oinker was successful. All the beasts in this area are headed in his direction. There was a high chance that beast as far out as two days would be attracted to commotion the pig king was making. The scene that awaits us is going to be bloody indeed. There was no time to waste. They had a long way to travel to get to the entrance of the seventh floor in time. Three days later. Entrance to Geyser's seventh floor. Kim needed Uther to make sure Yunhui was kept safe if they had any chance of getting out of this mess. He was doing his best but he was running out of his gluttons faster than he could swallow them down again. A beast punched through him and instantly went for the tasty treat that was Yunhui. Uther screamed her name. And the little one activated her powers. And like a veteran warrior, she pierced her enemy with her bare hand. And just like that, she was back to her normal self. Only now her hand was covered in blood. Kim had no idea how he forgot that Yunhui was a dungeon baby from the eleventh floor. But just because she was from a deeper floor didn't mean she knew how to fight. He needed to find out what she was capable of. Yunhui, can you fight? He lent her his weapon and asked her to show him what she could do. She activated her powers and rushed off to accomplish the goals she was given by her master. She was definitely used to fighting meaning that she was being used as a soldier. But there was a chance that she was just talented, so he ordered Uther to watch over her as she fought. As a gorilla chewed on his head Uther was upset that she never even needed his help. If you get attacked it's fine, but she can't easily recover from a strike. Be her shield if you must. Uther didn't believe what he was hearing. This was simply discrimination. He was using up way too many glutton pieces as it was and he wasn't being dramatic. Seeing as how Yunhui could handle this area, Kim left to check up on Angela. The destruction she caused was on a whole nother level. With the attack from her fan, she cut open the beast. And as a vampire, she wouldn't let a drop of the nasty, precious fluid go to waste. It wasn't good for drinking, so it could at least be good for attacking. A single drop of blood splashed onto her glove as she cast her attack to devastating effect. Curiosity got the best of her, and she decided to have a taste. It wasn't a good decision. She spat it out, looking like a fool right in front of her master. He requested a situational update. She replied that they were all over, but she believed they would be over soon. She had killed over half of them. But Kim knew the other half was still a tiresome number. Angela insisted there were a little less than two hundred of them left. That many creatures added up to a full war. And those simple pigs thought their floor was at war. With the blood being so thick in the air, there was no chance of them just sneaking off. Angela could solve the problem quickly, but it would leave her in a bind. She could use all her remaining energy. But if she did that, he would need to replace it. Kim couldn't believe at a time like this she was plotting to get more of his blood. She insisted she was being sincere. Her only source of power comes from him. And since she only received one cup of blood, she had been using it sparingly. 
Kim permitted her to attack. He promised to resupply her with two cups of blood when this was all over. The pervert in her was activated. She would do her best to show him she was worthy of his donation. She would throw a festival of blood for her master to witness. A beautiful rose rose above her as the creatures all were sucked into her vortex. At that moment somewhere in Giza a battle between two kings was commencing. A few minutes later, Angela's attack had cleared away all their foes, leaving her anemic in the process. Kim knew she was of legendary status, but the destruction she had created could only be referred to as a massacre, and she was able to accomplish this with less than a single cup of blood. Now that it was over, Angela begged him to keep his promise. He would give it to her as soon as he made sure it was all clear. He found Uther in a puddle of his own gook. He looked fine to Kim, so he headed on to look for his other charge. As soon as he reached her, he began to panic. Before his eyes, the ground consumed her. He only had a split second of shock and he lit up. With all the speed he could muster, he shot towards her. But the moment he arrived the ground sealed itself up. Uther was right behind him. Nothing would take his little one away. Before Kim could get the order for him to dig her up out of his mouth, Uther was already beginning the process. He was furious at Angela. She had insisted that there was no signs of life. But clearly an unknown mage had just attacked them. But Angela calmly stood by her belief that there were no signs of life around. Uther broke up their argument. Yunhui was nowhere to be found. Kim insisted he not waste time and continue digging. But he wasn't understanding Uther. There was not a single trace of her anywhere. It was like the geyser had just swallowed her up. Ice flowed through his veins as those words triggered a traumatic memory inside of Kim. His rage washed away. Could it be? The labyrinth? The map has updated. The map has updated. The map has updated. Kim hurriedly pulled up his map. Angela was coming to the understanding that the little one had received the labyrinth call. But Kim silenced her as he scrolled through his map. Parts of the map he had never been to was being unveiled. It was highly likely due to Yunyui's mapmaking ability. She was moving so fast it would take them days to catch up. When he originally received the call he was taken all the way to the ninth floor in an instant. Based on her trajectory, he knew exactly where she was. He swiped his map to where he believed she would be. She had indeed received the call of the labyrinth. The group had to move at top speed to reach her as fast as possible. Activate special ability invisible. Uther screamed for his life as Kim sped through the underground. He was holding on for dear life. But all the noise he was making was negating the purpose of invisibility. He couldn't help it. They were moving too fast. Angela didn't understand how he had found Yunhui so fast. But it was thanks to the little one's ability. Without it, they would have lost her forever. She had made giant strides since being in their care. And as the days went by, she became more useful to the Naga Labyrinth. But she hadn't overcome her doll state. She still couldn't eat unless she was ordered to. If they didn't get to her in time, she would starve to death. Angela warned of multiple living creatures ahead. But they weren't beasts. It was a group of humans. Since they started after Yunhui they had been running into more humans than they did beasts. Such a thing was truly unnatural for the seventh floor. Kim was so preoccupied with recovering his charge that he forgot why he was here in the first place. The humans were in search of an empty labyrinth to make their own. Angela reported that she detected hundreds of living beings in that direction. Kim now understood what was causing the chaos on the 7th and 8th floor. Humans were disrupting the natural order of things in the geyser. He decided to do some reconnaissance before they moved on. It seemed the humans had found the entrance to an empty labyrinth. A large crowd was congregating out front. But it wasn't a peaceful crowd. If things kept on as it was a riot would break out. The association was doing what the association does. Holding the people down. It seemed every one there was interested in becoming the owner of the labyrinth. Angela thought the humans were off their rockers. You couldn't become an owner of a labyrinth just because you wanted to. 
Kim explained that his people had no idea how the labyrinths worked. A familiar face was asserting his dominance over the crowd of explorers. You fuckers came here late and still want to get a slice of the pie. This labyrinth is under the jurisdiction of the association. So, you all can just bugger off. This had to be the labyrinth that old man Beck was referring to. Seeing as how the freelance explorers and the association weren't on good terms. Kim knew exactly the outcome of this situation. At the moment, this wasn't their priority. He decided to mark it on the map and they'd come back later. Yunhui needed them immediately. Now if that's not a glutton I could get behind. Angela sensed a familiar life sign that could only be Yunhui. The whole group stared up at the labyrinth that lay before them. Because it had been hidden so well, they doubted humans could easily find it. If labyrinths chose masters that suited them, then the little one fit this place perfectly. Kim reassured them that he understood that it was a little creepy, but they had to go in anyway. Uther didn't think it was only creepy. It was also ugly. As they entered, Kim warned them that this labyrinth was alive despite not having an owner. It didn't see them as friends, they were unwanted guests. Kim had been endlessly walking, never reaching his destination. He was beginning to lose track of time. No matter how far he walked, he never noticed anything different. He had no idea why there was nothing protecting this place. A living labyrinth should have beasts roaming around at the very least. He couldn't shake the feeling that he knew exactly where he was. He didn't know if this was even the inside of a labyrinth. Kim decided that he'd better see if Angela still sensed Yunhui. But as he turned around, he realized that he was alone. He searched around frantically, screaming Uther and Angela's name. But it was no use. All the time he was walking, he hadn't sensed anything abnormal. Kim didn't even know if he was truly inside of a labyrinth. He had no choice but to make his way back to the entrance and start over. He called up his map. But nothing happened. He began screaming, each of his skills and kind. Map. Parasite. Hardening. Camouflage. All his skills have been taken from him. There was no way a labyrinth on the seventh floor without an owner had the ability to restrict his abilities. A human explorer appeared, asking him had he gone insane? He had no idea who this was, and when he asked, the guy just stared at him. The human explorer was truly worried about him. If he loses his mind in a place like this, he would only get eaten by the beast. If he wanted to goof around, the human had no problem with that, but he should do it on his own time and quietly. Otherwise, they would attract unwanted attention. And if only one of them was caught slacking, they were all done for. The human who seemed to be his friend did his best to get his attention. He didn't need his charge, losing his mind. You had to be sharp to survive down here. Kim guessed that he had been dreaming. He had become the owner of a labyrinth. And no, he didn't grow a bunch of legs and arms like the hell spiders. But he did have a parasite which could do all kinds of miraculous things. The man wondered if he had become ripped in his dreams. But Kim only remembered becoming taller, kinda like his friend here. That sounds like a nice dream indeed. Kim couldn't believe that all of that was just a dream. The next time you get that tired, you let me know and I'll stand guard over you while you sleep. Kim was the hardest worker in their group. It wasn't like any of them would get upset if he took a break. No, all of them wanted him to take a break more often. They didn't need him passing out like he did today. You didn't truly forget about me, did you? Your team leader, Kim Jin Woo. Good. I'm so happy you remembered. But the only problem is you're a fake. His team leader yanked him up by the jaw. There was no way he was fully awake yet. The imagination on this kid would only get him in trouble. But that imagination was one of the reasons why he was adored by all his fellow workers. The whole bunch showed up. The leader, Kim Jin Woo, was furious. If they were all caught slacking off like this, nothing would stop their masters from killing them all. The group insisted that it was simple. They just needed to avoid getting caught. This little one's story today was the funniest thing I've heard in a while. Well, of course. He's our storyteller after all. Oh, oh, you have to retell it. I want to hear it too. 
The story was so good they could easily turn it into a manhwa. Do you really think we have the time to read a whole manhwa? What are you talking about? I'm just asking for a recap of it, that's all. You're going to recap the whole thing. And you're our chatterbox, so don't skip any parts. Start at chapter 1. Even though Kim knew it was all fake, he hadn't been this happy in a long time. He smiled as he thought of himself as chatterbox. No matter how many times I tell you, you insist on it being your name. It's only your nickname. But you did want a name for a long time, didn't you? Park hyung -ti. You're a Korean idol who's been all over the world before ending up down here. All the stories you told me made me dream about the world above. You sure can embarrass a man. Your compliment skills have improved drastically since we first met. Your entire body exploded when the war broke out. Chatterbox, what are you talking about? Baker Jong Tae Su, who promised to bake me the best bread in the world. It was sad when the war broke out and you melted from the poison fog. An army sergeant Lee Jiziak. You made a brave sacrifice you became the ultimate decoy to lead them all away, but eventually they caught you and crushed you to death. And technician Lee Jiwon. To this day, I've never seen a bigger mess. You were chopped to pieces by a trap while attempting to open an escape route. Kim continued, slaughtering his memories one after the other. He went on until it was just him and leader Kim Jin Woo remaining. Lastly, reporter Kim Jin Woo, you suffered from a fatal abdominal injury. You died as I held you in my arms. Your death taught me what death truly was a labyrinth that gets you lost in a happy illusion. Ironically, my happiest moments all happened shortly before all my friends perished, which also happens to be my most tragic memory. This labyrinth on the seventh floor had just crossed the line. Uther slept away as he begged his mommy to give him five more minutes. Kim wasn't gentle with Uther's wake-up call, plunging his fist into the little big guy's face. Angela couldn't believe even her a vampire had fallen under the illusion of a seventh-floor labyrinth. Kim agreed, this place's hypnosis spell was truly powerful. As he made sure Uther was fully awake, a group of the labyrinth summons made their way slowly towards Kim's group. Seeing as how the first line of defense failed, it was time to escalate things. Luckily, the labyrinth had chosen not to deal with them when they were knocked out cold. Uther was still a few steps behind. But seeing as how Kim had all his faculties such creatures were easily dealt with. None of them were even above the soldier rank. Strength wasn't a primary focus of a labyrinth like this. It seemed to specialize in debuffs. Angela wondered if her master was going to destroy this place. Kim hadn't been very pleased when he woke up from his happy nightmare. But in the short time since he had come to his senses he had calmed down. He wasn't some tyrant going around destroying everything he could. Anyway, he didn't want to hear his black merchant's mouth if he kept going around destroying everything in his path. Uther was sure his baron had hesitated a bit too long when asked that question. They needed to find their little one, then they could decide what to do next. The poor clowns were strewn all over the hallway. The labyrinth was a hot mess. It had focused too much on its hypnosis skill. Its mobs were weak and it was terrible at placing traps. It didn't take them long for them to reach the location where their little one was. Angela could sense her. But she had no idea how to get past the wall. It seemed pretty thick. Kim had been trapped in his Naga labyrinth in the very same way. The labyrinth wouldn't let her out until Yun Wee had become its owner. It just meant he had to use a little force to open this place up a little. He was fully relieved to see she was safe and sound. Everything was so similar to when he became the owner of the Naga Labyrinth. He was pretty sure she hadn't moved an inch since she was deposited in this room. He had to get her to accept the labyrinth. She had to make it hers. As he stared down at her, the room begins to change. A carnival display spread out before their very eyes. There were games, balloons, and surprises. The whole display was just so flamboyant. A labyrinth built off of carnivals. Yungvi seemed to be handling the situation to the best of her abilities. So far everything was going smoothly. He explained to her that she should see a semi-transparent window in front of her eyes. 
All she needed to do was press yes to start the synchronization. Just like a doll. She tentatively reached up and did as she was told. The labyrinth lit up with activity, startling Uther. Registering Yunhui as the owner of the labyrinth of madness, delight, and festivals filled with dreamlike joy. Oh boy, it has a long name indeed. Reconstructing the labyrinth according to the labyrinth owner's synchronized data. The room peeled away before their very eyes. Kim knew a gate had been added and the synchronization was over. All she needed now was a little energy. And the labyrinth would repair and upgrade over the next twenty-four hours. There was only one more step for him to make. Kim needed to make Yunhui his second night. She did as she was told and instantly signed his contract. Forgetting that she couldn't talk, he proceeded to convince her to say the words portal. He sat there saying portal over and over in different ways, but she remained mute. Dominique and the crew stared at Kim's back. Without the portal, it would make this place impossible to defend. He might have just wasted all their time. After a little while, she figured the coast was clear. So, she headed through the portal, eager to see her master. He was surprised, but pleased that his portal had opened up instead. Even if he didn't intend it to. Hoyle wasted no time wrapping herself around him. Being the cutest little creature he had ever seen. Dominique was so proud of her daughter for becoming the owner of a labyrinth on the seventh floor. The nostalgia hit them all so hard. There was once a time when the Naga Labyrinth was this small also. Dominique truly didn't understand that the Naga Labyrinth only started growing after she showed up. The purpose of this trip was finally complete and Yutha was getting a little anemic. He ordered Dominique to have Hoya and Draken to guard this place. He would have Uther and Yunhui head home to the Naga Labyrinth. But him and Angela had business to take care of before they could wrap his trip up. At his words, Angela's perverse side came out in full force. If she didn't watch herself, he would restrict her blood access until she straightened up. Draken and Hoya had plenty of time on their hands as they hung out in the Naga Labyrinth's new territory. The two made it back to the crowd of humans as someone had decided to take control of the situation. But Kim couldn't be bothered with the ramblings of these people. The two would sneak in and handle their business. Kim could hear every conversation the groups of humans were having as he slowly snuck into the encampment. It's the same old, same old. The association is the big bad guys trying to take over everything. The situation here hadn't changed in the least since he was here last. All that was happening was the association's reputation was falling through the floor. Kim was paying too much attention to the ramblings of the freelancers. And hadn't noticed the doofus was standing right in front of him. He alerted everyone that there was something dark among them. There was someone in this group who had a weak detection ability. Luckily, all they could sense was his existence and nothing else. Kim knew that among humans, stealth-type abilities were ultra-rare and all of these humans were assuming that there was a beast nearby. Angela figured that such a situation would allow her to get a free meal or two. But Kim wouldn't have any of that. They could just pass through this group. And head into the labyrinth. All they needed was a little distraction. Their plan worked perfectly. The crowd was in shambles at the fear of a floor seven stealth beast. A little touch here and a little touch there, and Kim was instilling fear into the mix. The douchebag on the inside heard the commotion and wondered what was going on with this crowd. He ordered his men to make sure no one entered the labyrinth. He was going to go check it out. He couldn't stand these ungrateful explorers. None of them knew their place. They were so blinded by money that none of them was grateful for everything that the association had done for them. He would shut them up even if he had to beat the living crap out of all of them. His two soldiers had no idea what they were guarding. All they could see was a room built of stone. If they didn't know what they was looking for, how could they investigate? Neither one could comprehend how complicated a labyrinth truly was. One believed he was searching for a lost ark, while the other believed there was some kind of ancient magic interface around. Kim couldn't help but input his two cents into their argument before he dealt with the two association explorers. Angela was taken aback by the ruthlessness of her new master towards the two humans. Kim knew the vampire didn't understand, 
that Yumhui had nothing in common with the trash on the floor. Angela had her doubts about whether this labyrinth was actually alive. The owner's room had been so easily accessible with no traps or mazes to be seen. The lack of a core structure was a sure sign that the lights were on, but no one was home. But Kim thought otherwise, if he had to put money on it he would guess that this labyrinth had deleveled sometime after the labyrinth core had formed. The labyrinth seemed to be in stealth mode, everything nice and neat and tucked away. Activating Parasite Ability Detection As he expected, the labyrinth wasn't capable of hiding its core from the all-seeing gaze of the parasite. You have found the labyrinth core. This activity has been paused due to the lack of an owner. It will not be activated until a new owner is found. Kim reached towards the core, only to have it reject him. But he expected nothing less. The ownerless labyrinth has rejected the imprinting. Imprint failed. He explained to Angela that the labyrinth still had its core. If they left it alone one day, it would most certainly become a functioning labyrinth again. She took this to mean that one of the humans had a possibility of becoming the labyrinth owner. Having a human become an owner of a labyrinth wasn't high on the list of things he cared for. The chances of him stopping such an occurrence weren't very good, now that the floodgates had been opened. One day humans would get a foothold in the labyrinth, which will most certainly lead to chaos above and below ground. But that day wasn't going to be today. Attempting to forcefully extract the inactive labyrinth core. The labyrinth is resisting strongly. The forceful extraction of the core caught the attention of all the bickering humans outside. The hostile attack against the core was unstabilizing the labyrinth. The douchebag could sense that the labyrinth was in danger. He gathered to gather the rest of the associates, and they rushed towards the owner's room. Angela was aware of the blood bags the moment they moved in her direction. He ordered her to get into his shadow. There was no way he would give up until he ripped this core from its foundation. He forced his will upon the labyrinth and insisted that its destiny would be the same regardless of whether it chose a human or a beast as its owner. Sometimes in life, you just draw the bad card. So instead of the labyrinth wasting its time with a human, Kim was going to put its resources to use himself. The battle between the two came to an end as Kim wrapped his fist around his goal and promised to use it well. You have succeeded in forcefully extracting the labyrinth core. As the group of humans made their way into the owner's room worried for the safety of their two comrades that was left behind, they came to a sudden stop as sweat ran down their face. Fear was evident as they stared at a giant creature straight out of a tortured soul's nightmare. The creature wasted no time attacking the associate explorers, causing the group to retreat from the labyrinth in an attempt to save their lives. The monstrosity moved like a virus intent on consuming any and all life forms it came in contact with. It consumed all of the humans before they had a chance to retreat from the labyrinth. The crowd outside watched on not sure what to expect but the screams they heard chilled them to the core. As the entrance of the labyrinth was obstructed from view, all of the humans were tossed out into the open. The flame-haired loser ordered everyone to get into positions. If the non-associate explorers didn't want to perish this day, they would follow his lead. The monster easily gave him the slip, only for the others to quickly point it out. The creature hovered over a hole as it glared at the humans, eventually retreating from sight. None of this made any sense. There was no way that beast was scared of them. They chose to take the blessing they were given and allowed the beast to run away with its tail between its legs. It wasn't like they would be able to kill something so giant and ancient anyway. The flame-haired coward ordered a head count to be performed. Once they understood their losses, they will be heading back to the surface. This didn't sit well with everyone, but as the leader, he explained that they had been marked by a monster and there was no way to own a labyrinth if they were all dead. Kim heaved and coughed as he lost his last meal onto the cavern's floor. The mass he had been controlling only moments before sleuthed away as the parasite entered a dormant state. Angela was worried for her master. She had never in her life witnessed anything similar to the spectacle that was just put on display. As Kim caught his breath, he regretted the amount of mass he chose to create out of nothing. He truthfully didn't think it would take such a toll on his body. As the vampire continued to stir on, 
he explained that the creature he had become was nothing more than a trick to deceive the humans. She could think of it as nothing more than an inflated balloon of which he controlled the strings. The last thing he wanted was for that group to find out he was also human. But everything had worked out fine as he obtained the core of a second labyrinth. There was no way he would be wasting credits as he did with the Flood Dragon's core. Instead, he would be handing it over to the research lab to see what use they can make of it. Before the two could head back to the labyrinth, there were still a few things they needed to take care of. On the top of the list was a promise from the eighth floor he needed to make good on. Eighth floor. Big Tusk Boar Tribe. Upon his arrival, the two dim-witted lieutenants greeted him. Insisting while they had only been apart for a few days, Kim's muscle mass had increased. The other argued that the baron had nowhere near as much muscle mass as he did. But he was quickly corrected. There was no muscle on him whatsoever. Only fat. This wasn't a social trip. Kim wasn't here to chit-chat. When he mentioned their chief, the look the two gave was telling. The condition of the leader wasn't good in the least. He was so down on his luck that either of them could take him out with a single hit. After his rampage across the zone, he had run into none other than the Scarlet Lion, Marcus himself. By the end of the confrontation, they both had been reduced to nothing more than bags of flesh. Despite the penalties that had been imposed on the Scarlet Lion, the confrontation ended in a draw. The other lieutenant argued that the Scarlet Lion had no penalties. Kim insisted he explain further. There would be no penalties as the Lion guys had all moved to this zone. The other agreed that it made sense. We found out that the reason why the eighth floor was in such an uproar was because the Scarlet Lions were carving out a territory of their very own. None of it made any sense. What would force someone to look for a new home in a deeper part of the labyrinth? The two pigs wondered the same thing, so they looked for answers directly from the source. They were told that a bunch of bugs had invaded the seventh floor causing it to be even more chaotic than the eighth. He should have been able to come up with the answers on his own. As most of his problems these days turned out to revolve around his fellow humans. The boss bore welcomed his return, attempting to stand to greet him. Kim insisted he remain seated. His condition was so bad it was almost making him feel bad for the creature. The boar insisted he was embarrassed to present himself to royalty in such a state. Kim got right down to business. He was here to pay for the assistance that had been rendered upon his group. Seeing as how it was his fault the leader was in such a state, he would give him the upper hand in negotiations. The boar didn't know there was such a thing as a generous aristocrat. Even as the words left his mouth, Kim knew he was putting himself in a bind. With the parasite inactive, he would be left in a perilous position if he was asked to destroy the Scarlet Lion. But right away, the giant boar threw out a request he hadn't even considered. He wanted to move to the ninth floor. He had no other choice but to get out of this place. His intentions were to leave the eighth floor behind and become a knight of the Baron. In his current condition, asking such a favor only made him look like a coward. He understood this, but regardless, this was the path he chose. Kim got down to business. He knew little about the chief and assumed it was the same in reverse. But in this case, his assumptions were wrong. He broke down all he knew about the baron. He was a human who had received the seal of an aristocrat, making him the first aristocrat above the abyss, and had easily taken out the flood dragon king Anaxtus, while he was still considered nothing more than a fledgling labyrinth, less than half a year old. Kim didn't mind the facts but when he strayed into the territory of flattery, that's where he drew the line. He ended the boar's rant impressed at how much information he had managed to obtain. Seeing as how the chief was well-versed in his exploits, Kim opened the floor for him to explain why he should take him on as a knight. He didn't open up on a strong foot, insisting his soldiers weren't able to function without his presence. There was no doubt each of them was missing at least a few screws. In all honesty, in the past— he was no different than any of them. But as he gave everything he had each and every day to protect the labyrinth, he slowly became someone to be feared. Looking back, he could only imagine how weak they must have looked to all the other creatures. At the time, no one had a problem using their labyrinth as nothing more than a food storage. 
He was forced to take the lead when it came to protecting his ilk. If it wasn't for his actions, they would have been easily eradicated from the eighth floor. After countless wars, things had finally begun to settle down around him. And he foolishly believed he would finally be able to get some rest. And now the scarlet lions of all people were pushing into his territory. He was truly just exhausted, sick and tired of it all. He had allowed Kim into his territory to see him in such a weak state because he had nothing but faith in the human aristocrat. And so far, his assumptions were right, seeing as how he was still breathing, when he could have been easily taken out. Angela and Kim thought over the circumstances. While the chief was in a terribly weak state, they knew he was one of the strongest among the eighth-floor labyrinth owners. The term veteran could easily fit the chief even in this sorry state. A veteran who had grown tired of the monotonous of war. His truthfulness had struck a chord with Kim. What was the chance that he would run across a labyrinth owner who was not full of himself? Because of this and the experience his army would gain, Kim decided to make the chief his third knight. He explained that times were tough even on the ninth floor, where the calls of war would soon be ignited. The chief knew this could only mean the necromancer king would soon be on the march. Kim was thrown off to find out that the chief was aware of the situation and was still willing to join him. And in the process, he learned some valuable information that the necromancer was always on the warpath for ingredients to bolster his forces with undead chimera. Kim informed him that once things had stabilized on the ninth floor, he would send the envoy to officially invite him into his holdings. With that, he concluded the meeting and turned to head home, ordering the chief to do his best to stay alive until the day came that he sent for him. The future for the chief was bright. Going forward he had no need to suffer this world alone anymore. Back at the down gem shop, Kim was getting the news of the going-ons in the labyrinth. He was sure they were bound to revolve around him. The old man was in a complete huff about a new creature that appeared in the empty labyrinth on the seventh floor. There are rumors that it's as strong as a labyrinth owner. He pulled out a mock-up that depicted the creature as a dead ringer for a spaghetti monster from hell. The creature alone was enough to make the association give up on controlling that labyrinth completely. Kim couldn't believe all this nonsense was spreading among the explorers. He slammed his face in his hand, amazed at how far humans would go to cover up their cowardice. Now that that was out of the way, the old man went right into asking him questions about his trip to the seventh floor, inquiring whether the trip had been worth his time. He informed the old man that becoming a labyrinth owner was an easy task, and that the labyrinth on the seventh floor was most definitely dead. The old man was disappointed. He had surely thought of all people Kim would have got something out of it. Kim reassured the old man that the trip wasn't a waste. He had picked up a sack full of the valuable assets that the gem seller dealt in. The sight of the gems made him a tiny bit appreciative, but he was still highly disappointed. He snapped back to business, informing Kim that people had been looking for him. He passed over their business card, and informed Kim that he believed they were called Geyser Development Agency or something like that. They were looking for his help on their next big project. None of this sat well with him. He was sure this organization was created by the government. It was highly likely it had something to do with humans becoming labyrinth owners. But for them to know so much about him was a bit unnerving. Being on the government's radar wasn't something he was interested in. He could only think of one person who could be the cause of all this. She was seriously going to make him regret ever joining her team. He tried to dig more information out of the old man but it turned out he knew nothing more than Kim had figured out on his own. Kim stared at the card for a moment, and then decided to turn it to ashes. He had too much going on in the geyser and didn't have time to complicate things any more than they already were. The old man stared on, impressed at the show. His reaction wasn't what Kim had expected. He explained he had nothing to gain from Kim getting involved with the government and Kim's decision worked out better for him as they were only trying to snatch away his customer. As usual, he promised to promptly transfer the money into Kim's account. As he left, the old man screamed at his back that it would be nice if he chose to keep his phone on once in a while. Synchronization between the labyrinth of madness, delight, and festivals filled with dreamlike joy and your second night, Yun Wei, is now complete. 
The second night, Yunhui is now officially a member of your party. The portal between the two labyrinths is now available for use. Draken was bored out of his mind, hoping he would be rescued soon. He had resorted to securing Hoya to the wall in an attempt to control the little beast. Just as he thought he was going to go insane, a portal cracked into existence right before his eyes. Kim stepped through, praising the dragon for succeeding in protecting this place. Even though he was sure the chances of someone finding this labyrinth were slim at best. Kim noticed the damage to the place and assumed Hoya had been doing Hoya things. But the cuteness tied to the wall was just too much for him to ever scold her for it. All the time Draken had spent in this labyrinth, and he hadn't had an ounce of action. And now he would have to share the intruders that were headed their way. Kim hurriedly calmed the dragon down. He was sure the commotion was caused by none other than the appearance of the labyrinth's workers. The sight of the cute bunnies was heavily nostalgic. As he stared at Yunhui, he realized he was going to have to give her a hand here. With a deliberate throat clearing, he captured the attention of all those in attendance. He decided since it had worked for him, there was no reason to change up the formula. He ordered them as the master of their master, to map out the labyrinth's vicinity, and to construct a storage space. The group of hooded bunnies stared at him for a moment, then went back to being a bunch of Bay Bay's kids. Kim flipped out and began to assault one of the little badass brats. While Angela was certainly enjoying the show, she decided to give her master a piece of advice. His aristocratic authority would allow him to set up a regency over this labyrinth. Seeing as how he already met all of the qualifications, it should be no problem for him to activate. He was an aristocrat, and the owner of this particular labyrinth was his knight. All he needed was for Yunghui to agree, and the contract would be formed. He would then have full control of the labyrinth, as if it was his own. He wasn't sure about this. If he was to push forward with such action, it would be the equivalent of stealing away Yunhui's labyrinth. If a similar situation were to happen to him, it would be nothing but an insult worse than death. In the end, he decided to leave the decision up to Yunhui. If she didn't agree, he wouldn't force her. She thought hard on the matter, and without uttering a word as usual. The owner of the labyrinth of madness, delight, and festivals filled with dreamlike joy, Yunhui, has agreed to the regency. Kim Jin Wu has become the labyrinth's substitute owner. All the sane bunnies' heads were forced against the ground, showing their full subservience whether they liked it or not. You have the power to summon both labyrinth's forces. Since you possess the Naga labyrinth, two knights, and one territory that you rule over as a regent, you have become a proper geyser aristocrat. Lowest aristocrat's dignity. Has advanced to low aristocrat dignity. That last piece of information wasn't something he was expecting. He never thought that increasing his number of knights and ruling over labyrinths as a regent would improve his aristocratic authority. But that little piece of information answered a lot of questions. It turned out Anatolius had a reason for his madness. Dominique did as she was told, and happily sacrificed all of the Naga Labyrinth's gems into the labyrinth of madness, delight, and festivals filled with dreamlike joy's altar. Kim knew he couldn't be here to protect this labyrinth all the time, so it was best if he made it self-sufficient. He would start by upgrading the labyrinth. And while he was at it, the Naga Labyrinth was overdue for an upgrade as well. Progressing with the upgrade of the Labyrinth of Festivals to rank 3, Minus 25 credits. 2 days, 23 hours, 59 minutes, and 58 seconds until the labyrinth upgrade is complete. Progressing with the upgrade of the Naga labyrinth to rank 6. Minus 200 credits. 13 days, 23 hours, 59 minutes, and 57 seconds until the labyrinth upgrade. There was a good chance the labyrinth of festivals would hit rank 4 before the Naga labyrinth upgrade was complete. He ordered the little brats to stop loitering about and to get to work. He expected the storage to be constructed as soon as possible. Unhappy that their vacation had been abruptly cut short, they half-heartedly went about doing his bidding. Now that that was settled, next up would be the organization of the labyrinth's military. Kim couldn't make heads or tails of how this labyrinth's military operated. All of the explanations were vague and silly. Clowns were labeled as fun. 
jugglers were labeled as cool, acrobats were labeled as entertaining, and minstrels were labeled as exciting. He couldn't believe how many types of forces were available to a rank two labyrinth. At that same point in his journey, he only had access to soldiers and servants. Dominique explained that each labyrinth had its own exclusive skills and traits. Kim assumed that the line he had glanced over before was the exclusive trait she was speaking of. Festival's excitement. This skill will be activated after the labyrinth's forces have defeated enough enemies. Current level zero. Level 1. Labyrinth of Festival Summons, speed increased by 20%. Defense decreased by 10%. Level 2. Labyrinth of Festival Summons, attack power increased by 20%. Defense decreased by 10%. Level 3. Labyrinth of Festival Summons, attack power increased by 20%. Defense decreased by 10%. Level 4. Labyrinth of Festival Soldiers, stats increased by 20%. Labyrinth of Festival Summons have their defense decreased by 10%. Level 5. Labyrinth of Festival Special Ability Sweet Dreams, shall be enhanced. The ability can be used once without any conditions. Labyrinth of Festival Summons have their defense decreased by 10%. At first glance, you would think this was good, but the amount of defense lost was astronomical. Going by the chart, in normal situations you would want to finish your battles before you exceed at level 2. The third level would be most useful in large fights. And the fourth would be reserved for wars. Kim was hit with a sudden realization. He stood up and dramatically ordered one of each force to be summoned. Labyrinth of Festivals, Minstrel Normal. Labyrinth of Festivals, Juggler Normal. Their weapons of choice was an instrument and a cluster of bombs. Next up is the Labyrinth of Festivals, Acrobat Normal, and the Labyrinth of Festivals, Clown Normal. These two dealt in the chakram and the daggers. Just as he suspected, they were all glass cannons, unable to fight in formation. He really hoped the last skill would tie this sad excuse for an army together. Sweet Dreams Delude the opponent into entering the abnormal sweet dream state. The opponent will be separated from reality, and wander inside a sweet dream. The amount of labyrinth energy spent will depend on the strength of the opponent. In order to activate the skill sweet dreams, a portal in the vicinity leading to the labyrinth of festivals or found within the labyrinth must be active. When casting sweet dreams on oneself, the skill will be substituted with escapism. This was the exact skill that had pissed Kim off. Such a skill would only be useful against very strong enemies, it made zero sense to use it during a war or against a group of enemies. This labyrinth was the exact opposite of the Flood Dragon Labyrinth. Where it focused fully on defense, this place focuses fully on offense. It was becoming clear why this place had been abandoned. Not many would have what it took to handle such a difficult labyrinth. But he wasn't one of those people. He was already figuring out how he could incorporate it into his strategy. This labyrinth style would suit guerrilla tactics perfectly. The Naga labyrinth would have to be used in situations that called for a traditional army. This labyrinth's exclusive skill made Kim a bit jealous. He turned to Dominique and inquired what exclusive skill the Naga labyrinth possessed. Sweat ran down her face as she explained they were a balanced type. The fact that he could summon all the basic military branches, each with amazing specs could count as a skill. Kim brushed her aside. It turned out the Naga Labyrinth didn't have a particular skill. But after all, simple was best. If he had started with this labyrinth, he would have been easily defeated by the Flood Dragons. If this labyrinth was going to be effective, he needed to know exactly what it was capable of. He ordered Yun Hui to cast Sweet Dreams on the Stupid Reptile. Labyrinth of Festival's owner Yun Hui is using Sweet Dreams against the Flood Dragon Labyrinth's Draconis Ortiga. There is not enough remaining labyrinth energy to use this skill. Required amount 423. Draken's Hero++ plus plus rating had to be the cause of this. In this case, it should be easy enough to solve. He ordered Draken, who was in the middle of being harassed by the little devil Hoya, to fully relax his body. Draken knew this wouldn't end well, he was always the first choice when it came to experimentation. 
but he had no choice as an order was an order. It only took a second for his rating to plummet through the floor. The new required amount was only twelve energy. You we wasted no time casting sweet dreams. Activating sweet dreams? Draken instantly became the successor of all dragons, intent on ruling over Geyser. His dreams left him a fearsome foe that anyone would think twice before willingly going to battle against. It wasn't that long ago when Kim himself was under the same effect. Seeing Draken in this state wasn't that big of a shocker. If he was going to see any kind of results, he would have to stack this labyrinth's abilities. So, he ordered the minstrel to use his skills against the dragon. The opponent is vulnerable at the moment. Performance success rate has increased. The difference in Draken was night and day. He had gone from being the greatest to the worst there ever was. This was the exact information Kim needed to allow him to properly operate such a difficult labyrinth. He ordered Dominique to inform Rikshasha that she needed to map out this entire area and hide this labyrinth to the best of her abilities. The labyrinth couldn't be exposed to any form of danger. And in a decision that I'm not sure was wise, he promoted the simplest worker of them all as the general manager. He would be tasked with relaying Dominique's orders to the others. But the look of surprise on the bunny's face may have shown his true hand. Kim needed to upgrade this labyrinth and bring it up to spec as soon as possible. With it, the scope of his war strategies would drastically increase. Two weeks later, Naga Labyrinth. Naga Labyrinth's upgrade to rank 6 is complete. The sub-core attached to the Flood Dragon's Labyrinth has unlocked its rank 6 functions. Labyrinth of Festival's upgrade to rank 4 is complete. You can now summon mixed forces between Naga and Flood Dragon. The maximum capacity of energy has increased. The labyrinth's territory has greatly expanded. Naga labyrinth owner Kim Jin Wu's physical capabilities have increased. Workers have been. Kim closed all the windows. None of this interested him. All he cared about was the added forces. Uther was constantly impressed with the Naga labyrinth. It was almost unrecognizable. He had rushed to his baron's holdings as fast as he could upon receiving the summons. Kim inquired whether the slime's two-week break had been enough for him to recover. Before he could open his mouth to make it perfectly clear that he needed at least half a year's time to fully recover, Kim informed him that they were headed to war. He was ordered to declare war against the labyrinth of the dead's owner. They would commence the attack in one week's time. Uther knew this had to be a joke at his expense. But his liege was serious, he wanted the envoy sent immediately. Uther concentrated hard as he let a loogie fly from his mouth. The slime landed on the floor with a satisfying plop. A tiny Uther fully ready for war popped up, ready to take the war to the necromancer king. Before Kim knew it, he had snatched up Uther thinking he was being rebellious, for hacking a loogie on his floor. But he quickly realized the little creature was a vicious thing intent on taking down the army of the dead on its own. Uther had no idea why his liege was employing such tactics. Why would anyone give their enemy a week to prepare instead of taking the advantage that came with an ambush? Before Kim could explain their strategy, he was interrupted by a frantic rikshasha. She was out of breath, and her words weren't making any sense. From what Kim could decipher, the necromancer king was on the march. Such an occurrence wasn't beyond his calculations, but the timing was a bit awkward. The person marching towards them was far worse than the necromancer king. With fear streaking her whole being, she announced that Count Anatolius was approaching. Angela froze up, dropping her fan to the ground. She knew the full extent of the force headed their way. For the eleventh floor's aristocrat to willingly travel to the ninth floor could only mean there was a misunderstanding. The steel giant easily captured Rikshasha's entire recon team. Their tricks didn't fool the monster for a second. Luckily, he chose not to kill them. And after a show of force, he freed them all of his own will. He was being accompanied by the black merchant and the auction's red demon. Kim inquired what were the chances of them just passing by. But Rikshasha was certain they were headed directly for the Naga Labyrinth. The moment the merchants found out that we were from the Naga Labyrinth, they released us. With this information, Kim set things into motion, giving Dominique the order to put their forces on standby. 
The count wouldn't fit through the front gates, so they would have to meet him outside the walls. To Angela, this was insanity. The only choice they had was to run. All their previous adversaries were nothing in comparison to the count. There was no time to waste. They had to run. Kim assured her whatever she was worried about wasn't going to take place. He had no idea why they were being visited, but he was sure it wasn't to fight. Besides, it would allow them to evaluate a possible enemy's strength. He had no choice but to face this. He wasn't a coward. Tucking tail and running was not the play. Angela chose to stand by his side. Regardless of what happened, he couldn't show any hostility towards the Count. Kim assured her he would try his best, but he wouldn't make any promises. A few hours later in front of the northern gates. Quintus had the full might of their army on standby, ready to attack behind the labyrinth's walls. Dominique sent all their most precious assets to the labyrinth of festivals. Hoya, Yumhui, Uther, and Draken were all safe on the other side of the portal. Kim immediately closed the portal off to assure their safety. As always, he tried to protect Dominique by sending her away. Rikshasha, Quintus, and Angela would accompany him to greet the Count. But this time she wasn't having it. She would be coming along also. Where would she hide? If the labyrinth failed, she would also die along with it. As the servant of the Naga labyrinth, it was her duty to provide him with the knowledge he needed in any situation. Standing by her master's side would give her first-hand knowledge of a possible future enemy. Angela reluctantly intervened, informing them that they were all in the range of her former master's abilities. Hiding away was simply futile. Kim reluctantly decided to allow her to stay. At that very moment the presence of the great being came into the range of their awareness. The parasite is feeling extreme fear. The parasite is advising you to run. Kim did all he could to fight off the flight impulses that were being forced upon him. The parasite is reinforcing the host's body to the extremes for the sake of survival. If you stay in this state for too long, there is a risk of experiencing permanent damage. The parasite advises you to run. Angela dropped to her knees, surprising Dominique as the vampire had never been big on etiquette. The parasite is temporarily shutting down your ability to feel pain. The parasite is exuding a narcotic substance into your body. The parasite strongly advises you to run. Kim welcomed the steel giant, Count Anatolius, to his domain. Giant was an understatement, as he was several times taller than the biggest hell spider Kim had ever seen. He could easily see over their walls, so there was no doubt he knew that the Naga Labyrinth had arrayed its forces against him. Kim immediately inquired why the esteemed aristocrat would journey above the abyss to grace them with his unwelcome presence. Angela was shocked by the rudeness of her master. He reminded her he only promised to do his best to refrain from hostility. But he never intended to cower in front of the fellow aristocrat. There was no way he was going to open the door for the giant to look down upon him. Doing so would only allow him to take advantage of them all. The steel giant wasn't surprised. He had been warned that the human was very arrogant. A single word escaped the giant's lips. Kneel! High aristocratic authority has been activated. Kim was hit by a tremendous force, as he did all he could to remain standing in front of the steel giant. Quintus, Dominique and Angela were instantly forced to the ground. Kim couldn't believe that this was the same aristocratic authority skill he had been using to force his will upon others. To Dominique, the sensation felt as if gravity had been increased ten times over. Kim understood that the Count was on a completely different level than he was. However, there was no chance that he would ever willingly kneel in front of anyone. Count Anatolius was impressed by the stubbornness of the tiny human. High aristocratic authority has been cancelled. Kim was permitted to remain standing in the presence of the Count. He had done far better than any of the trash the Count had come across on the tenth floor and for this he was satisfied. Kim wasn't one for chit-chat and insisted the Count move this visit along. Anatolius allowed this rudeness to slide for the sake of his precious Angela. She had truly chosen a worthy master. The Count had decided to make use of the human baron. If things went well, he would become his precious pawn. Such an honor was something that the human could be proud of. He had decided to be Kim's sponsor, 
investor, and guide. Put simply, he was going to become Kim's patron. Going forward, Kim would need to act according to his commands. He cut him off before he could reveal his opinion. He didn't care what the baron thought. In the end, he would get his way. His first command was for them to raid Valicious and take over the ninth floor. He ensured them their path forward wasn't up. Kim was ordered to fight his way down to the abyss, his homeland. The Count departed the way he came, announcing that he would be waiting on the eleventh floor. This whole situation infuriated him. He made a promise that one day he would make Anatolius pay for this humiliation. The two crooked merchants wasted no time making their presence known. He warned them it would be dangerous for them to remain near him after their master had departed. The red demon assured him he was making a harsh joke. He was a merchant, not a servant who swept at the feet of aristocrats. He was only there to offer the baron his services. Kim assumed the red demon was a big shot seeing as he claimed the auction to be his own. The merchant's visit had to be serious if a higher-up needed to come to his labyrinth personally to offer him a deal. While he couldn't elaborate further, he was definitely much higher than the loser black merchant he held in the palm of his hand. Without a second thought, he tossed the trash away before getting down to business. He wasn't dealing in simple commodities. Today's business was information only. The kind that was way too important to allow a simple imp to deliver. They were going to deal in sensitive information. On offer was information on the necromancer king himself, Felicius. Seeing as how things weren't going as smoothly as he hoped, he decided to lay it out as straight as he could. The baron had to be wondering why the necromancer king hadn't attacked as soon as the flood dragon was dead. Kim insisted he spit it out. It was simple. A strong chimera took time to grow and train. The black merchant was shocked. To reveal this information would leave him in mortal danger. The red demon could care less. Viciously forcing his foot into the imp's face. Continuing to drop hints, he explained that Kim had once sold the black merchant group a very fresh, albeit headless, corpse. The antics of the black merchant group were starting to get old. They continuously stated their neutrality, but their actions said otherwise. The Red Demon insisted they were just a small, pitiful merchant organization that was sold a corpse by a king who didn't care for it and had only done what merchants do and sold the corpse to a king who had more use for it. Kim had no problem with this. His problem was the fact that they were here giving him information about the necromancer king. The red demon was jubilated to find out Kim's concerns. He insisted there was no need for him to worry. They were only balancing things out. The word balance initially shocked Kim, and then it set him off. The bastards was here, meddling in his affairs all over again. He was sure they had sold information about him to the necromancer king and was only here to smooth things over. The red demon assured him that Valicious was the one losing out in their dealings. After all, the main strength of the Naga Labyrinth was the baron himself. So, the only information they could have leaked was the size of his army. But in return, they had leaked information about the necromancer king's hidden cards. And with that, the red demons saw the errors in their ways. Their actions had indeed tipped the balance. He immediately ordered the imp to write an apology letter the moment they returned to their headquarters. This was all just too much chit-chat for Kim. He wanted details and he needed them now. If they expected him to fulfill his end of the deal, he wanted every piece of intel they had sold the necromancer king. A week later, Dominique commenced the ultimate briefing for the imminent conflict against the nefarious necromancer King Valicious, ruler of the Labyrinth of the Dead. She meticulously outlined the composition of their forces, deliberately excluding those assigned to safeguard the Labyrinth. Their army consisted of 400 soldiers, 200 skilled warriors, 100 expert archers, and 80 formidable champions. Additionally, they possessed a group of 40 healers, 30 proficient mages, 30 adept scouts, and 20 experienced shamans. To further bolster their ranks, they boasted a contingent of 100 cavalrymen, all mounted on fearsome flood dragons. They had three times more troops than the necromancer king believed them to have. An army of around 1,000. But this paled in comparison to the low-ranked undead troops of the necromancer king. 
and considering he had over two months to complete his secret project, there was a high chance that the Flood Dragon King's corpse had been turned into a chimera. Kim slyly steered her towards the compatibility of the different undead soldiers. Dominique proceeded with a full breakdown. The undead beings are reanimated corpses infused with labyrinth energy, granting the necromancer king absolute control over them. These undead creatures possess immunity to psychological abnormalities, exhaustion, and pain, persistently moving until their brains are obliterated. They can be categorized into three types, low rank, high rank, and chimeras. The low-ranking undead primarily executes simplistic commands and constitute the majority of the undead army, serving as mere meat shields. On the other hand, high-ranking undead possess greater amounts of labyrinth energy, resembling elite forces. They are strategically embedded within the ranks of the low-ranking undead to carry out precise and targeted attacks. Lastly, the necromancer king's specially modified high-ranking undead are referred to as chimeras. So far, our knowledge is limited to the one derived from the remains of the Flood Dragon King. Kim harbored no illusions that the Flood Dragon King was the sole chimera in the Necromancer King's army. However, their efforts thus far had failed to uncover any indications of additional chimera. Moving on, Kim turned the spotlight to Rikshasha, recognizing the immense value of her expertise. Rikshasha elucidated that the necromancer king typically maintained a multitude of dormant, undead spread throughout his territory. The true count of buried bodies remained elusive, making it impossible to ascertain the actual number at this stage. There is also a considerable number of undead beings who are currently awake and on standby. This fact resulted in the failure of the reconnaissance mission near the labyrinth of the dead. However, Valicious himself is departing from his own territory to make his way toward the labyrinth of gluttony. It's true. Witnesses have observed thousands of undead troops leaving the necromancer king's domain. These forces are divided into two separate divisions, approximately half a day's distance apart. The first division is led by the powerful corpse of the flood dragon king, while the necromancer king personally commands the second division. Kim was infuriated that the Red Demon had proven to be right in the end. The Necromancer King's acquisition of the Flood Dragon King's Chimera had evidently given him the confidence to abandon his fortifications and launch an attack. The circumstances this time were markedly different. The Naga Labyrinth had shifted to an offensive stance, requiring them to exercise utmost caution to avoid falling into traps similar to those encountered by the Flood Dragon Army. However, in contrast to the previous encounter, the Naga Labyrinth's army now boasted a significantly larger force. They were fully prepared for the impending war. Kim understood that the upcoming battle would not be easy, however, he recognized that the Necromancer King was lacking in reconnaissance and intelligence gathering, which would be factored into their planning. The information possessed by the Necromancer King was outdated, dating back to around a week after their conflict with the Flood Dragon King. Consequently, he would have no knowledge of Angela, Hoya, Yunhui, and Uther. Uther, assuming the leadership of the First Division, would advance towards the Necromancer King's undead army, while the remaining forces would be divided into two additional divisions. This arrangement would result in a total of three divisions. It was during this discussion that Angela realized the Uther before her was an imposter. Without hesitation, the imposter revealed himself as Uther No. 1 serving merely as a communication device in his current state. Assuming that the circumstances remained unchanged, the convergence of the Flood Dragon King's Chimera and Uther is expected to occur in two days. During this encounter, Uther will engage and detain the enemy forces while Rikshasha, Angela, Yunhui, and myself launch a surprise attack on the rear of the Necromancer King's division. Concurrently, Dominique, Quintus, Draken, and Hoya, with the assistance of the Naga cavalrymen will take an alternate route, with the primary objective of infiltrating the labyrinth of the dead and retrieving its core. While the Naga cavalrymen possess considerable strength, you guys must remain vigilant in the face of the hazards within the enemy's territory. If the situation escalates and more than two chimeras manifest, an immediate retreat is advised, with the directive to regroup with the main forces. Kim looked at Dominique and politely asked her to be careful. Fully in love with her king, she assured him, she understood. 
If only one of the two divisions succeeds, it will cause a chain reaction in the battle. Both Valicious and the Corps are key components in keeping the undead army running. If for any reason we all need to fall back, the meeting point will be the Naga Labyrinth. Kim asked if anyone had questions. And since there was no reply, he instructed Quintus to command his forces. Quintus acknowledged his king and stepped to the Naga army. It was time for war, and all their forces were ordered to march to the battlefield. The sight of their sizable army demanded the attention of everyone present. Kim pulled Rikshasha to the side and informed her it was time for her to obtain her revenge. But if she hesitated for a single moment, he would step up and obtain victory. She was ready to obtain peace for her family members, who had been slain at the hands of the necromancer king. Two days later, Uther stood awkwardly on the battlefield alone. He was initially told he would only have to fight a few undead before he could retreat. He guessed what was standing before him was a corpse. But it totally wasn't what he expected. Uther wasted no time greeting the former king directly, complimenting him on how pretty he had become. He couldn't tell exactly what it was but assumed it was possibly the new haircut. As he stated, he thought it looked perfect, the corpse had had enough, and quickly reached out to snatch him up. Uther made an evasive maneuver. He wasn't expecting the giant to have such speed. In the past, it barely moved to the point where moss could be seen growing on his hide. A low-ranked undead slid his axe into Uther's head, seeing as how he was impervious to any form of physical attack. Uther took no damage. In fact, the only way he could be destroyed was if the undead dragon used his thermic ray. Uther chuckled to himself. The undead flood dragon's lack of an original head most likely made that difficult. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case as the creature began to activate his ultimate move. Uther screamed as the blistering hot ray shot in his direction, scorching the earth all around him. Dust clouds raised into the sky as steam eased out of the corners of the former dragon's mouth. The undead army stood still, waiting to see if their battle had ended. Uther couldn't believe how ruthless they were being. It was simply rude to use your ultimate skill straight out of the gates. In a more suitable form, Uther informed the giant corpse to clench its teeth, before unleashing an attack that would have put a hole in majority of his enemies. But instead, the giant creature and his lackeys were sent flying. He was sure it was his fault they had attacked him in such a way. After all, he did go around most of the time looking like easy prey. However, people seemed to forget that he was a fearsome labyrinth owner in his own right. And the undead creatures weren't the only ones around here who were undying. He too has spent decades collecting a mighty legion that he had been dying to show off. Uther removed his fanny pack and slid the zipper open, shining light in on the tiny creatures, informing them it was time for them to eat. The word food was all that was needed to excite the little gluttons. He let the little gluttons out to feast at the buffet consisting primarily of undead skeletons. The little vermin were vicious, shouting die and death to the undead. One even intended on making a bone marrow soup. The gluttons shot from the sky like green goblets of molten lava, terrorizing the undead soldiers as they nibbled on bones, intent on having a low-to-no-calorie snack. The giant chimera didn't hesitate in sacrificing its own soldiers to destroy the gluttons. This didn't please Uther, so he gave the creature a sharp kick to the face, as he relayed back to the base camp that he had committed his main body to fighting the Flood Dragon King. Kim was shocked that the battle was taking place so soon. This left their army with no chance to rest. They would need to attack Valicious the moment they located his army. He was being put in a terrible position where he would have to make a difficult decision. The airhead Angela offered useless commentary. She felt they should have traveled to the battlegrounds with a small team and deployed a portal to transport the main body of their army. Kim shot the useless remark down as that would only have left the Naga Labyrinth's owner's room vulnerable to attack. With the portal remaining open for twenty-four hours, he would have had to leave a sizable force to protect its entrance. Uther informed him that he believed his main body could win, but at the moment it was hard to say for sure being that the undead army had zero caloric value hindered the glutton's fighting style and it would take them some time before they could dig through the flood dragon's tough hide to feast upon his flesh. 
it wasn't like he was going to make it easy for them to accomplish. These setbacks made his ultimate recovery ability essentially useless, forcing Uther to resort to having to physically lay a beat down on the Flood Dragon. Seeing how things weren't going as planned, he ordered Uther to check in on Dominique ASAP. They were about two hours out from reaching the enemy's labyrinth, the group had recently entered the barren wasteland. So far today, everything was progressing much faster than he had anticipated. The flood dragon mounts were turning out to be speed demons. Rikshasha rushed forward to inform him her scouts had completed their mission of finding Valicious. He was held up in a valley with thousands of undead surrounding him. It was time to make the tough decision. They were fighting against an enemy who didn't tire. Going into battle with half-weakened soldiers just wasn't ideal. All their plans had been set into motion. They had no choice but to attack right now and finish this once and for all. Reluctantly, given the situation, he had to take back Rikshasha's chance to kill her enemy. He had no choice but to do it himself. Their biggest soldier sounded the alarm, alerting everyone to the start of the battle. The archers would soon be given free will to fire into the enemy's formation. But on Rikshasha's authority, they begin to launch their opening attacks. From afar, it seemed as if meteors rained down upon the enemy's front line. Undead of all types pushed into the shielded formation of the Nagas. On their king's order, the shield wall pushed forward, opening their gates and unleashing an attack, before closing up tight again. This strategy would allow them to destroy countless swaths of undead soldiers. Kim was sure his men could handle the job without him directly intervening. So he sent up a signal requesting a smokescreen be laid across the battlefield. The archers wasted no time supplying their king with the tools he needed to move undetected. A volley of arrows was launched into the air. The precision of the archers allowed a smokescreen to blaze a path directly to the necromancer's king's command post. Unaware of the danger directly in his blind spot, he ordered his soldiers to attack over and over. The necromancer king was part of his deal, but Kim didn't feel it mattered if it was delivered dead or alive. To the surprise of Valicious, a sneak attack had been launched towards his head, sending parts of him flying in all directions. Rikshasha's one-horned rat was at a loss for words. As an expert tracker, something wasn't adding up. Unless their minds had been tampered with, they were exactly where they should be. Rikshasha's skull marker adorned the ground, but previously from this very location, you could clearly see the labyrinth of the dead looming in the distance. But now all that lay before them was a wasteland. The horned rat had no problems taking the blame for this mistake. His failures were bound to cost someone their life. From Dominic's perspective, they were exactly in the right spot. The blame for the lost labyrinth couldn't be placed on the horned rat's back. She was sure if the C team kept looking, they were bound to find something. Quintus, doing his job as their protector, warned of a possible trap, but what could they do? It was either this or do nothing. The group was overlooking a very plausible explanation. The Naga king was victorious and had destroyed the necromancer causing the labyrinth of the dead to cease to exist. Quintus was sure this was the case. Only their master could have accomplished such a feat he ordered the group to pack up. They needed to get this scouting over before they could rendezvous with the A-team. It was time to ride. Kim didn't buy this for one second. Nothing in Geyser came that easy. The simple fact that the undead was still trying to take him out proved his point. The skeleton he had dismantled was nothing more than a dummy. The moment he said the word, it was echoed across the battlefield, followed by the laugh of a lunatic, who explained the head he just took was indeed that of the necromancer King Valicious. A simple skeleton soldier stepped forward, sporting the golden ring of authority. Kim could only assume that the soldier had become the new labyrinth owner. And in a way, that was the case. Even though he was the necromancer king, he wasn't a psychopathic killer like some among them. But he was valicious, closer to perfection than the previous version. And the killer reared his face, slicing through his enemy, only for another one to appear. Valicious assured him there was no need to rush, there was plenty of him to go around. Kim consulted Angela about what the hell was going on. She couldn't fathom the otherworldly nature of his gimmick. Even before the battle, 
an unsettling intuition tugged at her senses. Angela held unwavering conviction. The necromancer king had undeniably orchestrated a resurrection. Amidst the legion of the undead, an imperceptible vitality pulsed, an anomaly defying reason. Yet, the astonishing revelation was that it bore the essence of an individual, singular and distinct. As Angela talked out her concerns, it all fell into place. The psychopath had pulled a Lord Voldemort. He had broken his soul into many pieces and scattered it among the undead. No matter how many times you destroy him, another will stand in his place. Each and every soldier on the battlefield had the means to become valicious. Kim couldn't believe it was possible for someone to break their soul into pieces. Valicious knew he was dealing with a smart cookie. After all, he was the necromancer king, and dealing with the dead and their souls was his business. He snapped the neck of his current vessel and reappeared next to Kim, assuring him that his soul was no different. Kim didn't see a problem with having to destroy every single bag of bones. After all, not a single undead for miles around could stand in his way. Between him and his subordinates, they would wipe the battlefield clean. Angela rose into the air on wings of crimson, looking down at the unworthy targets below. Rikshasha caught the signal and passed the orders to assist the vampire to the mages in waiting. She wasn't going to be able to perform to her zenith with nothing but dry bones to work with. Luckily, it didn't take much to destroy such weak undead. Angela rained down a bloody hell from the sky. And the siege beast wasted no time, cleaning up her leftovers. Kim really didn't understand what the point was of having such trash soldiers. The slightest touch was all it took to cause them to crumble. Other than being tedious, there was no challenge in this. Valicious definitely wasn't boasting about his combat skill. But he couldn't believe these fools thought this fodder was all he had up his sleeve. He didn't need to put on any airs when he had the real deal at his disposal. Dominique was stunned silent. At the very least, if the labyrinth of the dead was destroyed, there should be some traces of it that remained. She was starting to believe that their minds were indeed tampered with. But the one-horned rat had changed his opinion. After all, there were traces of the labyrinth all around them. For one, the gaping hole was evidence, in and of itself. While Dominique was pondering how it was created, the horned rat had figured out that the A-team was in grave danger. Her nerves caused her to brush off his silence. There was no way a labyrinth that large was capable of movement. The mere steps of the behemoth were all it took to force the Naga army into retreat. He thought he had seen it all, but had never imagined that siege beasts came in this size. The monstrosity was several times larger than any siege beast he had laid his eyes on. And worse than that, the Nagas were beginning to rise from the dead. Going into this battle, he hadn't taken into account that his own soldiers would fuel his enemy's ambitions. The thing was a siege beast. No matter how big it was, Angela could easily take care of it. But she wasn't so sure he was right. The thing that stood before them wasn't a siege-class beast. If she was right. And she was sure she was right. The monstrosity was the labyrinth of the dead. Necromancy is bound by an array of stringent constraints. Acquiring cadavers becomes a prerequisite for delving into its practice. However, a ceiling exists on the quantity of reanimated beings one can summon. The revival of a deceased form merely yields a skeletal semblance, sustained precariously by a tenuous mana thread. Even if a newly deceased body is unearthed, its gradual decay is inexorable culminating in a skeletal residue. The might of an undead legion ebbs day by day, eroding its potency. In the aftermath of conflict, naught but decline awaits, as the natural order asserts its dominion, ushering in demise. Valicious had never been down with following the rules of reality. He ordered his soldiers to gather the dead and pile the bodies high. They were not to leave a single piece of flesh behind. Absolutely nothing would go to waste. For the necromancer king, death wasn't the end, it was merely the beginning. You didn't find rest in eternal life, only glory. And once what remained of a multitude of cadavers was piled high, he brought forth his first chimera forged through death, the labyrinth of the dead. You have entered the territory of the labyrinth of the dead. The stats of the forces affiliated with the labyrinth of the dead have increased. 
Kim and Angela stood before the labyrinth, its undead forces invigorated by the strength it gave. The creatures it spawned weren't the trash marring the battlefield up to this point. The high-ranking undead had finally joined the party. Given the placement of the Labyrinth of the Dead, it was highly likely that their right flank had been destroyed. He was hoping he could keep Yunhui out of the battle. But the battlefield had just progressed to a new stage. He forced his lightning as high into the air as he could, catching the attention of Rikshasha, the Naga's battle commander. Yunhui was up. Given the state of the battle, it was highly likely he needed her to control the right flank. She was to lead her soldiers to the right side of the cliff, where they would be backed up by the onslaught of the Mage Corps. The Labyrinth of Festivals is joining the battle. Kim turned his attention toward the face of the cliff overlooking the battlefield. Festival's excitement level 04%. Where the pink wave was headed onto the battlefield. They would have to be careful with the use of her labyrinth, as its penalties alone could wipe out their entire force. Angela had known something wasn't right about the necromancer king. His ability to jump bodies would have been coveted by the lords below the abyss. It was a skill sent from the gods that the aristocrats would die over. Because of this, there was no doubt in her mind that the skill didn't belong to him. It made more sense for something of its nature to be an ability of the labyrinth itself. It made sense that he kept it a secret all this time. The ability had to have some form of restrictions. Valicious had no problem bringing her up to speed. His use of the ability made him weaker. It was only to be expected, seeing as how his soul was divided among multiple vessels. But from his perspective, it was more of a boost than a bane. While he thought of himself as a gentleman for revealing his weak point, Kim saw him for what he was, an idiot. It wasn't gentlemanly, it was simply stupidity. The whole time they were conversing, the Naga king was preparing to make his move, shooting from the ground straight toward the labyrinth of the dead. Its attempt to crush him only aided him in his flight. He landed on its hand, using it as a springboard to further his goal of conquest. Cutting down any and everything in his way as he landed near his target, the labyrinth's core. Before his second step could land, a humanoid undead unleashed an attack from the shadows. His reflexes allowed him to easily dodge and send a return blow to the back of the creature. But to his surprise, the undead was unbelievably fast, easily countering his attack. There was no doubt in his mind his opponent was a chimera-level undead. But he had no time for its foolishness. He used his parasite to completely bind the enemy, fully intent on finishing this once and for all. As he came close to reaching his goal, a shielded undead came crashing down between him and his target. Kim backed away. He had been so close. What stood in front of the core most definitely wasn't ordinary soldiers. They were three of the most dangerous creatures he had ever laid his eyes on, Kim knew when he was outclassed. He wasted no time removing himself from their presence. He reassured Angela that he was well, but informed her that there were three humanoid chimeras inside. She was shocked by this as the three stepped forward, casting their shadows from the confines of their labyrinth. The crazed look in their eyes told him of their intent to destroy any and everything in their path. Their earrings alone made him pause. The situation had just gotten complicated. From the cliff above, a single individual stirred on, as horror coursed through her soul. Rikshasha jumped from the cliff, screaming Valicious's name. She had eyes for him and him alone. Kim glanced at Angela. No words needed to be spoken, she understood. She dashed headlong paying attention to only her target. If it wasn't for Angela, she would have been crushed by the giant cleaver that was meant for her head. In the last-ditch effort for revenge, she released her dagger directly in his direction. He reached down, snatching it from the ground. Such a treasure was indeed a surprise. Once, long ago, he had released her assuming she would perish by the cruel embrace of Geyser. But here she was, alive and well. His words caught Kim's attention. Releasing her was a necessity in order to obtain three L's. He made a crucial mistake, calling her out of her name and wrongly assessing her value. Angela wouldn't tolerate his actions as she ripped him apart from the inside out. She was puzzled how someone without a tongue was able to run their mouth so much. 
The necromancer king simply continued his line of thought from another vessel. She was nothing more than a burden. He really wanted to see how long they would be able to protect her during battle. He ordered the swordsman to go after Kim and the mage to take care of Angela. Last, he ordered the shield men to kill the elf and then join the battle against the human. And to give them the edge, he allowed them the use of spirit magic. Angela perked up at the words. The next moment, she was blasted with a beam, causing her to drop Rikshasha, who tucked and rolled coming to a stop before the shield men. Under Elf Chimera. Name unknown. Rank Hero Plus Plus Plus. Tears formed in her eyes as the word Captain escaped her lips. Under Elf Scout. Rikshasha. Rare Plus. His foot dug into her chest, upheaving her, as she crashed across the battlefield. Kim needed to focus on his own battle, otherwise he would lose his head, turning at the last second to block the blow headed in his direction. To his utter horror, somehow, a wound was carved into his shoulder. To refrain from getting more injuries, he had to retreat until he figured out what was going on. He landed as his parasite emerged to aid him in the battle. Kim was sure he had blocked the attack. What exactly was this swordsman? It was clear that the Underelf was beyond insane. Underelf Chimera. Name unknown. Legendary. He didn't get much rest, as the elf came down with a blow that was bound to be devastating. Kim laid back, as the blow eliminated the undead in the surrounding area. The sword had an aura. He wondered what the possibilities were, that it was magic. The Underelf was relentless forcing more of his parasite out in order for him to survive. Angela watched the spectacle, as if she was witnessing something that was merely impossible. The undead and spirit magic simply wasn't compatible. The mere use of it should have caused the elves to self-destruct. But here we were, staring at an undead mage, surrounded by the telltale signs of spirit magic. Underelf Chimera. Name unknown. Legendary Plus. But to her astonishment, the purification process was indeed in effect. Something nefarious wasn't allowing the process to take hold. With little warning, a barrage was sent in her direction, forcing her to immediately evade. As she made it clear of danger, out of the corner of her eye, she caught a glimpse of what was causing the cancellation of the purification. Valicious held his hand out, keeping his undead elves squarely in this world. The necromancer king was really starting to irk her. She loaded up an attack and sent it in his direction. Only for the shield men to manifest a shield to protect his liege. Her attack did nothing as the mage continued to regenerate. The mix of combat magic, plus regeneration was entirely overpowered. Her encounter wasn't for naught as she made a connection she had to get into the hands of her master. She used her dwindling blood supply to create a field microphone for instantaneous communication. Or better known as a blood summon as Kim continued to defend himself, Angela explained that the Underelf weren't entirely dead yet. While their bodies had long since expired, there was a good chance that their souls remained. As elves were the only creatures capable of using spirit magic. The necromancer king was using them to this end. It could only mean Valicious had found the way to brainwash the three of them. Kim countered the swordsman's blow, and with a single kick, sent him flying. He had to come up with a way to snap them back into reality. And Rikshasha might hold the key to such an endeavor. But at the moment she wasn't in great shape. He sent Yunhui to the rescue. With her skills, she shouldn't have a problem protecting Rikshasha. As she launched herself towards her new target, Kim had a brilliant idea. The necromancer king wasn't the only one capable of brainwashing. Danger be damned, he had no choice but to open a portal. You have entered the territory of the Labyrinth of Festivals. Desperately reaching out to her target, she received new orders to use sweet dreams. The elf captain rushed to the aid of his charge. The little elf was constantly slipping out of the castle. Her excuse was that she was entirely able to defend herself. Regardless, the prince worried about her well-being. Such feelings were entirely uncalled for, as she was protected by the strongest knight in the world. The night captain had no choice but to agree. Protecting her was his job and he promised to forever be her shield. It didn't take much, but the brainwashing was finally undone. 
he came to just as he was going to make a terrible mistake. Dropping to his knees before Rikshasha, he realized his hands had caused her injury. His memories of the moment of sacrifice were fresh in his head. What choice did they have when the necromancer king had their charge within his grasp? The update of his knowledge didn't take long as he realized what Valicious had done. He turned towards his greatest enemy, only for Yunhui, to secure him by sending him flying into the cliff. The necromancer king caught a glimpse of the action and wondered exactly what was going on. But luckily, he hadn't noticed the change within his servant. Now that Yunhui was in a key position they had to keep her up to speed. But the under-elf mage wasn't making it easy. If the pink-haired girl was a servant of his enemy, that made her target number one. Right on time, Angela summoned swooped in. The elf was making a terrible mistake. They were friends of Rikshasha's. At the moment, he needed to calm down. He didn't care which side they were on. If they were going to defend that monster, he would make them wish they didn't exist. Angela got right to the point, explaining that he was an undead made by Valicious. The moment he was found out, his energy source would be cut off and he would cease to exist. Or worse, he would be re-brainwashed and resume his attack on Rikshasha, seeing as how his orders were to deal with her for good. How could his best course of action be to merely sit and wait? The vampire sent her summon, rushing to her master's side. She reported that the counter-brainwashing was a success. He was currently back to normal. Angela figured the next elves were in line for deep brain cleansing, but the shield men's brainwashing had completely depleted the labyrinth of festival's energy. Their only option moving forward was for Yunhui to get the fifth level of excitement going. As Angela's blood summons checked if Yunhui received her orders, it picked up on Rikshasha's captain using her title. The little big mouth blood beast screamed the word, Your Highness. Angela suspected the elves weren't simple mercenaries. After all, what were the chances that a legendary ranked mercenary squad could exist? The mage's strength made sense, seeing as how it was none other than a palace mage. Now that his head was clear, he intended to do what he could to help. But at the moment the best way for him to assist them was to stay out of the way. He was doing more than enough by not being a pun for the necromancer king, and they needed it to remain that way. Angela left delivery of the VIP in Yunui's hand, and reminded her of the orders to bring them to the fifth level of excitement. She gently grabbed his suit of armor and launched him across the battlefield, leaving shock waves of impact in his wake. He came to rest in the cliffside, far away from the conflict. But the reality was he swore to protect Rikshasha his entire life. And now that he had full control of his faculties, all he could do was watch. As a group of undead moved in to finish what their betters had started, a spirit shield popped in place, encompassing her body. If he took such orders, was he truly a guardian knight? The moment the portal appeared on the battlefield, Valicious became weary of its presence. What was the point of it? Was it merely for a labyrinth buff? All he knew was when it appeared his connection to his shield men began to flicker. And before he knew it, he had disappeared completely from his radar. He had no intentions of allowing such a scheme, calling forth his beloved labyrinth to crush the portal. Kim knew the target the moment the monstrosity began to move. Reaching the fifth level of excitement was too important. He couldn't allow the behemoth to complete its task. He had to buy time as the festival's excitement was only 27% into level 3. First, he turned to Angela, but she was busy trying to remain alive. Next, there was Yun Hui, but she was up to her neck in undead. And he himself was being pushed to the brink by the relentless under-elf swordsman. All he could do was sit back and watch his plans begin to crumble to pieces. He was the shield that protected all the elves of Geyser. Lina the captain of the Elven Kingdom's Guardian of Night's Order, released his spiritual energy and launched himself toward the labyrinth of the dead. He announced his presence to Valicious, choosing death over the eternal existence of the necromancer's puppet. Angela couldn't believe how big an idiot he was. She gave him a direct order to stay away from the necromancer king, and here he was putting everything in jeopardy. The infuriated Lina came crashing forward screaming Valicious's name who stood there in total shock that his brainwashing had come undone. 
he crashed into the labyrinth sending debris flying towards the treacherous necromancer. Valicious patiently waited for the smoke to clear. While the necromancer wasn't sure of the exact reason his brainwashing was cleansed, he was sure the weakness of Lina's heart was involved, the pathetic elf was attaching meaning to a life that had ended. Just as Angela expected, the necromancer king assaulted the elf, attempting to bring him back under his control. Target is resisting entity manipulation. The two struggled for control as Valicious insisted he accept the inevitable. His only path forward was to leave everything in the necromancer's hand. Lina had zero intentions of surrendering, Valicious could just F off. His mistake was leaving their souls in their bodies. Because of his error, he would get to see what spirit magic was capable of. A beam of blue energy erupted from Lina's body. Target is unrestrainable. Target is immune to status ailments. Entity manipulation has failed. Valicious was stunned stupid. What the elf was doing should be impossible. After all, the body was a vessel he created. So, the soul inside should have no power or freedom to do as it pleased. And that was the exact reason he took it off. The underelf would rather disappear from this world than to exist as a cursed puppet. Geyser spirit, Lina. The sight was unbelievable. Lina's soul simply shed its body. Even more mysterious was the fact that the swordsman had ceased its attack. Kim doubted his brainwashing was undone. It was more like he was simply paying respect to an old friend. As the main battle was on pause, Angela took the moment to check in. The scene they were witnessing was called spiritification. Being hundreds of years since the fall of the elves, she had no idea there was still someone who was capable of performing it. Essentially, the main makeup of an elf was its spirit. And through the process of spiritification it was possible to deny the soul the ability to return to the spirit realm, but instead trapping it in the physical realm. But through such a process the possibility of reincarnation was forfeited. Any moment now, the manner responsible for holding him together would scatter to the four corners of Geyser. In Angela's opinion, whatever was going on with the swordsman was more likely to be a subconscious reaction to the sacred skill revered among their kind. So, it was something similar to the Archon. Angela was surprised that humans had something of the like, but Kim decided it was best not to dive into it. Valicious wasn't impressed by the spiritification, after all, what could the spirit do to him? Kill him? He really liked this body, but there wasn't much he could do about it. The necromancer really had no idea what a spirit was. After Lina was done with him, he would understand it perfectly. He was an incorporeal being, holding Valicious with his bare hands. He could feel the disgusting soul of the necromancer. As the words sunk in, Valicious's eyes opened wide. Valicious begged the spirit to hold on, to wait, to stop. But his final words was a simple apology to Rikshasha. Lina exploded, leaving behind nothing but the necromancer's clothes, which fluttered to the ground as the onlookers watched in complete silence. The sight ripped Rikshasha from her stupor. He had once promised to protect her forever, but here she was, grieving for the loss of her friend for a second time. Kim turned to Angela. She assured him she wasn't an expert on the matter, but she believed the spirit vanished taking at least part of Valicious's soul with him. The undead began to crumble before their very eyes. Even with this occurrence, the brainwashing of the elves remained as strong as ever. The attack was only successful on half of the undead. The word soul retrieval left Angela's lips. She frantically explained they were wasting an opportunity. They needed to destroy the labyrinth core immediately. But that opportunity vanished in a second. A third of his soul was gone. It was okay for his soul to be fragmented. To him, it merely felt as if he was hosting a banquet or as if he'd become omnipotent. However, he couldn't endure the soul of his main body disappearing without a trace. It was like the resurrected him was an entity different from his past self. The experience was entirely unpleasant. The labyrinth of the dead closed in around his form. The behemoth roared, as it and the necromancer king became one. Taking a single step forward, Valicious announced that he would now take control of the battlefield. Valicious, riding his labyrinth as if it was a mech hardly surprised Kim. 
such a transformation made him no different than the Flood Dragon King. And we all know how that turned out. Kim dodged the first attack, leaping into the air. So far, in his opinion, Anaxtus was superior in every way. But the problem came from the few pesky flies that surrounded the giant creature. Kim just didn't know what it would take to get through to the swordsman. His friend had sacrificed himself, and here he was, still stuck in a trance. Festival's excitement level 47%. With the entertainers of the labyrinth wiped out, the process was entirely too slow. And with all the labyrinth energy used up, it wasn't possible to summon more. If only Kim's kills counted, they would have easily pushed him to the fifth level. From afar, Kim pleaded for the success of his silent companion. Yunhui stood encircled by undead, calmly watching the battlefield. Her master was being pushed back by a force unlike any other. While the forceful but kind vampire did all she could to remain alive. And then there was the heartbreak that radiated from her first friend in the labyrinth. Each one of them had openly invited her into their life. She would do what she had to protect her family. Yunhui's consciousness shifted and in its place, all that remained was a creature from the abyss. Kim's attention was drawn to the festival's excitement percentage. Festival excitement level for 15%. The way the ticker jumped to 15, something had to be up. Festival excitement level for 48%. What was going on, in the blink of an eye, they were almost halfway there. Angela's senses drew her a picture of something beyond belief. Was the thing she sensed truly Yunhui? She shook the fear off as she turned in the direction of their silent member. This most definitely wasn't just her imagination. Every creature in Yunhui's vicinity simply ceased to exist. She knew exactly what produced such a response in her blood. Was it possible for that child to be? A cry for Yunhui was heard across the battlefield. The fifth level of excitement had been reached. Before things could get worse, he ordered her to cast sweet dreams on the underelf mage. The mage sensed the incoming attack, whether he understood what was coming, or his reflexes weren't up to the task, it was too late as the particles of sweet dreams encompassed his body. Angela stared at the mage, to her eyes it seemed that the maneuver was a success. An evil smirk broke out on her face. Now was the time for her to get a little payback. She formed a little ball of blood that would leave the mage in an awful state. Once it was to her liking, she tossed it directly at the sleeping underelf. With a simple swipe of his staff, he sent the mess tumbling harmlessly away. How was this possible? Had he rejected the sweet dreams of Yunhui's labyrinth? A tightly constructed spirit chain formed in his hands, the surface radiating a pink glow from within. To Angela's astonishment, the mage tossed the chain over his shoulder, directly towards. She screamed for her master to dodge the incoming attack. But the chains passed harmlessly by, wrapping themselves tightly around the underelf swordsman. The creature let out a feral scream, sharing the effects of sweet dreams, only to instantly fall into a trance. The brainwashing maneuver was beyond successful. It was a joyous day among the elves especially for the young swordsman. While all his life the young prince wished for a baby brother. It wasn't to be as he was instead, blessed with a beautiful little sister. The palace mage had no doubt that the young prince would adore his younger sibling either way. After all, elves only get a single chance and a few centuries to bear children. In the grand scheme of things, his wish for a little brother meant nothing. The little bab's smile was like sunlight in the spring. There was no doubt that her presence would fill Geyser with happiness. With a little brother, he would have been forced to put his sibling through gruesome training. But in his hands was a princess they would protect her, so that she never lost her smile. The unending wars of Geyser would never be her concern. The mage felt that protecting her from all the dangers of the world was a bit much. After all, as a member of the royal family, it was her duty to protect the citizens. Prince Rickferez Izon, had decided he would shoulder all her responsibilities, including the ones tied to her by birthright. Valicious, from within the walls of his undead mech could sense the silence of his elves. His connection to them was beginning to flicker just as it had with the shield men. Did they really believe he would just allow this to happen? Valicious was the master of death, he would use his influence to rebind his chimeras. 
activating entity manipulation. The necromancer wasn't a fool. He knew trashy third-rate magic when he felt it. The tentacles of his influence attempted to wrap around the mage, only to be rebuffed by spiritual energy, causing his magic to shatter at the core. Entity manipulation has failed. His pettiness knew no bounds. If he wasn't allowed to control them, he would destroy them instead. Kim retreated backward from the imminent danger, only for Rikshasha to dash by him in midair. At this point, there was nothing anyone could do to protect her from the blow of the behemoth. She reached her brother with time to spare. If only she could reach him, there was no way she could survive watching him die all over again. Taking full responsibility, tears ran down her face. If she wasn't weak, if she wasn't a burden, none of this would have happened. If only she hadn't defied all the odds and survived. If she would have simply died instead of being captured, or better yet, if she had never existed, none of this would have ever happened. Kim stood there in the aftermath of the attack stunned. Had he truly just stood there and allowed Rikshasha to be taken from this world? His eyes opened wide as he processed the unmistakable sound of spiritual energy. The energy couldn't be contained as it sought faults in the forearm of the behemoth. Prince Rikfarez's eyes on clutched his sister to his side as he removed the obstruction in their way. He assured her that none of the blame lay on her shoulders. Merely laying his eyes on his beloved sister filled his soul with happiness. Their time was running out. He needed Sha Sha to listen closely. Before she had been in this world for more than a few hours, he made the choice to protect her from a life of war. He kept her as a mere flower in the attic, believing that all he needed to do was protect her from harm. Angela couldn't believe the arrogance of royalty. Only moments ago she had freed the palace mage from his binds, and here he was, ordering her to take on Valicious so that the royal's conversation wouldn't be interrupted. From the moment she was born, he had made the wrong decision, which had led his beloved princess down a path of pain. He apologized for his failures as a brother. He truly wished to atone for his sins, if only he could make up for lost time and prepare her for the hardships of her future. He turned to Kim, ashamed to leave his burden upon the human. But there was no one else who had the strength to accomplish what he needed. He asked Kim to take care of the child when he was gone. As he attempted to explain that she was of the royal bloodline, Kim cut him off. He doubted whether the elf had completely regained his faculties. Her pedigree didn't matter in the least. Rikshasha held the position of scout captain. Regardless of her title, she would continue to support the Naga Labyrinth. And because of this, he could promise that her life would be guarded till the moment he no longer breathed. A smile broke out on the elf's face. Such a promise was more than he needed, and if only he too had treated her in the same manner since the moment she was born, there was a chance they wouldn't be in this predicament after all. Everything he needed to accomplish on this earth was done. He wrapped his sister tightly in his arms. As his spiritual energy rose from his body, his final words to her were simple and to the point. His beloved sister Shah Shah had to live. Rikshasha held him tight as his spiritification process completed. He completely ashed away as his royal earrings tumbled to the ground. Spirit energy movement caused by external factors has been detected. An ocean of energy engulfed Rikshasha, raising her into the air. All conditions have been fulfilled, proceeding with heroification of Rikshasha. Part of the conditions have been fulfilled, proceeding with Rikshasha's awakening as Hero Plus. Awakening has failed. The system attempted the awakening again, and again it failed, but on the third attempt, there was success. Part of the conditions have been fulfilled, proceeding with Rikshasha's awakening as Hero Plus Plus. This time it wasn't so easy, as the system simply refused to push through the awakening. Geyser has detected an imbalance. Kim watched as his scout captain was stuck in limbo. He had no idea what the hell was going on. Seeing as how the forces that be weren't down for this change, it seemed the palace mage would have to intervene. Kim wondered what a mage could do in such a situation. When it was obvious, what other chance would he have to act for the sake of his highness and to put the cesspool known as Geyser in its place? He cast his magic, fully encompassing the awakening form of Rikshasha. 
If this cesspool wouldn't allow the awakening of his highness, he would simply have to force it. Rikshasha had been there from the very beginning of Kim's journey as the ruler of the Naga Labyrinth, albeit in the form of a spy, an enemy to all that he stood for. But through her determination to seek out what was rightfully hers, she was willing to team up with whoever could bring her closer to her goal. But Kim wasn't down with such a simple traitorous outlook, giving her the choice to either willingly follow him or return to her master's side. From the moment she came across his labyrinth, she saw him as nothing more than a weak human imposing his weak will upon the geyser. How could she pledge loyalty to someone like him? Someone whose mere presence brought about the weakest creatures she had ever run across in her homeland. The benefits he allowed these tiny creatures were absurd. Even so, she had seen them perform at a higher level than any worker class she had ever run across. She just wasn't willing to throw everything away, for her blind hatred of everything he stood for. Time and time again he had risen to the occasion, and a part of her knew he was the only king above or below the abyss whom she could trust her plight to. From the moment she chose to follow him, she hadn't regretted her decision once. From the destruction of her former master, the flood dragon king Anaxtus, to becoming the first baron above the abyss. She knew in his presence her deepest dreams would become a reality. Within a span of a few months, they were here on the battlefield that would decide the fate of not only hers, but the future of her new family. From the moment she was accepted into their midst, she was expected to do everything she could to hold up the empire, just like any other member. This was a stark contrast from how she was raised. From the moment she was born, her future was determined before she could have any say in the matter. Her family chose to shelter her from the dangers of reality, leaving her completely unprepared as the world came crashing down around them. After carving out a new life, even that came to a sudden end, and no fault of her own, the only people left who held the peace of her heart were killed before her eyes as she was allowed to walk away free. After struggling through the world alone, she wasn't the weak princess she once was. No, she was here to revenge the ones she lost long ago. But it seemed the world was cruel and wished to force trauma upon her soul. Not in her wildest nightmares had she expected to be forced to watch her beloved family die once again. But here she was, after the realization of their failures, becoming something she had never expected. Her family was sacrificing themselves, one after the other, to make right a wrong they had committed long ago. When it was all said and done, she would have to stand on her own two feet and chart a path into the future, with a new family that she chose. One that expected nothing but the best from her, and would have her back through any crisis. The giant colossus came to a sudden halt. Valicious the necromancer king was brought back to when he was only a small labyrinth owner. At a time when his undead army was minuscule by comparison. His pride meant nothing to him if there was a slight chance of danger. He never hesitated to retreat. His survival was always prioritized, as there would always be a chance to wage war another day. And right now, his instincts are screaming that whatever's inside that thing would be the end of him. He sent out an order that encompassed almost his entire army. Each and every undead that possessed his soul pieces needed to run. He didn't care how they did it, they just had to get out of this place. At this point, it didn't matter if they all perished. Only one needed to escape the reach of the Naga army. None of this escaped the careful attention of Angela. She was the first to sound the warning bells against the full retreat of the undead army. Kim looked up, surprised by this occurrence. This war had to end today. Under no circumstances was Angela to allow a single undead to escape. The necromancer wasn't going out easily. He refused to allow them to stop him. The colossus reached out, intent on crushing the opposition. At a time like this Kim couldn't be distracted, Rikshasha needed to be protected at all costs. Her transformation on the battlefield was most definitely the cause of the necromancer king's sudden change of heart. He placed the parasite on full alert, and leaped into the fray, smashing into the hand of the colossus beast, sending its digits, flying in every direction. As the undead creature scaled the cliffs, he had no choice but to entrust their disposal to Angela. Their attempt to stop him was futile. Valicious was leaving nothing on the table, 
such an attack would burn through his soul energy at an alarming rate. But outside his survival, nothing else mattered. The tortured souls swept over the vampire, and as the sheer number of them swarmed her location, Angela was taken out of the equation. Kim knew she was a tough cookie so there was no need for him to worry. But if he didn't get the undead under control, all of this would have been for naught. Now that Angela was out of the equation, Yumhui would need to step up. But she was flat on her back, and down for the count. The few remaining Naga on the cliff wouldn't be able to hold back such a tide. Time was running out, as Kim racked his brain for a solution. The first of Valicious's soul fragments pulled himself over the edge of the cliff. His triumph of accomplishing his task quickly degraded into horror. The sheer number of little green boots that awaited him was staggering. Each and every one of them had the exact same thing on the brain. Valicious pulled up short, his surprise evident on his face. The battlefield was simply deteriorating at an alarming rate. Every undead that was in the process of climbing that cliff simply vanished. He only knew one individual who was capable of such an action. Uther, the king of gluttony, had arrived on the battlefield. As the little gluttons feasted, they chit-chatted among themselves, mostly about their favorite subject food. Their orders were simple. They couldn't allow a single undead to escape. Some among them immediately understood why. The undead were simply ugly, and cause of this they had to be destroyed. Uther was sure that wasn't the reason, he doubted the real answer was too far off. And regardless, the gluttons never missed an opportunity to snack. He didn't know why he had wasted his energy on that sorry excuse for a dragon. Not only had he failed to destroy the slime, the corpse of Anaxtus hadn't even managed to hold the line for a substantial amount of time. Not yet. He couldn't give up so easily. As he searched the battlefield, a second option arose. His undead began to flood into the tunnel that the labyrinth of the dead had created. The path was a straight shot to the barren wasteland. To his horror, it too was compromised. How was this happening, and exactly what was making its way through the tunnel? The ferocious Hoya came shooting out onto the battlefield. The little monster, while late to the battle, was ready to do her share. The flood dragon mounts came bursting upwards, carrying the reinforcements of the Naga army. An unbelievable force had amassed. The army of gluttony surrounded the encampment, and a ragtag team had them pincered from the center. Dominique stood resolute on the battlefield, instantly assuming command of the Naga army's forces. Under her expert guidance, they were poised to annihilate the remnants of the labyrinth of the dead. The timely arrival of the sea team was nothing short of perfection. They were instructed to treat the undead as if each one were the nefarious necromancer king himself. Not a single seed of destruction would be permitted to escape their grasp. To the gluttons among them, it was as if an enticing feast had finally been unveiled. The tide of battle shifted dramatically, leaving Valicious isolated and abandoned. With no chance of escape, he resorted to invoking the spell of soul retrieval. To the sheer horror of the gluttons, their intended meals began to disintegrate before their very eyes. However, Kim wasn't naive. He knew this marked only the inception of the end. As the colossal figure crumbled to the ground, Kim harbored no doubt that Valicious was gathering his strength for a final, decisive assault. Valicious found himself in an unprecedented predicament, unable to recall a time when he had been cornered to such an extreme. As the reigning king of the undead, the concept of fearing death struck him as absurd. He engaged in what appeared to be a futile battle against an inevitable outcome. His past deeds had already sealed his fate, and to compound matters, his original body possessed scant combat abilities. With determination, Valicious retrieved the colossal azure core that had once powered everything within his dominion. The anticipation of what lay ahead ignited a newfound vigor within him. Although his non-existent heart seemed to pound within his chest, an observer might mistake the moisture on his skin for sweat, when in truth, it was merely the pus of his decaying flesh. Valicious couldn't help but admire the grandeur he had constructed through his own efforts. Even as air whistled through the remnants of his lungs, he found himself riding precariously on the precipice between life and death.
This proximity to mortality allowed him to relish a sensation he hadn't experienced in countless generations, the feeling of being alive. At this juncture, he cared little for the outcome. He was resolved to struggle tenaciously until the very end. Placing his hand against his chest, he summoned his final chimera into existence. It was a sight few would willingly witness, and with the immense power at his disposal, his ultimate form would soon be unveiled. The labyrinth was in a state of complete decay. There was no doubt the necromancer king was burning through every ounce of his power. The palace mage wasn't surprised, after all, valicious, and the end was nothing more than a lowly undead. Rikshasha's awakening as hero plus 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 has been a success. He was slightly disappointed she hadn't managed to reach legendary status. With his sacrifice, he was sure his spiritual energy would make up for this shortcoming. Spirit energy movement caused by external factors have been detected. He was sure it would only be temporary, seeing as how he wouldn't be there to push it past the cesspool of geyser. But regardless, the experience would be invaluable. Once the experience got into her bones, he doubted it would be long before she could obtain it on her own. Exceeding Geyser's influence. Temporarily free from the curse of downfall. With the last of his will, he made his wish. He begged his highness to please re-establish the once glorious elf dynasty. The capsule encompassing Rikshasha burst open, sending fragments of solidified energy cascading to the earth. As she touched down, Princess Rikshasha Van. No, that wasn't her title any longer. She was now. The Queen of the High Elves. Golden Age, High Elf Rikshasha. Absolute perfection, temporary. Dominique and Quintus were surprised by the appearance of their friend and ally. They thought they had made it in time, but it seemed they missed a lot in their time away. Kim was through with anything that had to do with the King of the Labyrinth of the Dead. He was done holding back, his deal with the black merchants be damned, giving Rikshasha free reign. He would open the path and she could decide what she wanted to do on her own. She nodded in response, thanking her master for all he had done. An uncertain battle lay before them, as Valicious's true form is revealed. The deceased sheep would transform into a nomadic congregation, beseeching the guidance to rediscover his true path, for he was born amid their midst. Granting him the retribution he deserved, and through it, he would deliver redemption to the wayward sheep. They shall experience a rebirth and find their purpose through his actions. He was the embodiment, both creator and destroyer, the balance of light and darkness, the alpha and omega in their existence. Their entire universe revolved around him, for the sheep were the very essence of his being, and the realm in which he resided was a blend of the afterlife and tangible reality. Valicious turned reality into the world of the dead sheep. Entering Formless Labyrinth Purgatory Necromancer King, Valicious's abilities have been increased. The ones that knew, knew. Both Angela and Dominique understood the ramifications of what had just transpired. Angela was relieved to see the Necromancer King's Formless Labyrinth was extremely unstable and was deteriorating before their very eyes. She was sure in its current state, it could do no more than strengthen his body but that alone would make him a dangerous enemy to face. She informed her master it was highly likely the necromancer king had reached the level of an aristocrat. Kim wasn't worried, ordering her to back off and to protect Dominique and Yun Wei. The time for talk was over, as the undead king began his charge. Valicious was beginning to deteriorate into what could only be described as a fearsome beast. The sheer force of his attack sent shockwaves ripping through the battlefield. They were in his domain, allowing him to use his crucifixes as projectiles with the precision of a mortician. Kim and Rikshasha did all they could, simply to remain above the catastrophe. Luckily, the chaos that ensued gave him the opening he needed. The moment a path formed before him, he burst through like a rocket, picking up speed as he flew towards Valicious. With the distance between the two removed, Kim dodged under his enemy's arms. And attacked with a blow intended to remove the monstrosity's head. But Valicious's defense was above average. This gave him the opening he needed to grab the Naga King by the head. Without wasting a second of time, 
he proceeded to slam his enemy into the ground with all his force. Rikshasha took the opening that was given and slid into position. From her place above the battlefield, she commanded her spiritual shards to descend upon her enemy. They rang down on Valicious, ripping through his body, forcing him to call on his formless power to get rid of the pesky elf. The moment he thought he dealt with one enemy, another reared its face. Kim appeared behind the necromancer and laid a devastating blow directly into the side of his head. While Rikshasha compounded the attack, forcing her crystal armaments through the other side of the necromancer king's body. The blow rocked his world as he countered, ripping up the earth in an attempt to remove the pest from his presence. Kim weathered the blow, using hardening, he simply returned to the offensive, wrapping his parasite's tentacles around the necromancer's body. The back of Valicious's head transformed, in an attempt to rid himself of the human clinging to his body. A horror appeared staring Kim directly in the face. Status amenity terror. Status amenity fear. The attempt was futile as Kim's horror was on another level. His grin spread wider at the thought that Valicious believed such a trick would work on him. You have successfully resisted the status ailments. Kim managed to restrict the necromancer's movement. Now was the time he needed Rikshasha to make her move. Valicious glanced at the sky, realizing the horrors that awaited him. Rikshasha the queen of the elven race called to the palace mage, asking him to bestow his powers upon her. From within her spiritual glass he cast a spell, which cascaded outwards from her body. Valicious screamed, for the unsightly elf had usurped the abilities of his dead sheep. He called forth the souls of his servants as they rushed upwards to protect their once great master. The two forces collided, blocking the sight of the queen above. But the smoke screen only persisted for a moment as Rikshasha forced open a view to the earth. As she called on her brother to lend her his spirit blade, he knew he had no way to block what was coming. Turning his attention to the human holding him down, he frantically let blow after blow loose. A direct attack by the spirit blade would slice through the both of them. Did the Naga king truly intend to die alongside him? The undead king was absurd. Of course he had no intentions of following him anywhere. He was just simply confident that he wouldn't receive any damage. Hardening, at maximum capacity. Valicious glanced over his shoulder, surprised to see the resemblance of Anaxtus staring back. Rikshasha demanded his attention wielding a blade comprised of pure spiritual energy, and instructed the necromancer king to die. The moment the blinding light began to split Valicious's head, Kim cast cognitive haste. Whipping around to the front of the undead king in an attempt to remove the core from his body, extracting core of the labyrinth of the dead. The core of the labyrinth of the dead is out of energy. You have successfully extracted the core without any resistance. He retrieved the precious item with barely any time to spare. Hopping away as Rikshasha made true on her promise to split Valicious in two, the light of her blow was so strong a column of spiritual energy rose into the sky, exiting formless labyrinth, purgatory. As the smoke cleared Rikshasha stood before what remained of the destroyer of her family. She wasn't buying his playing dead routine, ordering Valicious to get up. He was taken aback by her demands. After all, he had been dead from the very beginning. He had always possessed a body that had different needs than the common mortal. He had no intentions of escaping by, as she called it, playing dead. Any way you cut it, Kim was impressed. The determination of this bastard was outstanding. How in the world was he still capable of functioning? There really wasn't a need for them to worry. He had neither enough mana nor a new body to resurrect himself. It was highly likely in a few minutes he would cease to exist. There was no need to worry about him wandering off. He offered himself up to the elf. It was within her power to end him once and for all. She stared down at the saddest excuse for a labyrinth owner. Eventually making her decision, she turned away from the necromancer. Valicious demanded to know where she was going. With her back to him, she simply explained she would gain nothing from killing him. As he said, he had been dead from the start. Why would she allow him to slip away from what he was experiencing? She'd rather his suffering went on for an eternity. He couldn't just let it be, insisting he didn't know what suffering was. 
She turned over the trash to Kim, understanding that she was basically allowing him to live. While he lay on the ground, begging her to end him. She knew that in the hands of those guys, he would learn what suffering was. The word those guys sobered him up quickly. Kim knew they were listening. They could stop pretending. He was done with his conversation. The trash was all theirs. The black merchant devil put on a spectacular show. Kim wondered who it was for because it didn't do anything to impress him. The devil adjusted his cuffs as he relaxed into his true form. Valicious wasn't surprised by the sight of the black merchant group. He couldn't stand that the greedy individuals were always looking for a come-up. Three days had slipped by since their battle with the undead army. Dominique was thankful to be back doing what she loved doing the most. She began the status report of the labyrinth, informing her master they had replenished the three hundred Naga soldiers that died in battle. He was relieved to have returned to the state they were in before the war. She informed him, if he was referring to the military force alone, then he was correct. Kim thought back to the reason why that was. And it all came down to the black merchant group. After the treacherous merchants sold information about the Naga labyrinth, to stay in his good graces, they approached him with an offer he couldn't resist information on the necromancer king's military power. But the intel wasn't free. In exchange for their knowledge, he had to relinquish Valicious alive along with the core of the labyrinth of the dead. If it wasn't for Rikshasha, he would have failed at keeping his end of the bargain. In the end, no one gained anything from the deal. The merchants gained a corpse, clinging to this reality, by a thin thread, and the labyrinth of the dead's core on the verge of breaking. And when it came to the Naga labyrinth, besides losing the entirety of the labyrinth of festival's forces, a large number of Nagas also died. Their loot consisted of piles of rotting meat and cracked bones, and zero-down gems to show for their effort. The war turned out to be a total disaster. He would simply have to be thankful for the presence of the undead, no longer existing in their zone. Dominique had her concerns. Mostly they revolved around the necromancer king returning to enact his revenge. She didn't believe it was wise to allow their enemies to live on in any form whatsoever. As Valicious said himself, all he had to do was wait. Eventually, the opportunity for revenge would present itself. The necromancer king was insanely talkative upon his defeat, then he was at the height of his power. The moment he began to threaten Kim and Rikshasha. The black merchant's demon decided it was time to pack up this show and get it on the road. Even as he was being teleported out, he made sure they knew he would keep his promise no matter what. His last words had been rolling around in her mind since the moment she heard them. Could they trust the black merchants? Was the necromancer king truly their enemy? Kim assured her it would all be fine. After all that group had the entirety of Geyser in the palm of their hand. She knew that it was the least of their problems. After all their new concerns should be the nearby labyrinths on the ninth floor. Before she could dig into her worries, Quintus showed up at the door of the core room. He stopped himself as he began to refer to their scout as the Queen of the Elves. He professionally informed his master that Rikshasha had finally awakened from her slumbers. Hoya was curled up, doing Hoya things, pure cute destruction at its finest as she examined the body that didn't feel like her own, especially seeing as she wasn't aware of her visitors until they inquired about her health. The voice of her master immediately pulled her attention. Under Elf, Rikshasha, Hero Plus. Curse of the Downfall. Dominique, in her role as the mother of the labyrinth, immediately sent a Naga worker to retrieve a healthy meal. As Kim brought Rikshasha up to speed, the moment Valicious was taken away, she broke down in what seemed to be a seizure. The demon couldn't believe he had lived to see such an occurrence. What she was experiencing was known as the geyser curse. A consequence of her forced awakening. Kim had questions that he knew she alone had the answers to. But what was most important at the moment was for her to get some rest. He couldn't believe her actions were as predictable as they were. She immediately inquired about the length of time she had managed to sleep. The moment she found out she had been out for over three days, she immediately began to worry about her post. While she might not be capable of taking advantage of this situation, Hoya definitely was. 
she understood that this was a crucial moment for their labyrinth. Now that Valicious was gone, the other labyrinths would seize this opportunity to make their move. But it simply wasn't her job to worry about those guys. She couldn't have her scouting team taking on such dangers alone. While he hated to do this, he knew it was simply the only way. The moment the necromancer king was killed, their contract was dissolved. After all, it was only valid until she obtained her revenge. Elf mercenary Rikshasha no longer had any affiliations with the Naga Labyrinth. You could see her process her feelings in real time. As Kim explained, she was a guest in their care. Within a moment, she had worked out a plan of attack. Dear Naga Labyrinth owner, Thank you so much for starting a war on behalf of a mere mercenary soldier who had no connection to you at all, and in doing so allowed me to obtain my revenge. She took a knee as she continued. Thank you for releasing my kind from their prison and allowing them a final opportunity to be by my side. The legacy of the elven royalty is indebted to you forever. For if it wasn't for you, that legacy would have disappeared from Geyser completely. If you hadn't taken me into the Naga Labyrinth, I would probably be rotting somewhere out there right now. She owed her life to him and the Nagas. She ended her speech by putting in her official application to continue to work under his command. Kim was only silent for a moment, before inquiring if she intended to work for him as a subordinate instead of a mercenary. She confirmed this was exactly what she meant. He inquired how she expected this to be possible. After all, she was the elven queen. At this moment in her life, all she was worried about was the betterment of the Naga Labyrinth. She was simply the scout captain and nothing more. A scout captain who would be worked to the bone in the front lines where royalty and bloodline had no meaning. He was always intending to ask her anyway. As a smile broke out on her face, he rejected her plea for employment. It devastated her to the core, as he explained, if he didn't, she would run off to perform her duties to the best of her ability. He removed the tray of food from the worker and insisted healing came first. While she didn't have any external injuries, the fact that she slept for three days meant the process had extracted a toll upon her body. And at the moment they couldn't be sure of the side effects, if any, the curse would impose upon her. Once she healed, he would take her plea to heart, but for now, she would remain as their guest. Regardless of how many times he insisted that he wasn't her master, she continued to throw the term at him. At this point, he doubted she was even listening to him. Her insistence assured him Rikshasha was doing just fine. As he stared out over the ninth floor it seemed the task of clearing the area surrounding their labyrinth was coming to a close. For the time being, they would focus on recuperation and stabilization, while not neglecting their defensive responsibilities. Quintus could be certain they didn't have anything to worry about. After taking out the two largest labyrinths in this zone, no one would look down upon them. The news of their feats were sure to be spreading throughout all of Geyser. Kim knew while it was good, it was also a double-edged sword. What they had accomplished in such a short time frame could only rally the other labyrinth owners against them. His words stunned his subordinates, but there was no doubt in his mind that the others were forming an alliance. Kim needed Uther, as the Naga Labyrinth would be visiting the Labyrinth of Hammer and Andals. The meeting between him and Malaxus, the King of the Goblins, was far overdue. Somewhere in the swamps of the ninth floor. To send an invitation without preparing the bare minimum to greet a guest was simply despicable. King of Wanderers, Hecarim. While she had expected the invitation, the fact that he had neglected to provide seats for them wasn't that big of a deal to her. After all, they were in the middle of the swamps. Queen of Dreams, Ariane? Their host wasn't interested in playing aristocrats. This wasn't a pleasure meeting. They were here to discuss the dangers to their way of life. First Anaxtus was defeated, and now Valicious had been destroyed. To accomplish such a feat was impressive, but to do it in under a year was simply scary. They had to consider his potential. They couldn't discuss the quality or the quantity of their military might in front of him. And above all else, they had to refrain from underestimating the up-and-coming labyrinth owner. After all, there wouldn't be any happy endings when arrogance was involved. King of Swamps, Garintos. The Queen of Dreams wasn't into beating around the bush, 
she knew they had been called here to form an alliance. The king of swamps reaffirmed his beliefs that in order to survive they had to work together. The other two couldn't help but take low blows at the expense of the swamp thing. Now that Daddy Valicious was gone, he was scared for his life. The Queen of Dreams couldn't imagine his reputation getting any lower than it already was, but here he was, acting like a coward. It was simply too early to act. After all, that annoying guy near the Naga Labyrinth was still there. There was no doubt he was capable of holding out longer than both of his predecessors combined. Honestly, she simply didn't believe that Slime was capable of losing even if he tried. The king of the swamps hated to be the bearer of bad news, but he informed her that Uther was on the side of the Naga king. She nearly fell into the swamp at the news. It had been confirmed that the king of gluttony, Uther, is with the Naga king. And Malaxus himself, the king of hammer and anvils had been rather friendly towards the new baron above the abyss. No, he was sure the goblin king had placed himself in a position of submission. There was no doubt before long he too would be under the command of the Naga king. The king of wanderers could agree, considering the location of his labyrinth and the fact that he was the weakest, he was most likely begging for mercy as they spoke. To the queen of dreams, this was all turning out to be a major pain in the ass. The swamp thing didn't begrudge the goblin king making the best choice for his labyrinth and the king of wanderers was surprised he was even considering antagonizing this new great power. After all, he was the biggest coward they knew. Never in the history of Geyser had a labyrinth owner taken over an entire floor. If they weren't careful, this dishonor would be tied to their names forever. If he managed to persuade any of them to his side, this would be their fate. She couldn't believe he was implying that the balance wasn't already broken but the king of swamps was sure they held an advantage if they refrained from being the first out of the gates. The plan was simple. If the Naga Labyrinth ever became so emboldened to attack them, they would remain in their extremely advantageous defensive position. When the aggressors became locked among their gates, the centaurs would intercept. They would never outright attack the Labyrinth of Wanderers. Such an action would send them far beyond their territory, leaving them vulnerable to attack. If they assumed the Naga king was as wise as they believed, they should end up back in an endless deadlock. This time instead of the trinity it would consist of the north against the south. The ideal just didn't sit well with the king of wanderers. But the swamp thing insisted it was simply Hecarim's ego talking. The centaur agreed, understanding exactly where he was the weakest. This was turning out to be a shameful day. But he decided to consider the suggestion. With one down, all that was left was Ariane. She immediately declined to participate. She couldn't simply make such a life-changing decision. She would need time to think it over. He couldn't believe she hadn't managed to let go of her instincts as a fallen fairy. Here she was again, considering crawling to the feet of the strongest in the zone. If he didn't need her, he would kill her at this very moment. She assured him it simply wasn't the case. First, he needed to back off then he needed to chill out. What was holding her back was entirely different than her past. Seeing as how he wasn't a mind reader, she would have to inform him of exactly what gave her pause to consider their alliance. This was information her girls managed to recover when they stumbled upon a minion from the deeper floors. She truly hoped it was false. But after all, their brainwashing techniques were impeccable. From what they managed to obtain— the deep floor aristocrats were on the march, with the intent to invade the ninth floor. I hope everyone enjoyed this manhwa, Dungeon Odyssey. The completion of chapter 65 means the end of season 1. The author is taking a bit of a break before he moves on to season 2. When the new episodes begin to flow, expect to find videos of them right here. And as always, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.